Chapter Five of Book Third of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Tom applies his knife to the oyster. The next day at ten o'clock, Tom was on his way to St. Ogg's to see his uncle Dean, who was to come home last night, his aunt had said and Tom had made up his mind that his Uncle Dean was the right person to ask for advice about getting some employment. He was in a great way of business. He had not the narrow notions of Uncle Glegg, and he had risen in the world on a scale of advancement which accorded with Tom's ambition. It was a dark, chill, misty morning, likely to end in rain, one of those mornings when even happy people take refuge in their hopes. And Tom was very unhappy. He felt the humiliation as well as the prospective hardships of his lot, with all the keenness of a proud nature, and with all his resolute dutifulness towards his father, there mingled an irrepressible indignation against him which gave misfortune the less endurable aspect of a wrong since these were the consequences of going to law, his father was really blamable, as his aunts and uncles had always said he was, and it was a significant indication of Tom's character that though he thought his aunts ought to do something more for his mother, he felt nothing like Maggie's violent resentment against them for showing no eager tenderness and generosity. There were no impulses in Tom that led him to expect what did not present itself to him as a right to be demanded. Why should people give away their money plentifully to those who had not taken care of their own money? Tom saw some justice in severity, and all the more because he had confidence in himself that he should never deserve that just severity. It was very hard upon him, that he should be put at this disadvantage in life by his father's want of prudence. But he was not going to complain and to find fault with people, because they did not make everything easy for him. He would ask no one to help him, more than to give him work and pay him for it. Poor Tom was not without his hopes to take refuge in, under the chill, damp imprisonment of the December fog, which seemed only like a part of his home troubles. At sixteen, the mind that has the strongest affinity for fact cannot escape illusion and self-flattery, and Tom, in sketching his future, had no other guide in arranging his facts than the suggestions of his own brave self-reliance. Both Mr. Glegg and Mr. Dean, he knew, had been very poor once, he did not want to save money slowly and retire on a moderate fortune like his uncle Glegg, but he would be like his uncle Dean, get a situation in some great house of business, and rise fast. He had scarcely seen anything of his uncle Dean for the last three years. The two families had been getting wider apart, but for this very reason Tom was the more hopeful about applying to him. His uncle Glegg, he felt sure, would never encourage any spirited project, but he had a vague imposing idea of the resources at his uncle Dean's command. He had heard his father say long ago how Dean had made himself so valuable to Guest and Company that they were glad enough to offer him a share in the business. That was what Tom resolved he would do. It was intolerable to think of being poor and looked down upon all one's life. He would provide for his mother and sister, and make every one say that he was a man of high character. He leaped over the years in this way, and in the haste of strong purpose and strong desire, did not see how they would be made up of slow days, hours, and minutes. By the time he had crossed the stone bridge over the floss, and was entering St. Ogg's, he was thinking that he would buy his father's mill and land again when he was rich enough, 
and improve the house and live there. He should prefer it to any smarter, newer place, and he could keep as many horses and dogs as he liked. Walking along the street with a firm, rapid step, at this point in his reverie he was startled by someone who had crossed without his notice, and who said to him in a rough, familiar voice, "'Why, Master Tom, how's your father this morning?' It was a publican of St. Ogg's, one of his father's customers. Tom disliked being spoken to just then, but he said civilly, "'He's still very ill, thank you. "'Aye, it's been a sore chance for you, young man, hasn't it? "'This lawsuit turning out against him,' said the publican, "'with a confused, beery idea of being good-natured. "'Tom reddened and passed on. "'He would have felt it like the handling of a bruise, "'even if there had been the most polite and delicate reference to his position. "'That's Tulliver's son!' said the publican to a grocer standing on the adjacent doorstep. "'Ah!' said the grocer. "'I thought I knew his features like. He takes after his mother's family. She was a Dodson. He's a fine straight youth. What's he been brought up to?' "'Oh, to turn up his nose at his father's customers, and be a fine gentleman. Not much else, I think.' Tom, roused from his dream of the future to a thorough consciousness of the present, made all the greater haste to reach the warehouse offices of Guest and Company, where he expected to find his Uncle Dean. But this was Mr. Dean's morning at the bank, a clerk told him, with some contempt for his ignorance. Mr. Dean was not to be found in River Street on a Thursday morning. At the bank... Tom was admitted into the private room where his uncle was, immediately after sending in his name. Mr. Dean was auditing accounts, but he looked up as Tom entered, and putting out his hand, said, "'Well, Tom, nothing fresh the matter at home, I hope. How's your father?' "'Much the same, thank you, uncle,' said Tom, feeling nervous. "'But I want to speak to you, please, when you're at liberty.' "'Sit down, sit down,' said Mr. Dean, relapsing into his accounts, in which he and the managing clerk remained so absorbed for the next half-hour that Tom began to wonder whether he should have to sit in this way till the bank closed. There seemed so little tendency towards a conclusion in the quiet, monotonous procedure of these sleek, prosperous men of business. Would his uncle give him a place in the bank?' It would be very dull, prosy work, he thought, writing there forever, to the loud ticking of a timepiece. He preferred some other way of getting rich. But at last there was a change. His uncle took a pen, and wrote something with a flourish at the end. "'You'll just step up to Torrey's now, Mr. Spence, will you?' said Mr. Dean, and the clock suddenly became less loud and deliberate in Tom's ears. "'Well, Tom,' said Mr. Dean, when they were alone, turning his substantial person a little in his chair, and taking out his snuff-box, "'what's the business, my boy, what's the business?' Mr. Dean, who had heard from his wife what had passed the day before, thought Tom was come to appeal to him for some means of averting the sale. "'I hope you'll excuse me for troubling you, uncle,' said Tom, colouring, but speaking in a tone which, though tremulous, had a certain proud independence in it, but I thought you were the best person to advise me what to do. Ah, said Mr. Dean, reserving his pinch of snuff, and looking at Tom with new attention, let us hear. I want to get a situation, uncle, so that I may earn some money, said Tom who never fell into circumlocution. "'A situation?' said Mr. Dean, and then took his pinch of snuff with elaborate justice to each nostril. 
Tom thought snuff-taking a most provoking habit. "'Well, let me see. How old are you?' said Mr. Dean, as he threw himself backward again. Sixteen. I mean, I'm going in seventeen, said Tom, hoping his uncle noticed how much beard he had. Let me see. Your father had some notion of making you an engineer, I think. But I don't think I could get any money at that for a long while, could I? That's true. But people don't get much money at anything, my boy, when they're only sixteen. You've had a good deal of schooling, however. I suppose you're pretty well up in accounts, eh? You understand bookkeeping? No, said Tom, rather falteringly. I was in practice. But Mr. Stelling says I write a good hand, Uncle. That's my writing, added Tom laying on the table a copy of the list he had made yesterday. "'Ah, that's good, that's good. But, you see, the best hand in the world's will not get you a better place than a copying clerk's if you know nothing of bookkeeping, nothing of accounts. And a copying clerk's a cheap article. But what have you been learning at school, then?' Mr. Dean had not occupied himself with methods of education, and had no precise conception of what went forward in expensive schools. "'We learned Latin,' said Tom, pausing a little between each item, as if he were turning over the books in his school-desk, to assist his memory. "'A good deal of Latin. And the last year I did themes. One week in Latin, and one in English. And Greek and Roman history. And Euclid.' and I began algebra, but I left it off again, and we had one day every week for arithmetic. Then I used to have drawing lessons, and there were several other books we either read or learned out of, English poetry, and Horae Paulinae, and Blair's Rhetoric, the last half. Mr. Dean tapped his snuff-box again, and screwed up his mouth. He felt in the position of many estimable persons when they had read the new tariff, and found how many commodities were imported of which they knew nothing. Like a cautious man of business, he was not going to speak rashly of a raw material in which he had no experience. But the presumption was that if it had been good for anything, so successful a man as himself would hardly have been ignorant of it. About Latin he had an opinion, and thought that in case of another war, since people would no longer wear hair powder, it would be well to put a tax upon Latin as a luxury much run upon by the higher classes, and not telling at all on the ship-owning department. But for what he knew, the ore Paulinae might be something less neutral. On the whole, this list of acquirements gave him a sort of repulsion towards poor Tom. "'Well,' he said, at last, in a rather cold, sardonic tone, "'you've had three years at these things. You must be pretty strong in em. Hadn't you better take up some line where they'll come in handy?' Tom coloured, and burst out with new energy— "'I'd rather not have any employment of that sort, Uncle. "'I don't like Latin and those things. "'I don't know what I could do with them unless I went as usher in a school, "'and I don't know them well enough for that. "'Besides, I would as soon carry a pair of panniers. "'I don't want to be that sort of person. "'I should like to enter into some business where I can get on, "'a manly business.' where I should have to look after things, and get credit for what I did. And I shall want to keep my mother and sister. "'Ah, young gentleman,' said Mr. Dean, with that tendency to repress youthful hopes which stout and successful men of fifty find one of their easiest duties. "'That's sooner said than done. Sooner said than done.' "'But didn't you get on in that way, uncle?' said Tom, a little irritated that Mr. Dean did not enter more rapidly into his views. I mean, didn't you rise from one place to another, 
through your abilities and good conduct? Aye, aye, sir, said Mr. Dean, spreading himself in his chair a little, and entering with great readiness into a retrospect of his own career. But I'll tell you how I got on. It wasn't by getting astride a stick and thinking it would turn into a horse if I sat on it long enough. I kept my eyes and ears open, sir, and I wasn't too fond of my own back, and I made my master's interest my own. Why, with only looking into what went on in the mill, I found out how there was a waste of five hundred a year that might be hindered. Why, sir, I hadn't more schooling to begin with than a charity boy, but I pretty soon saw that I couldn't get on far without mastering accounts, and I learned them between working hours after I'd been unlading. Look here. Mr. Dean opened a book and pointed to the page. I write a good hand enough, and I'll match anybody at all sorts of reckoning by the head, and I got it all by hard work and paid for it out of my own earnings, often out of my own dinner and supper. And I looked into the nature of all the things we had to do within the business, and picked up knowledge as I went about my work, and turned it over in my head. Why, I'm no mechanic, I never pretended to be, but I've thought of a thing or two that the mechanics never thought of, and it's made a fine difference in our returns. And there isn't an article shipped or unshipped at our wharf, but I know the quality of it. If I got places, sir, it was because I made myself fit for em. If you want to slip into a round hole, you must make a ball of yourself. That's where it is. Mr. Dean tapped his box again. He had been led on by pure enthusiasm in his subject, and had really forgotten what bearing this retrospective survey had on his listener. He had found occasion for saying the same thing more than once before, and was not distinctly aware that he had not his port wine before him. "'Well, uncle,' said Tom, with a slight complaint in his tone, "'that's what I should like to do. Can't I get on in the same way?' "'In the same way?' said Mr. Dean, eyeing Tom with quiet deliberation. "'There go two or three questions to that, Master Tom. "'That depends on what sort of material you are to begin with, "'and whether you've been put into the right mill. "'But I'll tell you what it is. "'Your poor father went the wrong way to work in giving you an education. "'It wasn't my business, and I didn't interfere.' but it is as I thought it would be. You've had a sort of learning that's all very well for a young fellow like our Mr. Stephen Guest, who'll have nothing to do but sign cheques all his life, and may as well have Latin inside his head as any other sort of stuffing. "'But, uncle,' said Tom earnestly, "'I don't see why the Latin need hinder me from getting on in business. I shall soon forget it all. It makes no difference to me.' I had to do my lessons at school, but I always thought they'd never be of any use to me afterwards. I didn't care about them. Aye, aye, that's all very well, said Mr. Dean, but it doesn't alter what I was going to say. Your Latin and rigmarole may soon dry off you, but you'll be but a bare stick after that. Besides, it's whitened your hands and taken the rough work out of you. "'And what do you know? Why, you know nothing about bookkeeping to begin with, and not so much of reckoning as a common shopman. You'll have to begin at a low round of the ladder, let me tell you, if you mean to get on in life. It's no use forgetting the education your father's been paying for, if you don't give yourself a new one. Tom bit his lips hard. He felt as if the tears were rising, and he would rather die than let them. "'You want me to help you to a situation,' Mr. Dean went on. "'Well, I've no fault to find with that. I'm willing to do something for you, 
but you youngsters nowadays think you're to begin with living well and working easy. You've no notion of running afoot before you get on horseback. Now, you must remember what you are. You're a lad of sixteen, trained to nothing particular. There's heaps of your sort, like so many pebbles, made to fit in nowhere. Well, you might be apprenticed to some business, a chemist's and druggist, perhaps. Your Latin might come in a bit there. Tom was going to speak, but Mr. Dean put up his hand and said, Stop! Hear what I've got to say. You don't want to be apprentice. I know, I know. You want to make more haste, and you don't want to stand behind a counter. But if you're a copying clerk, you'll have to stand behind a desk and stare at your ink and paper all day. There isn't much outlook there, and you won't be much wiser at the end of the year than at the beginning. The world isn't made of pen, ink, and paper, and if you're to get on in the world, young man, you must know what the world's made of. Now the best chance for you would be to have a place on a wharf, or in a warehouse, where you'd learn the smell of things, but you wouldn't like that, I'll be bound. You'd have to stand cold and wet, and be shouldered about by rough fellows. You're too fine a gentleman for that. Mr. Dean paused and looked hard at Tom, who certainly felt some inward struggle before he could reply. I would rather do what will be best for me in the end, sir. I would put up with what was disagreeable. That's well if you can carry it out. But you must remember, it isn't only laying hold of a rope, you must go on pulling. It's the mistake you lads make that have got nothing either in your brains or your pocket to think you've got a better start in the world if you stick yourselves in a place where you can keep your coats clean and have the shop wenches take you for fine gentlemen. That wasn't the way I started, young man, when I was sixteen my jacket smelt of tar, and I wasn't afraid of handling cheeses. That's the reason I can wear good broadcloth now, and have my legs under the same table with the heads of the best firms in St. Ogg's. Uncle Dean tapped his box, and seemed to expand a little under his waistcoat and gold chain, as he squared his shoulders in the chair. "'Is there any place at liberty that you know of now, uncle, that I should do for?' "'I should like to set to work at once,' said Tom, with a slight tremor in his voice. "'Stop a bit, stop a bit. We mustn't be in too great a hurry. You must bear in mind, if I put you in a place you're a bit young for, because you happen to be my nephew, I shall be responsible for you.' "'And there's no better reason, you know, than your being my nephew, "'because it remains to be seen whether you're good for anything.' "'I hope I should never do you any discredit, uncle,' said Tom, "'hurt, as all boys are, at the statement of the unpleasant truth "'that people feel no ground for trusting them. "'I care about my own credit too much for that. "'Well done, Tom, well done! That's the right spirit!' and I never refuse to help anybody if they've a mind to do themselves justice. There's a young man of two-and-twenty I've got my eye on now. I shall do what I can for that young man. He's got some pith in him. But then, you see, he's made good use of his time. A first-rate calculator can tell you the cubic contents of anything in no time, and put me up the other day to a new market for Swedish bark. He's uncommonly knowing in manufactures, that young fellow. "'I'd better set about learning bookkeeping, hadn't I, uncle?' said Tom, anxious to prove his readiness to exert himself. "'Yes, yes, you can't do a miss there. But, ah, Spence, you're back again.' "'Well, Tom, there's nothing more to be said just now, I think, and I must go to business again. Good-bye. Remember me to your mother.' Mr. Dean put out his hand, 
with an air of friendly dismissal, and Tom had not courage to ask another question, especially in the presence of Mr. Spence. So he went out again into the cold, damp air. He had to call at his uncle Glegg's about the money in the savings bank, and by the time he set out again the mist had thickened, and he could not see very far before him. But going along River Street again he was startled when he was within two yards of the projecting side of a shop window by the words Dollcut Mill in large letters on a handbill, placed as if on purpose to stare at him. It was the catalogue of the sale to take place the next week. It was a reason for hurrying faster out of the town. Poor Tom formed no visions of the distant future as he made his way homeward. He only felt that the present was very hard. It seemed a wrong towards him that his Uncle Dean had no confidence in him, did not see at once that he should acquit himself well, which Tom himself was as certain of as the daylight. Apparently he, Tom Tulliver, was likely to be held of small account in the world, and for the first time he felt a sinking of heart under the sense that he really was very ignorant, and could do very little. Who was that enviable young man that could tell the cubic contents of things in no time, and make suggestions about Swedish bark? Swedish bark! Tom had been used to be so entirely satisfied with himself, in spite of his breaking down in a demonstration, and construing nunc illas promite vires, as now promise those men. But now he suddenly felt at a disadvantage, because he knew less than some one else knew. There must be a world of things connected with that Swedish bark, which, if he only knew them, might have helped him to get on. It would have been much easier to make a figure with a spirited horse and a new saddle. Two hours ago, as Tom was walking to St. Ogg's, he saw the distant future before him, as he might have seen a tempting stretch of smooth, sandy beach beyond a belt of flinty shingles. He was on the grassy bank then, and thought the shingles might soon be passed. But now his feet were on the sharp stones, the belt of shingles had widened, and the stretch of sand had dwindled into narrowness. "'What did my Uncle Dean say, Tom?' said Maggie, putting her arm through Tom's, as he was warming himself rather drearily by the kitchen fire. "'Did he say he would give you a situation?' "'No.' He didn't say that. He didn't quite promise me anything. He seemed to think I couldn't have a very good situation. I'm too young. But didn't he speak kindly, Tom? Kindly? Pooh! What's the use of talking about that? I wouldn't care about his speaking kindly if I could get a situation. But it's such a nuisance and bother. I've been at school all this while learning Latin and things not a bit of good to me, and now my uncle says I must set about learning bookkeeping and calculation and those things. He seems to make out I'm good for nothing. Tom's mouth twitched with a bitter expression as he looked at the fire. Oh, what a pity we haven't got Dominie Sampson, said Maggie who couldn't help mingling some gaiety with their sadness, if he had taught me bookkeeping by double entry, and after the Italian method, as he did Lucy Bertram, I could teach you, Tom. "'You teach? Yes, I dare say. That's always the tone you take,' said Tom. "'Dear Tom, I was only joking,' said Maggie, putting her cheek against his coat-sleeve. "'But it's always the same, Maggie.' said Tom, with the little frown he put on when he was about to be justifiably severe. "'You're always setting yourself up above me, and every one else, and I've wanted to tell you about it several times. You ought not to have spoken as you did to my uncles and aunts. 
you should leave it to me to take care of my mother and you, and not put yourself forward. You think you know better than any one, but you're almost always wrong. I can judge much better than you can. Poor Tom! He had just come from being lectured and made to feel his inferiority. The reaction of his strong, self-asserting nature must take place somehow, and here was a case in which he could justly show himself dominant. Maggie's cheek flushed, and her lip quivered with conflicting resentment and affection, and a certain awe as well as admiration of Tom's firmer and more effective character. She did not answer immediately. Very angry words rose to her lips, but they were driven back again, and she said at last, "'You often think I am conceited, Tom, when I don't mean what I say at all in that way. I don't mean to put myself above you. I know you behave better than I did yesterday. But you're always so harsh to me, Tom.' With the last words the resentment was rising again. "'No, I'm not harsh,' said Tom, with severe decision. "'I'm always kind to you, and so I shall be. I shall always take care of you. But you must mind what I say.' Their mother came in now, and Maggie rushed away, that her burst of tears, which she felt must come, might not happen till she was safe upstairs. They were very bitter tears. Everybody in the world seemed so hard and unkind to Maggie. There was no indulgence, no fondness, such as she imagined when she fashioned the world afresh in her own thoughts. In books there were people who were always agreeable or tender, and delighted to do things that made one happy and who did not show their kindness by finding fault. The world outside the books was not a happy one, Maggie felt. It seemed to be a world where people behaved the best to those they did not pretend to love, and that did not belong to them. And if life had no love in it, what else was there for Maggie? Nothing but poverty and the companionship of her mother's narrow griefs, perhaps of her father's heart-cutting childish dependence. There is no hopelessness so sad as that of early youth, when the soul is made up of wants, and has no long memories, no super-added life in the life of others. Though we who look on think lightly of premature despair, as if our vision of the future lightened the blind sufferer's present. Maggie, in her brown frock, with her eyes reddened and her heavy hair pushed back, looking from the bed where her father lay to the dull walls of this sad chamber which was the centre of her world, was a creature full of eager, passionate longings for all that was beautiful and glad, thirsty for all knowledge, with an ear straining after dreamy music that died away and would not come near to her with a blind, unconscious yearning for something that would link together the wonderful impressions of this mysterious life, and give her soul a sense of home in it. No wonder, when there is this contrast between the outward and the inward, that painful collisions come of it. End of chapter 5 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Six of Book Third of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Tending to refute the popular prejudice against the present of a pocket knife. In that dark time of December, the sale of the household furniture lasted beyond the middle of the second day. Mr. Tulliver, who had begun, in his intervals of consciousness, 
to manifest an irritability which often appeared to have as a direct effect the recurrence of spasmodic rigidity and insensibility, had lain in this living death throughout the critical hours when the noise of the sail came nearest to his chamber. Mr. Turnbull had decided that it would be a less risk to let him remain where he was than to move him to Luke's cottage, a plan which the good Luke had proposed to Mrs. Tulliver, thinking it would be very bad if the master were to waken up at the noise of the sail. And the wife and children had sat imprisoned in the silent chamber, watching the large prostrate figure on the bed, and trembling lest the blank face should suddenly show some response to the sounds which fell on their own ears with such obstinate, painful repetition. But it was over at last, that time of importunate certainty and eye-straining suspense. The sharp sound of a voice, almost as metallic as the rap that followed it, had ceased. The tramping of footsteps on the gravel had died out. Mrs. Tulliver's blonde face seemed aged ten years by the last thirty hours. The poor woman's mind had been busy divining when her favourite things were being knocked down by the terrible hammer. Her heart had been fluttering at the thought that first one thing and then another had gone to be identified as hers in the hateful publicity of the Golden Lion. And all the while she had to sit and make no sign of this inward agitation. Such things bring lines in well-rounded faces, and broaden the streaks of white among the hairs that once looked as if they had been dipped in pure sunshine. Already, at three o'clock, Kezia, the good-hearted, bad-tempered housemaid, who regarded all people that came to the sale as her personal enemies, the dirt on whose feet was of a peculiarly vile quality, had begun to scrub and swill with an energy much assisted by a continual low muttering against folkses came to buy up other folkses things, and made light of scrazing the tops of mahogany tables over which better folks than themselves had had to suffer a waste of tissue through evaporation. She was not scrubbing indiscriminately for there would be further dirt of the same atrocious kind made by people who had still to fetch away their purchases. But she was bent on bringing the parlour where that pipe-smoking pig, the bailiff, had sat, to such an appearance of scant comfort as could be given to it by cleanliness, and the few articles of furniture bought in for the family. Her mistress and the young folks should have their tea in it that night, Kezia was determined. It was between five and six o'clock, near the usual tea-time, when she came upstairs and said that Master Tom was wanted. The person who wanted him was in the kitchen, and in the first moments by the imperfect fire and candlelight, Tom had not even an indefinite sense of any acquaintance with the rather broad-set but active figure, perhaps two years older than himself, that looked at him with a pair of blue eyes set in a disc of freckles, and pulled some curly red locks with a strong intention of respect. A low-crowned oilskin-covered hat, and a certain shiny deposit of dirt on the rest of the costume, as of tablets prepared for writing upon, suggested a calling that had to do with boats, but this did not help Tom's memory. "'Sarvent, Master Tom,' said he of the red locks, with a smile which seemed to break through a self-imposed air of melancholy. "'You don't know me again, I doubt,' he went on, as Tom continued to look at him inquiringly, "'but I'd like to talk to you by yourself a bit, please.' "'There's a fire in the parlour, Master Tom,' said Kezia, who objected to leaving the kitchen in the crisis of toasting. "'Come this way, then,' said Tom, wondering if this young fellow belonged to Guest and Company's wharf, for his imagination ran continually 
towards that particular spot, and Uncle Dean might any time be sending for him to say that there was a situation at liberty. The bright fire in the parlour was the only light that showed the few chairs, the bureau, the carpetless floor, and the one table. No, not the one table. There was a second table in a corner, with a large Bible and a few other books upon it. It was this new strange bareness that Tom felt first, before he thought of looking again at the face which was also lit up by the fire, and which stole a half-shy, questioning glance at him, as the entirely strange voice said, "'Why, you don't remember, Bob, then, as you gain the pocket-knife, Mr. Tom?' The rough-handled pocket-knife was taken out in the same moment, and the largest blade opened by way of irresistible demonstration. "'What! Bob Jakin?' said Tom, not with any cordial delight, for he felt a little ashamed of that early intimacy symbolised by the pocket-knife, and was not at all sure that Bob's motives for recalling it were entirely admirable. "'Aye, aye, Bob Jakin, if Jakin it must be, "'cause there's so many Bobs, as you went out of the squirrels with "'that day as I plumped right down from the bow and bruised my shins a good'n, "'but I got the squirrel tight for all that, and a scratter it was. "'And this littlish blade's broke, you see, but I wouldn't have a new un put in, "'cause they might be cheating me and giving me another knife instead, "'for there isn't such a blade in the country.' "'It's got used to my hand, like. "'And there was never nobody else gin me nothing "'but what I got by my own sharpness. "'Only you, Mr. Tom. "'If it wasn't Bill Fawkes as gin me the terrier pup "'instead of drowning it, "'and I had to jaw him a good'n afore he'd give it to me.' "'Bob spoke with a sharp and rather treble volubility "'and got through his long speech with surprising dispatch giving the blade of his knife an affectionate rub on his sleeve when he had finished. "'Well, Bob,' said Tom, with a slight air of patronage, the foregoing reminiscences having disposed him to be as friendly as was becoming, though there was no part of his acquaintance with Bob that he remembered better than the cause of their parting quarrel. "'Is there anything I can do for you?' "'Why, no, Mr. Tom,' answered Bob, shutting up his knife with a click, and returning it to his pocket, where he seemed to be feeling for something else. "'I shouldn't to come back upon you, now you're in trouble, and folk says the master, as I used to frighten the birds for, and he flogged me a bit for fun when he catched me eating the turnip, as they say, he'll never lift up his head no more. I shouldn't to come now to ax you to give me another knife.' "'Cause you gain me one of four. "'If a chap gives me one black eye, "'that's enough for me. "'I shan't ax him for another "'afore I sarve him out, "'and a good turn's worth as much as a bad un anyhow. "'I shall never grow downards again, Mr. Tom, "'and you were the little chap as I liked the best "'when I were a little chap, "'for all you leathered me "'and wouldn't look at me again.' "'There's Dick Brumby there. "'I could leather him as much as I'd a mind. "'But, laws, you get tired of leathering a chap "'when you can never make him see what you want him to shy at. "'I'n seen chaps as had stand staring at a bow "'till their eyes shot out "'afore they'd see as a bird's tail want a leaf. "'It's poor work going with such rough. "'But you were all as a rare and it's shying, Mr. Tom.' "'and I could trust em to you for dropping down with your stick in the nick o' time "'at a running rat or a stoat or that, when I would have beat in the bushes.' "'Bob had drawn out a dirty canvas bag, "'and would perhaps not have paused just then "'if Maggie had not entered the room "'and darted a look of surprise and curiosity at him whereupon he pulled his red locks again with due respect. But the next moment the sense of the altered room came upon Maggie with a force that overpowered the thought of Bob's presence. Her eyes had immediately glanced from him to the place where the bookcase had hung, 
there was nothing now but the oblong unfaded space on the wall and below it the small table with the bible and the few other books oh tom she burst out clasping her hands where are the books i thought my uncle glegg said he would buy them didn't he are those all they've left us i suppose so said tom with a sort of desperate indifference why should they buy many books when they bought so little furniture oh but tom said maggie her eyes filling with tears as she rushed up to the table to see what books had been rescued our dear old pilgrim's progress that you coloured with your little paints and that picture of pilgrim with a mantle on looking just like a turtle oh dear maggie went on half sobbing as she turned over the few books i thought we should never part with that while we lived everything is going away from us the end of our lives will have nothing in it like the beginning maggie turned away from the table and threw herself into a chair with the big tears ready to roll down her cheeks quite blinded to the presence of bob who was looking at her with the pursuant gaze of an intelligent dumb animal with perceptions more perfect than his comprehension well bob said tom feeling that the subject of the books was unseasonable i suppose you just came to see me because we're in trouble that was very good-natured of you i'll tell you how it is master tom said bob beginning to untwist his canvas bag you see i'm been with a barge this two year that's how i'm been getting my livin if it wasn't when i was tendin the furnace between whiles at torrey's mill but a fortnight ago i had a rare bit of luck i always thought i was a lucky chap for i never set a trap but what i catch something but this wasn't a trap it was a fire at torrey's mill and i doused it else it to set the oil alight and the gentleman gen me ten sovereigns he gen me em himself last week and he said first i was a spirited chap but i know that afore but then he outs with the ten sovereigns and that was summat new here they are all but one here bob emptied the canvas bag on the table and when i'd got em my head was all of a boil like a kettle of broth thinking what sort of life i should take to for there were a many trades i'd thought on for as for the barge i'm clean tired out wit for it pulls the days out till they're as long as pigs chitterlings and i thought first i'd have ferrets and dogs and be a rat catcher and then i thought as i should like a bigger way of life as i didn't know so well for i'm seen to the bottom of rat catching and i thought and thought till at last i settled i'd be a packman for they're knowing fellers the packmen are and i'd carry the lightest things i could in my pack and there'd be a use for a feller's tongue as is no use neither with rats nor barges and i should go about the country far and wide and come round the women with my tongue and get my dinner hot at the public laws it'd be a lovely life bob paused and then said with defiant decision as if resolutely turning his back on that paradisaic picture but i don't mind about it not a chip and i'm changed one of the sovereigns to buy my mother a goose for dinner and i'm bought a blue plush waistcoat and a sealskin cap for if i meant to be a packman i'd do it respectable but i don't mind about it not a chip my yeed isn't a turnip and i shall perhaps have a chance of dowsing another fire afore long i'm a lucky chap so i'll thank you to take the nine sovereigns mr tom and set your sen up with em somehow if it's true as the master's broke they mayn't go fur enough but they'll help tom was touched keenly enough 
to forget his pride and suspicion. "'You're a very kind fellow, Bob,' he said, colouring with that little, diffident tremor in his voice, which gave a certain charm even to Tom's pride and severity, "'and I shan't forget you again, though I didn't know you this evening.' "'But I can't take the nine sovereigns. I should be taking your little fortune from you, and they wouldn't do me much good either.' "'Wouldn't they, Mr. Tom?' said Bob regretfully. "'Now don't say so, cause you think I want em. I aren't a poor chap. My mother gets a good penneth with picking feathers and things, and if she eats nothing but bread and water it runs to fat. And I'm such a lucky chap, and I doubt you aren't quite so lucky, Mr. Tom. The old master isn't anyhow, and so you might take a slice of my luck, and no harm done. Laws, I found a leg of pork in the river one day. It'd tumble out of one of them round stern Dutchmen, I'll be bound. Come, think better on it, Mr. Tom, for old Quinton's sake. Else I shall think you bear me a grudge. Bob pushed the sovereigns forward, but before Tom could speak, Maggie, clasping her hands and looking penitently at Bob, said, "'Oh, I'm so sorry, Bob. I never thought you were so good. Why, I think you're the kindest person in the world.' Bob had not been aware of the injurious opinion for which Maggie was performing an inward act of penitence, but he smiled with pleasure at this handsome eulogy, especially from a young lass who, as he informed his mother that evening, had such uncommon eyes they looked somehow as they made me feel no how no indeed bob i can't take them said tom but don't think i feel your kindness less because i say no i don't want to take anything from anybody but to work my own way and those sovereigns wouldn't help me much they wouldn't really if i were to take them let me shake hands with you instead Tom put out his pink palm, and Bob was not slow to place his hard, grimy hand within it. "'Let me put the sovereigns in the bag again,' said Maggie, "'and you'll come and see us when you've bought your pack, Bob.' "'It's like as if I'd come out to make-believe a purpose to show em you,' said Bob with an air of discontent, as Maggie gave him the bag again. "'It taken em back of this way,' I am a bit of a do, you know, but it isn't that sort of do. It's only when a feller's a big rogue or a big flat I like to let him in a bit, that's all. Now don't you be up to any tricks, Bob, said Tom, else you'll get transported some day. No, no, not me, Mr. Tom, said Bob, with an air of cheerful confidence. There's no law again flea bites. If I wasn't to take a fool in now and then, he'd never get any wiser. But laws have a sovereign to buy you and Miss Summit, only for a token, just to match my pocket-knife. While Bob was speaking, he laid down the sovereign, and resolutely twisted up his bag again. Tom pushed back the gold, and said, "'No, indeed, Bob. Thank you heartily.' but I can't take it. And Maggie, taking it between her fingers, held it up to Bob and said more persuasively, Not now, but perhaps another time. If ever Tom or my father wants help that you can give, we'll let you know, won't we, Tom? That's what you would like, to have us always depend on you as a friend that we can go to, isn't it, Bob? Yes, miss. "'And thank you,' said Bob, reluctantly taking the money. "'That's what I like, anything as you like. "'And I wish you good-bye, miss, and good luck, Mr. Tom, "'and thank you for shaking hands with me, though you wouldn't take the money.' Kezia's entrance, with very black looks, to inquire if she shouldn't bring in the tea now, 
or whether the toast was to get hardened to a brick, was a seasonable check on Bob's flux of words, and hastened his parting bow. End of chapter 6 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 7 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. How a Hen Takes to Stratagem. The days passed, and Mr. Tulliver showed, at least to the eyes of the medical man, stronger and stronger symptoms of a gradual return to his normal condition. The paralytic obstruction was little by little losing its tenacity, and the mind was rising from under it with fitful struggles, like a living creature making its way from under a great snowdrift that slides and slides again and shuts up the newly made opening. Time would have seemed to creep to the watchers by the bed if it had only been measured by the doubtful distant hope which kept count of the moments within the chamber. But it was measured for them by a fast-approaching dread which made the nights come too quickly. While Mr. Tulliver was slowly becoming himself again, his lot was hastening towards its moment of most palpable change. The taxing-masters had done their work like any respectable gunsmith conscientiously preparing the musket, that, duly pointed by a brave arm, will spoil a life or two. Allocators, filing of bills in chancery, decrees of sale, are legal chain-shot, or bombshells that can never hit a solitary mark, but must fall with widespread shattering. So deeply inherent is it in this life of ours that men have to suffer for each other's sins, so inevitably diffusive is human suffering that even justice makes its victims, and we can conceive no retribution that does not spread beyond its mark in pulsations of unmerited pain. By the beginning of the second week in January the bills were out advertising the sale, under a decree of chancery, of Mr. Tulliver's farming and other stock, to be followed by a sale of the mill and land held in the proper after-dinner hour at the Golden Lion. The miller himself, unaware of the lapse of time, fancied himself still in that first stage of his misfortunes when expedients might be thought of, and often in his conscious hours talked in a feeble, disjointed manner of plans he would carry out when he got well. The wife and children were not without hope of an issue that would at least save Mr. Tulliver from leaving the old spot, and seeking an entirely strange life. For Uncle Dean had been induced to interest himself in this stage of the business. It would not, he acknowledged, be a bad speculation for Guest and Company to buy Dalkett Mill and carry on the business, which was a good one and might be increased by the addition of steam-power, in which case Mr. Tulliver might be retained as manager. Still Mr. Dean would say nothing decided about the matter. The fact that Wakeham held the mortgage on the land might put it into his head to bid for the whole estate, and further to outbid the cautious firm of Guest and Company, who did not carry on business on sentimental grounds. Mr. Dean was obliged to tell Mrs. Tulliver something to that effect, when he rode over to the mill to inspect the books in company with Mrs. Glegg, for she had observed that if Guest and Company would only think about it, Mr. Tulliver's father and grandfather had been carrying on Dalkett Mill long before the oil mill of that firm had been so much as thought of. Mr. Dean, in reply, doubted whether that was precisely the relation between the two mills which would determine their value as investments. 
As for Uncle Glegg, the thing lay quite beyond his imagination. The good-natured man felt sincere pity for the Tulliver family, but his money was all locked up in excellent mortgages, and he could run no risk. That would be unfair to his own relatives. But he had made up his mind that Tulliver should have some new flannel waistcoats, which he had himself renounced in favour of a more elastic commodity, and that he would buy Mrs. Tulliver a pound of tea now and then. It would be a journey which his benevolence delighted in beforehand to carry the tea, and see her pleasure on being assured it was the best black. Still, it was clear that Mr. Dean was kindly disposed towards the Tullivers. One day he had brought Lucy, who was come home for the Christmas holidays, and the little blonde angel head had pressed itself against Maggie's darker cheek with many kisses and some tears. These fair, slim daughters keep up a tender spot in the heart of many a respectable partner in a respectable firm, and perhaps Lucy's anxious, pitying questions about her poor cousins helped to make Uncle Dean more prompt in finding Tom a temporary place in the warehouse, and in putting him in the way of getting evening lessons in bookkeeping and calculation. That might have cheered the lad and fed his hopes a little, if there had not come at the same time the much dreaded blow of finding that his father must be a bankrupt after all. At least the creditors must be asked to take less than their due, which to Tom's untechnical mind was the same thing as bankruptcy. His father must not only be said to have lost his property, but to have failed. The word that carried the worst obloquy to Tom's mind for when the defendant's claim for costs had been satisfied, there would remain the friendly bill of Mr. Gore, and the deficiency at the bank, as well as the other debts, which would make the assets shrink into unequivocal disproportion. "'Not more than ten or twelve shillings in the pound,' predicted Mr. Dean, in a decided tone, tightening his lips." and the words fell on Tom like a scalding liquid, leaving a continual smart. He was sadly in want of something to keep up his spirits a little in the unpleasant newness of his position. Suddenly transported from the easy carpeted ennui of study hours at Mr. Stelling's, and the busy idleness of castle-building in a last half at school, to the companionship of sacks and hides, and bawling men thundering down heavy weights at his elbow. The first step towards getting on in the world was a chill, dusty, noisy affair, and implied going without one's tea in order to stay in St. Ogg's and have an evening lesson from a one-armed elderly clerk in a room smelling strongly of bad tobacco. Tom's young pink-and-white face had its colours very much deadened by the time he took off his hat at home, and sat down with keen hunger to his supper. No wonder he was a little cross if his mother or Maggie spoke to him. But all this while Mrs. Tulliver was brooding over a scheme by which she, and no one else, would avert the result to be most dreaded and prevent Wakem from entertaining the purpose of bidding for the mill. Imagine a truly respectable and amiable hen, by some portentous anomaly taking to reflection, and inventing combinations by which she might prevail on Hodge not to wring her neck, or send her and her chickens to market. The result could hardly be other than much cackling and fluttering, Mrs. Tulliver, seeing that everything had gone wrong, had begun to think that she had been too passive in life, and that if she had applied her mind to business, and taken a strong resolution now and then, it would have been all the better for her and her family. Nobody, it appeared, had thought of going to speak to Wakem on this business of the mill. And yet Mrs. Tulliver reflected— 
it would have been quite the shortest method of securing the right end. It would have been of no use, to be sure, for Mr. Tulliver to go, even if he had been able and willing, for he had been going to law against Wakeham and abusing him for the last ten years. Wakeham was always likely to have a spite against him. And now that Mrs. Tulliver had come to the conclusion that her husband was very much in the wrong to bring her into this trouble, she was inclined to think that his opinion of Wakeham was wrong too. To be sure, Wakeham had put the Baileys in the house and sold them up, but she supposed he did that to please the man that lent Mr. Tulliver the money, for a lawyer had more folks to please than one, and he wasn't likely to put Mr. Tulliver, who had gone to law with him, above everybody else in the world. The attorney might be a very reasonable man. Why not? He had married a Miss Clint. And at the time Mrs. Tulliver had heard of that marriage, the summer when she wore her blue satin spencer, and had not yet any thoughts of Mr. Tulliver, she knew no harm of Wakeham, and certainly towards herself, whom he knew to have been a Miss Dodson, it was out of all possibility that he could entertain anything but good will, when it was once brought home to his observation that she, for her part, had never wanted to go to law, and indeed was at present disposed to take Mr. Wakeham's view of all subjects rather than her husband's. In fact, if that attorney saw a respectable matron like herself disposed to give him good words, why shouldn't he listen to her representations? For she would put the matter clearly before him, which had never been done yet, and he would never go and bid for the mill on purpose to spite her, an innocent woman who thought it likely enough that she had danced with him in their youth at Squire Darley's, for at those big dances she had often and often danced with young men whose names she had forgotten. Mrs. Tulliver hid these reasonings in her own bosom, for when she had thrown out a hint to Mr. Dean and Mr. Glegg that she wouldn't mind going to speak to Wakeham herself, they had said, No, 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 and pooh, pooh, and let Wakeham alone, in the tone of men who were not likely to give a candid attention to a more definite exposition of her project. Still less dead she mentioned the plan to Tom and Maggie, for the children were always so against everything their mother said, and Tom, she observed, was almost as much set against Wakeham as his father was. But this unusual concentration of thought naturally gave Mrs. Tulliver an unusual power of device and determination, and a day or two before the sale, to be held at the Golden Lion, when there was no longer any time to be lost, she carried out her plan by a stratagem. There were pickles in question, a large stock of pickles and ketchup which Mrs. Tulliver possessed, and which Mr. Hindmarsh, the grocer, would certainly purchase if she could transact the business in a personal interview. So she would walk with Tom to St. Ogg's that morning, and when Tom urged that she might let the pickles be, at present, he didn't like her to go about just yet. She appeared so hurt at this conduct in her son, contradicting her about pickles, which she had made after the family receipts inherited from his own grandmother, who had died when his mother was a little girl, that he gave way, and they walked together until she turned towards Danish Street, where Mr. Hindmarsh retailed his grocery, not far from the offices of Mr. Wakeham. That gentleman was not yet come to his office. Would Mrs. Tulliver sit down by the fire in his private room and wait for him? She had not long to wait before the punctual attorney entered, knitting his brow with an examining glance at the stout blonde woman who rose, curtsying deferentially. A tallish man with an aquiline nose and abundant iron-grey hair, 
"'You have never seen Mr. Wakem before, "'and are possibly wondering whether he was really as eminent a rascal "'and as crafty, bitter an enemy of honest humanity in general, "'and of Mr. Tulliver in particular, "'as he is represented to be in that idolon or portrait of him "'which we have seen to exist in the miller's mind. "'It is clear that the irascible miller was a man to interpret any chance shot that grazed him as an attempt on his own life, and was liable to entanglements in this puzzling world, which, due consideration had to his own infallibility, required the hypothesis of a very active diabolical agency to explain them. It is still possible to believe that the attorney was not more guilty towards him than an ingenious machine, which performs its work with much regularity, is guilty towards the rash man, who, venturing too near it, is caught up by some flywheel or other, and suddenly converted into unexpected sausages. But it is really impossible to decide this question by a glance at his person. The lines and lights of the human countenance are like other symbols, not always easy to read without a key. On an a priori view of Wakem's aquiline nose, which offended Mr. Tulliver, there was not more rascality than in the shape of his stiff shirt-collar, though this too, along with his nose, might have become fraught with damnatory meaning when once the rascality was ascertained. "'Mrs. Tulliver, I think,' said Mr. Wakem. "'Yes, sir, Miss Elizabeth Dodson, as was.' "'Pray be seated. You have some business with me?' "'Well, sir, yes,' said Mrs. Tulliver, beginning to feel alarmed at her own courage, now she was really in presence of the formidable man, and reflecting that she had not settled with herself how she should begin. Mr. Wakem felt in his waistcoat pockets, and looked at her in silence. "'I hope, sir,' she began at last, "'I hope, sir, you are not a-thinking as I bear you any ill-will because of my husband's losing his lawsuit, and the baileys being put in, and the linen being sold. Oh, dear!' "'for I wasn't brought up in that way. "'I'm sure you remember my father, sir, "'for he was close friends with Squire Darley, "'and we always went to the dancers there, "'the Miss Dodsons. "'Nobody could be more looked on. "'And justly, for there was four of us, "'and you're quite aware as Mrs. Glegg "'and Mrs. Dean or my sisters. "'And as for going to law and losing money "'and having sales before you're dead,' I never saw anything of that before I was married, nor for a long while after. And I'm not to be answerable for my bad luck in marrying out of my own family into one where the goings-on was different. And as for being drawn in to abuse you as other folks abuse you, sir, that I never was, and nobody can say it of me. Mrs. Tulliver shook her head a little and looked at the hem of her pocket-handkerchief. "'I've no doubt of what you say, Mrs. Tulliver,' said Mr. Wakem, with cold politeness. "'But you have some question to ask me?' "'Well, sir, yes. But that's what I've said to myself. I've said you'd have some natural feeling, and as for my husband, as hasn't been himself for this two months, I'm not a defending him in no way for being so hot about the irrigation. Not but what there's worse men, for he never wronged nobody of a shilling nor a penny. Not willingly. And as for his fieriness and lawing, what could I do? And him struck as if it was with death when he got the letter as said you'd got the hold upon the land. "'but I can't believe but what you'll behave as a gentleman.' "'What does all this mean, Mrs. Tulliver?' said Mr. Wakem, rather sharply. "'What do you want to ask me?' "'Why, sir, if you'll be so good,' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'starting a little and speaking more hurriedly, "'if you'll be so good 
not to buy the mill and the land the land wouldn't so much matter only my husband'll be like mad at your having it something like a new thought flashed across mr wakem's face as he said who told you i meant to buy it why sir it's none of my inventing and i should never have thought of it for my husband as ought to know about the law he always used to say as lawyers had never no call to buy anything either lands or houses for they always got em into their hands other ways and i should think and i should think that'd be the way with you sir and i never said as you'd be the man to do contrary to that ah well who was it that did say so said wakem opening his desk and moving things about with the accompaniment of an almost inaudible whistle why sir it was mr glegg and mr dean as have all the management and mr dean thinks as guest and company would buy the mill and let mr tulliver work it for em if you didn't bid for it and raise the price and it'd be such a thing for my husband to stay where he is if he could get his living for it was his father's before him the mill was and his grandfather built it though i wasn't fond of the noise of it when first i was married for there was no mills in our family not the dodsons and if i'd known as the mills had so much to do with the law it wouldn't have been me as it'd have been the first dodson to marry one but i went into it blindfold that i did irrigation and everything what guest and company would keep the mill in their own hands i suppose and pay your husband wages oh dear sir it's hard to think of said poor mrs tulliver a little tear making its way as my husband should take wage but it'd look more like what used to be to stay at the mill than to go anywhere else and if you'll only think if you was to bid for the mill and buy it my husband might be struck worse than he was before and never get better again as he's getting now well but if i bought the mill and allowed your husband to act as my manager in the same way how then said mr wakem oh sir i doubt he could never be got to do it not if the very mill stood still to beg and pray of him for your name's like poison to him it's so as never was and he looks upon it as you've been the ruin of him all along ever since you set the law on him about the road through the meadow that's eight year ago and he's been going on ever since as i've always told him he was wrong he's a pig-headed foul-mouthed fool burst out mr wakem forgetting himself oh dear sir said mrs tulliver frightened at a result so different from the one she had fixed her mind on i wouldn't wish to contradict you but it's like enough he's changed his mind with his illness he's forgotten many things he used to talk about and you wouldn't like to have a corpse on your mind if he was to die and they do say as it's all as unlucky when dalkett mill changes hands and the water might all run away and then not as i'm wishing you any ill luck sir for i forgot to tell you as i remember your wedding as if it was yesterday mrs wakem was a miss clint i know that and my boy as there isn't a nicer handsomer straighter boy nowhere went to school with your son mr wakem rose opened the door and called to one of his clerks you must excuse me for interrupting you mrs tulliver i have business that must be attended to and i think there is nothing more necessary to be said but if you would bear it in mind sir said mrs tulliver rising and not run against me and my children and i'm not denying mr tulliver's been in the wrong but he's been punished enough and there's worse men for it's been giving to other folks has been his fault he's done nobody any harm but himself and his family the more's the pity and i go and look at the bare shelves every day and think where all my things used to stand yes yes i'll bear it in mind said mr wakem hastily looking towards the open door 
and if you'd please not to say as I've been to speak to you, for my son would be very angry with me for demeaning myself, I know he would, and I've trouble enough without being scalded by my children. Poor Mrs. Tulliver's voice trembled a little, and she could make no answer to the attorney's good morning, but curtsied and walked out in silence. "'Which day is it that Dorcott Mill is to be sold? Where's the bill?' said Mr. Wakeham to his clerk when they were alone. "'Next Friday's the day. Friday at six o'clock.' "'Oh, just run to Winship's, the auctioneer, and see if he's at home. I have some business for him. Ask him to come up.' Although when Mr. Wakeham entered his office that morning— he had had no intention of purchasing Dorcott Mill. His mind was already made up. Mrs. Tulliver had suggested to him several determining motives, and his mental glance was very rapid. He was one of those men who can be prompt without being rash, because their motives run in fixed tracks, and they have no need to reconcile conflicting aims. To suppose that Wakeham had the same sort of inveterate hatred towards Tulliver that Tulliver had towards him, would be like supposing that a pike and a roach can look at each other from a similar point of view. The roach necessarily abhors the mode in which the pike gets its living, and the pike is likely to think nothing further, even of the most indignant roach, than that he is excellent good eating. It could only be when the roach choked him that the pike could entertain a strong personal animosity. If Mr. Tulliver had ever seriously injured or thwarted the attorney, Wakeham would not have refused him the distinction of being a special object of his vindictiveness. But when Mr. Tulliver called Wakeham a rascal at the market dinner-table, the attorney's clients were not a whit inclined to withdraw their business from him, and if, when Wakeham himself happened to be present, some jocose cattle-feeder, stimulated by opportunity and brandy, made a thrust at him by alluding to old ladies' wills, he maintained perfect sang-froid, and knew quite well that the majority of substantial men then present were perfectly contented with the fact that Wakem was Wakem, that is to say, a man who always knew the stepping stones that would carry him through very muddy bits of practice. A man who had made a large fortune, had a handsome house among the trees at Tofton, and decidedly the finest stock of port wine in the neighbourhood of St. Ogg's, was likely to feel himself on a level with public opinion and I am not sure that even honest Mr. Tulliver himself, with his general view of law as a cockpit, might not, under opposite circumstances, have seen a fine appropriateness in the truth that Wakem was Wakem, since I have understood from persons versed in history that mankind is not disposed to look narrowly into the conduct of great victors when their victory is on the right side. Tulliver, then, could be no obstruction to Wakem. On the contrary, he was a poor devil whom the lawyer had defeated several times, a hot-tempered fellow who would always give you a handle against him. Wakem's conscience was not uneasy because he had used a few tricks against the miller. Why should he hate that unsuccessful plaintiff, that pitiable, furious bull, entangled in the meshes of a net. Still, among the various excesses to which human nature is subject, moralists have never numbered that of being too fond of the people who openly revile us. The successful yellow candidate for the borough of Old Topping, perhaps, feels no pursuant meditative hatred towards the blue editor who consoles his subscribers with vituperative rhetoric against yellow men who sell their country and are the demons of private life. But he might not be sorry, if law and opportunity favoured, to kick that blue editor to a deeper shade of his favourite colour. 
prosperous men take a little vengeance now and then, as they take a diversion, when it comes easily in their way, and is no hindrance to business, and such small, unimpassioned revenges have an enormous effect in life, running through all degrees of personal infliction, blocking the fit men out of places, and blackening characters in unpremeditated talk. Still more, to see people who have been only insignificantly offensive to us, reduced in life, and humiliated without any special efforts of ours, is apt to have a soothing, flattering influence. Providence, or some other prince of this world, it appears, has undertaken the task of retribution for us, and really, by an agreeable constitution of things, our enemies somehow don't prosper. Wakeham was not without this parenthetic vindictiveness towards the uncomplimentary Miller. And now Mrs. Tulliver had put the notion into his head, it presented itself to him as a pleasure to do the very thing that would cause Mr. Tulliver the most deadly mortification, and a pleasure of a complex kind not made up of crude malice, but mingling with it the relish of self-approbation. To see an enemy humiliated gives a certain contentment, but this is jejun compared with the highly blent satisfaction of seeing him humiliated by your benevolent action or concession on his behalf. That is a sort of revenge which falls into the scale of virtue, and Wakeham was not without an intention of keeping that scale respectably filled. He had once had the pleasure of putting an old enemy of his into one of the St. Og's almshouses, to the rebuilding of which he had given a large subscription, and here was an opportunity of providing for another by making him his own servant. Such things give a completeness to prosperity, and contribute elements of agreeable consciousness that are not dreamed of by that short-sighted, overheated vindictiveness which goes out of its way to wreak itself in direct injury. And Tulliver, with his rough tongue filed by a sense of obligation, would make a better servant than any chance fellow who was cap in hand for a situation. Tulliver was known to be a man of proud honesty, and Wakeham was too acute not to believe in the existence of honesty. He was given to observing individuals, not to judging of them according to maxims, and no one knew better than he that all men were not like himself. Besides, he intended to overlook the whole business of land and mill pretty closely. He was fond of these practical rural matters." but there were good reasons for purchasing Dalcott Mill, quite apart from any benevolent vengeance on the miller. It was really a capital investment. Besides, Guest and Company were going to bid for it. Mr. Guest and Mr. Wakeham were on friendly dining terms, and the attorney liked to predominate over a ship-owner and mill-owner who was a little too loud in the town affairs as well as in his own table-talk for Wakeham was not a mere man of business. He was considered a pleasant fellow in the upper circles of St. Ogg's, chattered amusingly over his port wine, did a little amateur farming, and had certainly been an excellent husband and father. At church, when he went there, he sat under the handsomest of mural monuments erected to the memory of his wife. Most men would have married again under his circumstances, but he was said to be more tender to his deformed son than most men were to their best-shapen offspring. Not that Mr. Wakeham had not other sons besides Philip, but towards them he held only a chiaroscuro parentage, and provided for them in a grade of life duly beneath his own. In this fact, indeed, there lay the clenching motive to the purchase of Dalcott Mill, while Mrs. Tulliver was talking, it had occurred to the rapid-minded lawyer, among all the other circumstances of the case, that this purchase 
would, in a few years to come, furnish a highly suitable position for a certain favourite lad whom he meant to bring on in the world. These were the mental conditions on which Mr. Tulliver had undertaken to act persuasively, and had failed, a fact which may receive some illustration from the remark of a great philosopher, that fly-fishers fail in preparing their bait so as to make it alluring in the right quarter, for want of a due acquaintance with the subjectivity of fishes. End of chapter 7 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 8 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Daylight on the Wreck It was a clear, frosty January day on which Mr. Tulliver first came downstairs. The bright sun on the chestnut boughs and the roofs opposite his window had made him impatiently declare that he would be caged up no longer. He thought everywhere would be more cheery under this sunshine than his bedroom, for he knew nothing of the bareness below, which made the flood of sunshine importunate, as if it had an unfeeling pleasure in showing the empty places and the marks where well-known objects once had been. The impression on his mind that it was but yesterday when he received the letter from Mr. Gore was so continually implied in his talk, and the attempts to convey to him the idea that many weeks had passed and much had happened since then had been so soon swept away by recurrent forgetfulness that even Mr. Turnbull had begun to despair of preparing him to meet the facts by previous knowledge. The full sense of the present could only be imparted gradually by new experience, not by mere words, which must remain weaker than the impressions left by the old experience. This resolution to come downstairs was heard with trembling by the wife and children. Mrs. Tulliver said Tom must not go to St. Ogg's at the usual hour. He must wait and see his father downstairs. And Tom complied, though with an intense inward shrinking from the painful scene. The hearts of all three had been more deeply dejected than ever during the last few days. For guest and company had not bought the mill. Both mill and land had been knocked down to Wakeham, who had been over the premises and had laid before Mr. Dean and Mr. Glegg, in Mrs. Tulliver's presence, his willingness to employ Mr. Tulliver, in case of his recovery, as a manager of the business. This proposition had occasioned much family debating. Uncles and aunts were almost unanimously of opinion that such an offer ought not to be rejected when there was nothing in the way but a feeling in Mr. Tulliver's mind which, as neither aunts nor uncles shared it, was regarded as entirely unreasonable and childish, indeed as a transferring towards Wakeham of that indignation and hatred which Mr. Tulliver ought properly to have directed against himself, for his general quarrelsomeness and his special exhibition of it in going to law. Here was an opportunity for Mr. Tulliver to provide for his wife and daughter without any assistance from his wife's relations, and without that too evident descent into pauperism which makes it annoying to respectable people to meet the degraded member of the family by the wayside. Mr. Tulliver, Mrs. Glegg considered, must be made to feel, when he came to his right mind, that he could never humble himself enough, for that had come which she had always foreseen would come of his insolence in time past, to them as were the best friends he'd got to look to. Mr. Glegg and Mr. Dean were less stern in their views, but they both of them thought Tulliver had done enough harm by his hot-tempered crotchets, 
had ought to put them out of the question when a livelihood was offered him. Wakem showed a right feeling about the matter. He had no grudge against Tulliver. Tom had protested against entertaining the proposition. He shouldn't like his father to be under Wakem. He thought it would look mean-spirited. But his mother's main distress was the utter impossibility of ever turning Mr. Tulliver round about Wakem, or getting him to hear reason. No, they would all have to go and live in a pigsty on purpose to spite Wakem, who spoke so as nobody could be fairer. Indeed, Mrs. Tulliver's mind was reduced to such confusion by living in this strange medium of unaccountable sorrow, against which she continually appealed by asking, "'Oh, dear, what have I done to deserve worse than other women?' that Maggie began to suspect her poor mother's wits were quite going. "'Tom,' she said, when they were out of their father's room together, we must try to make father understand a little of what has happened before he goes downstairs. But we must get my mother away. She will say something that will do harm. Ask Kezia to fetch her down and keep her engaged with something in the kitchen. Kezia was equal to the task. Having declared her intention of staying till the master could get about again, wage or no wage, she had found a certain recompense in keeping a strong hand over her mistress, scolding her for moithering herself, and going about all day without changing her cap, and looking as if she was mushed. Altogether, this time of trouble was rather a Saturnalian time to Kezia. She could scold her betters with unreproved freedom. On this particular occasion— there were drying clothes to be fetched in. She wished to know if one pair of hands could do everything indoors and out, and observed that she should have thought it would be good for Mrs. Tulliver to put on her bonnet and get a breath of fresh air by doing that needful piece of work. Poor Mrs. Tulliver went submissively downstairs. To be ordered about by a servant was the last remnant of her household dignities. She would soon have no servant to scold her. Mr. Tulliver was resting in his chair a little, after the fatigue of dressing, and Maggie and Tom were seated near him, when Luke entered to ask if he should help Master downstairs. "'Ay, ay, Luke, stop a bit, sit down.' said Mr. Tulliver, pointing his stick towards a chair, and looking at him with that pursuant gaze which convalescent persons often have for those who have tended them, reminding one of an infant gazing about after its nurse. For Luke had been a constant night-watcher by his master's bed. "'How's the water now, eh, Luke?' said Mr. Tulliver. "'Dicks hasn't been choking you up again, eh?' "'No, sir, it's all right.' "'Aye, I, I thought not. "'He won't be in a hurry at that again, now Riley's been to settle him. "'That was what I said to Riley yesterday. "'I said, uh—' "'Mr. Tulliver leaned forward, resting his elbows on the armchair, "'and looking on the ground as if in search of something, "'striving after vanishing images like a man struggling against a doze. Maggie looked at Tom in mute distress. Their father's mind was so far off the present, which would by and by thrust itself on his wandering consciousness. Tom was almost ready to rush away with that impatience of painful emotion which makes one of the differences between youth and maiden, man and woman. "'Father,' said Maggie, laying her hand on his, "'Don't you remember that Mr. Riley is dead?' "'Dead?' said Mr. Tulliver, sharply, looking in her face with a strange examining glance. "'Yes. He died of apoplexy nearly a year ago. I remember hearing you say you had to pay money for him, and he left his daughters badly off. 
"'One of them is under-teacher at Miss Furness's, where I've been to school, you know.' "'Ah!' said her father doubtfully, still looking in her face. But as soon as Tom began to speak, he turned to look at him with the same inquiring glances, as if he were rather surprised at the presence of these two young people. Whenever his mind was wandering in the far past, he fell into this oblivion of their actual faces. They were not those of the lad and the little wench who belonged to that past. "'It's a long while since you had the dispute with Dick's father,' said Tom. "'I remember your talking about it three years ago, before I went to school at Mr. Stelling's. "'I've been at school there three years. Don't you remember?' Mr. Tulliver threw himself backward again, losing the childlike outward glance under a rush of new ideas which diverted him from external impressions. "'Ay, ay,' ay, he said after a minute or two, "'I've paid a deal of money. I was determined my son should have a good education. I'd none myself, and I felt the miss of it. And he'll want no other fortune. "'That's what I say, if Wakem was to get the better of me again.' The thought of Wakem roused new vibrations, and after a moment's pause he began to look at the coat he had on, and to feel in his side-pocket. Then he turned to Tom, and said in his old, sharp way, "'Where have they put Gore's letter?' It was close at hand in a drawer, for he had often asked for it before. "'You know what there is in the letter, father?' said Tom, as he gave it to him. "'To be sure I do,' said Mr. Tulliver, rather angrily. "'What of that? If Furley can't take to the property, somebody else can. There's plenty of people in the world besides Furley, but it's hindering. My not being well. Go and tell em to get the horse in the gig, Luke.' "'I can get down to St. Ogg's well enough. "'Gore's expecting me.' "'No, dear father,' Maggie burst out entreatingly. "'It's a very long while since all that. "'You've been ill a great many weeks. "'More than two months. "'Everything is changed.' "'Mr. Tulliver looked at them all three alternately with a startled gaze. The idea that much had happened of which he knew nothing had often transiently arrested him before, but it came upon him now with entire novelty. "'Yes, father,' said Tom, in answer to the gaze, "'you needn't trouble your mind about business until you are quite well. Everything is settled about that for the present, about the mill and the land and the debts.' "'What's settled, then?' said his father angrily. "'Don't you take on too much about it, sir,' said Luke. "'You'd have paid everybody if you could. That's what I said to Master Tom. I said you'd have paid everybody if you could.' Good Luke felt after the manner of contented, hard-working men whose lives have been spent in servitude, that sense of natural fitness in rank which made his master's downfall a tragedy to him. He was urged, in his slow way, to say something that would express his share in the family sorrow, and these words, which he had used over and over again to Tom when he wanted to decline the full payment of his fifty pounds out of the children's money, were the most ready to his tongue. They were just the words to lay the most painful hold on his master's bewildered mind. "'Paid everybody?' he said, with vehement agitation, his face flushing and his eye lighting up. "'Why, what, have they made me a bankrupt?' "'Oh, father, dear father,' said Maggie, who thought that terrible word really represented the fact, "'bear it well.' "'Because we love you. Your children will always love you. Tom will pay them all. He says he will when he's a man.' She felt her father beginning to tremble. His voice trembled, too, as he said, after a few moments, "'Ay, my little wench, but I shall never live twice o'er.' 
but perhaps you will live to see me pay everybody, father, said Tom, speaking with a great effort. Ah, my lad, said Mr. Tulliver, shaking his head slowly, but what's broke can never be whole again. It'd be your doing, not mine. Then looking up at him, you're only sixteen. It's an uphill fight for you, but you mustn't throw it at your father. The rascals have been too many for him. I've given you a good education. That'll start you. Something in his throat half choked the last words, the flush which had alarmed his children, because it had so often preceded a recurrence of paralysis, had subsided, and his face looked pale and tremulous. Tom said nothing. He was still struggling against his inclination to rush away. His father remained quiet a minute or two, but his mind did not seem to be wandering again. "'Have they sold me up, then?' he said, more calmly, as if he were possessed simply by the desire to know what had happened. "'Everything is sold, father, but we don't know all about the mill and the land yet,' said Tom, anxious to ward off any question leading to the fact that Wakeham was the purchaser. "'You must not be surprised to see the room look very bare downstairs, father,' said Maggie. "'But there's your chair and the bureau. They're not gone.' "'Let us go. Help me down, Luke. I'll go and see everything,' said Mr. Tulliver, leaning on his stick, and stretching out his other hand towards Luke. "'Aye, sir,' said Luke, as he gave his arm to his master, "'you'll make up your mind to it a bit better when you've seen everything. You'll get used to it. That's what my mother says about her shortness of breath. She says she's made friends with it now.' though she fought again it saw when it fust come on. Maggie ran on before to see that all was right in the dreary parlour, where the fire, dulled by the frosty sunshine, seemed part of the general shabbiness. She turned her father's chair, and pushed aside the table to make an easy way for him, and then stood with a beating heart to see him enter and look round for the first time. Tom advanced before him, carrying the leg-rest, and stood beside Maggie on the hearth. Of those two young hearts, Tom's suffered the most unmixed pain, for Maggie, with all her keen susceptibility, yet felt as if the sorrow made larger room for her love to flow in, and gave breathing space to her passionate nature. No true boy feels that. He would rather go and slay the Nemean lion, or perform any round of heroic harbours, than endure perpetual appeals to his pity, for evils over which he can make no conquest. Mr. Tulliver paused just inside the door, resting on Luke, and looking round him at all the bare places which for him were filled with the shadows of departed objects, the daily companions of his life. His faculties seemed to be renewing their strength from getting a footing on this demonstration of the senses. "'Ah!' he said, slowly moving towards his chair. "'They've sold me up! They've sold me up!' Then, seating himself, and laying down his stick while Luke left the room, he looked round again. "'Then left the big Bible,' he said. "'It's got everything in. When I was born and married, bring it me, Tom.' The quarto Bible was laid open before him at the fly-leaf, and while he was reading with slowly travelling eyes, Mrs. Tulliver entered the room, but stood in mute surprise to find her husband down already, and with the great Bible before him. "'Ah!' he said, looking at a spot where his finger rested. "'My mother was Margaret Beaton. She died when she was forty-seven. Hers wasn't a long-lived family. We're our mother's children. Gritty and me are. 
we shall go to our last bed before long. He seemed to be pausing over the record of his sister's birth and marriage, as if it were suggesting new thoughts to them. Then he suddenly looked up at Tom, and said, in a sharp tone of alarm, "'They haven't come upon Moss for the money as I lent him, have they?' "'No, father,' said Tom. The note was burnt. Mr. Tulliver turned his eyes on the page again, and presently said, "'Ah, Elizabeth Dodson. It's eighteen years since I married her.' "'Come next lady day,' said Mrs. Tulliver, going up to his side and looking at the page. Her husband fixed his eyes earnestly on her face. "'Poor Bessie,' he said, "'you was a pretty lass then. Everybody said so, and I used to think you kept your good looks rarely. But you're sorely aged. Don't you bear me ill will. I meant to do well by you.' We promised one another for better or for worse. But I never thought it would be so for worse as this, said poor Mrs. Tulliver, with the strange, scared look that had come over her of late. And my poor father gave me away, and to come on so all at once. Oh, mother, said Maggie, don't talk in that way. No, I know you won't let your poor mother speak. "'That's been the way all my life. "'Your father never minded what I said. "'It would have been a no use for me to beg and pray, "'and it would be no use now, "'not if I was to go down on my hands and knees.' "'Don't say so, Bessie,' said Mr. Tulliver, "'whose pride, in these first moments of humiliation, "'was in abeyance to the sense of some justice in his wife's reproach.' "'If there's anything left as I could do to make you amends, I wouldn't say you nay. "'Then we might stay here and get a living, and I might keep among my own sisters, "'and me being such a good wife to you, and never crossed you from week's end to week's end, "'and they all say so. "'They say it'd be nothing but right, only you're so turned against Wakem. "'Mother,' said Tom severely, "'this is not the time to talk about that.' "'Let her be,' said Mr. Tulver. "'Say what you mean, Bessie.' "'Why, now the mill and the land's all Wakem's, "'and he's got everything in his hands. "'What's the use of setting your face against him? "'When he says you may stay here and speaks as fair as can be, "'and says you may manage the business and have thirty shilling a week "'and a horse to ride about to market, "'and where have we got to put our heads? "'We must go into one of the cottages in the village, "'and me and my children brought down to that, "'and all because you must set your mind against folks "'till there's no turning you.' Mr. Tulliver had sunk back in his chair, trembling. "'You may do as you like wi' me, Bessie,' he said in a low voice. "'I'n been the bringing of you to poverty. This world's too many for me. I'm naught but a bankrupt. It's no use standing up for anything now.' "'Father,' said Tom, "'I don't agree with my mother or my uncle's and I don't think you ought to submit to be under Wakem. I get a pound a week now, and you can find something else to do when you get well. Say no more, Tom, say no more. I've had enough for this day. Give me a kiss, Bessie, and let us bear one another no ill will. We shall never be young again. This world's been too many for me. End of chapter 8 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 9 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording 
by Tom Denham. An item added to the family register. That first moment of renunciation and submission was followed by days of violent struggle in the miller's mind, as the gradual access of bodily strength brought with it increasing ability to embrace in one view all the conflicting conditions under which he found himself. Feeble limbs easily resign themselves to be tethered, and when we are subdued by sickness it seems possible to us to fulfil pledges which the old vigour comes back and breaks. There were times when poor Tulliver thought the fulfilment of his promise to Bessie was something quite too hard for human nature. He had promised her without knowing what she was going to say. She might as well have asked him to carry a ton weight on his back. But again there were many feelings arguing on her side, besides the sense that life had been made hard to her by having married him. He saw a possibility, by much pinching, of saving money out of his salary towards paying a second dividend to his creditors, and it would not be easy elsewhere to get a situation such as he could fill. He had led an easy life, ordering much and working little, and had no aptitude for any new business. He must perhaps take to day labour, and his wife must have help from her sisters, a prospect doubly bitter to him, now they had let all Bessie's precious things be sold, probably because they liked to set her against him, by making her feel that he had brought her to that pass. He listened to their admonitory talk, when they came to urge on him what he was bound to do for poor Bessie's sake, with averted eyes, that every now and then flashed on them furtively when their backs were turned. Nothing but the dread of needing their help could have made it an easier alternative to take their advice. But the strongest influence of all was the love of the old premises where he had run about when he was a boy, just as Tom had done after him. The Tullivers had lived on this spot for generations and he had sat listening on a low stool on winter evenings while his father talked of the old half-timbered mill that had been there before the last great floods which damaged it so that his grandfather pulled it down and built the new one. It was when he got able to walk about and look at all the old objects that he felt the strain of this clinging affection for the old home as part of his life, part of himself. He couldn't bear to think of himself living on any other spot than this, where he knew the sound of every gate and door, and felt that the shape and colour of every roof and weather stain and broken hillock was good, because his growing senses had been fed on them. Our instructed vagrancy, which has hardly time to linger by the hedgerows, but runs away early to the tropics, and is at home with palms and banyans, which is nourished on books of travel, and stretches the theatre of its imagination to the Zambezi, can hardly get a dim notion of what an old-fashioned man like Tulliver felt for this spot, where all his memories centred, and where life seemed like a familiar smooth-handled tool that the fingers clutch with loving ease. And just now, he was living in that freshened memory of the far-off time which comes to us in the passive hours of recovery from sickness. "'I look,' he said one afternoon, as he stood looking over the orchard gate, "'I remember the day they planted those apple trees. My father was a huge man for planting. It was like a merry-making to him to get a cart full of young trees.' and I used to stand at the cold with him and follow him about like a dog. Then he turned round, and leaning against the gatepost, looked at the opposite buildings. The old mill had missed me, I think, Luke. There's a story as when the mill changes hands, the river's angry. I've heard my father say it many a time. There's no telling whether there mayn't be summit in the story, 
for this is a puzzling world, and old Harry's got a finger in it. It's been too many for me, I know. Aye, sir, said Luke, with soothing sympathy. What with the rust on the wheat, and the, the fire and the ricks and that, as I've seen in my time, things often looks comical. There's the bacon fat we our last pigs runs away like butter. It leaves naught but a scratching. "'It's just as if it was yesterday now,' Mr. Tulver went on, "'when my father began the malting. "'I remember the day they finished the malt house. "'I thought somewhat great was to come of it, "'for we'd a plum pudding that day and a bit of a feast, "'and I said to my mother, "'She was a fine dark-eyed woman, my mother was. "'The little wench shall be as like her as two peas.' Here Mr. Tulliver put his stick between his legs, and took out his snuff-box for the greater enjoyment of this anecdote, which dropped from him in fragments, as if he every other moment lost narration in vision. I was a little chap, no higher much than my mother's knee. She was so fond of us children, gritty in me. And so I said to her, "'Mother,' I said, "'Shall we have plum pudding every day because of the malt house?' "'She used to tell me of that, till her dying day. "'She was but a young woman when she died, my mother was. "'But it's forty good years since they've finished the malt house, "'and it isn't many days out of em all, "'as I haven't looked out into the yard there, "'the first thing in the morning, all weathers, "'from year's end to year's end.' I should go off my head in a new place. I should be like as if I'd lost me way. It's all hard, whichever way I look at it. The harness'll gall me, but it'd be summat to draw along the old road instead of a new one. Aye, sir, said Luke, you'd be a deal better here nor in some new place. I can't abide new places, Miss N., things is all as awkward. Narrow-wheeled wagons be like, and the styles all another sort, and oat cake is some places, twart the head of the floss there. It's poor work changing your countryside. But I doubt, Luke, they'll be forgetting rid of Ben, and making you do with a lad, and I must help a bit with a mill. You'll have a worse place. Ne'er mind, sir, said Luke. I shan't plague Miss N. I'n been wi' you twenty year, and you can't get twenty year wi' whistling for em, no more nor you can make the trees grow. You mun wait till God Almighty sends em. I can't abide new victual nor new faces, I can't. You never know but what they'll gripe you. The walk was finished in silence after this, for Luke had disburthened himself of thoughts to an extent that left his conversational resources quite barren, and Mr. Tulliver had relapsed from his recollections into a painful meditation on the choice of hardships before him. Maggie noticed that he was unusually absent that evening at tea, and afterwards he sat leaning forward in his chair, looking at the ground, moving his lips, and shaking his head from time to time. Then he looked hard at Mrs. Tulliver, who was knitting opposite him, then at Maggie, who, as she bent over her sewing, was intensely conscious of some drama going forward in her father's mind. Suddenly he took up the poker, and broke the large coal fiercely. "'Dear heart, Mr. Tulliver, what can you be thinking of?' said his wife, looking up in alarm. "'It's very wasteful breaking the coal, and we've got hardly any large coal left, and I don't know where the rest is to come from.' "'I don't think you're quite so well to-night, are you, father?' said Maggie. "'You seem uneasy.' "'Why, how is it Tom doesn't come?' said Mr. Tulliver impatiently. "'Dear heart, is it time? I must go and get his supper.' said Mrs. Tulliver, laying down her knitting, and leaving the room. "'It's nigh upon half-past eight, said Mr. Tulliver. 
He'll be here soon. Go, go and get the big Bible, and open it at the beginning, where everything's set down, and get the pen and ink. Maggie obeyed, wondering, but her father gave no further orders, and only sat listening for Tom's footfall on the gravel, apparently irritated by the wind which had risen and was roaring so as to drown all other sounds. There was a strange light in his eyes that rather frightened Maggie. She began to wish that Tom would come too. "'There he is, then,' said Mr. Tulliver, in an excited way, when the knock came at last. Maggie went to open the door, but her mother came out of the kitchen hurriedly, saying, "'Stop a bit, Maggie. I'll open it.' Mrs. Tulliver had begun to be a little frightened at her boy, but she was jealous of every office others did for him. "'Your supper's ready by the kitchen fire, me boy,' she said, as she took off his hat and coat. "'You shall have it by yourself, just as you like, and I won't speak to you.' "'I think my father wants Tom, mother,' said Maggie. "'He must come into the parlour first. Tom entered with his usual saddened evening face, but his eyes fell immediately on the open Bible and the inkstand, and he glanced with a look of anxious surprise at his father, who was saying, "'Come, come, you're late. I want you.' "'Is there anything the matter, father?' said Tom. "'You sit down. All of you,' said Mr. Tulliver peremptorily. "'And Tom?' "'Sit down here. I've got something for you to write in the Bible.' They all three sat down, looking at him. He began to speak, slowly, looking first at his wife. "'I've made up my mind, Bessie, and I'll be as good as my word to you. There's the same grave made for us to lie down in, and we mustn't be bearing one another ill will.' I'll stop in the old place, and I'll serve under Wakem, and I'll serve him like an honest man. There's no Tulliver but what's honest, mind that, Tom. Here his voice rose. They'll have it to throw up against me as I paid a dividend, but it wasn't my fault. It was because there's rascals in the world. They've been too many for me, and I must give in. I'll put my neck in harness, for you've a right to say as I've brought you into trouble, Bessie, and I'll serve him as honest as if he was no rascal. I'm an honest man, though I shall never hold my head up no more. I'm a tree as is broke, a tree as is broke. He paused and looked on the ground. Then suddenly, raising his head, he said in a louder yet deeper tone, "'But I won't forgive him. I know what they say. He never meant me any harm. That's the way old Harry props up the rascals. He's been at the bottom of everything. But he's a fine gentleman. I know, I know. I shouldn't have gone to law, they say. "'But who made it so as there was no arbitrating and no justice to be got? "'It signifies nothing to him. I know that. "'He's one of them fine gentlemen as get money by doing business for poorer folks, "'and when he's made beggars of him, he'll give him charity. "'I won't forgive him. "'I wish he might be punished with shame till his own son had liked to forget him.' I wish he may do summat as they'd make him work at the treadmill. But he won't. He's too big a rascal to let the law lay hold on him. And you mind this, Tom. You never forgive him neither if you mean to be my son. There'll maybe come a time when you may make him feel, it'll never come to me, and got my head under the yoke. Now write, write it in the Bible. "'Oh, father, what?' said Maggie, sinking down by his knee, pale and trembling. "'It's wicked to curse and bear malice.' "'It isn't wicked, I tell you,' 
said her father fiercely. "'It's wicked as the rascals should prosper. It's the devil's doing. Do as I tell you, Tom. Write.' "'What am I to write, father?' said Tom, with gloomy submission. "'Write as your father, Edward Tulliver, took service under John Wakem, the man as had helped to ruin him, because I'd promised my wife to make her what amends I could for her trouble, and because I wanted to die in the old place, where I was born, and my father was born. Put that in the right words. You know how. And then write, as I don't forgive Wakem for all that, and for all I'll serve him honest, I wish evil may befall him. Write that. There was a dead silence as Tom's pen moved along the paper. Mrs. Tulliver looked scared, and Maggie trembled like a leaf. Now, let me hear what you've wrote, said Mr. Tulliver. Tom read aloud slowly. Now write, write as you'll remember what Wakem's done to your father, and you'll make him and his feel it if ever the day comes, and sign your name Thomas Tulliver. Oh, no, father, dear father, said Maggie, almost choked with fear. You shouldn't make Tom write that. Be quiet, Maggie, said Tom. I shall write it. End of chapter 9 of Book 3rd End of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 1 of Book 4th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Book Fourth The Valley of Humiliation Chapter One A Variation of Protestantism Unknown to Bossuet Journeying down the Rhone on a summer's day, you have perhaps felt the sunshine made dreary by those ruined villages which stud the banks in certain parts of its course telling how the swift river once rose like an angry, destroying god, sweeping down the feeble generations whose breath is in their nostrils, and making their dwellings a desolation. Strange contrast, you may have thought, between the effect produced on us by these dismal remnants of commonplace houses, which in their best days were but the sign of a sordid life, belonging in all its details to our own vulgar era, and the effect produced by those ruins on the castled Rhine, which have crumbled and mellowed into such harmony with the green and rocky steeps, that they seem to have a natural fitness, like the mountain pine. Nay, even in the day when they were built, they must have had this fitness, as if they had been raised by an earth-born race, who had inherited from their mighty parent a sublime instinct of form." and that was a day of romance. If those robber barons were somewhat grim and drunken ogres, they had a certain grandeur of the wild beast in them. They were forest boars with tusks, tearing and rending, not the ordinary domestic grunter. They represented the demon forces forever in collision with beauty, virtue, and the gentle uses of life. They made a fine contrast in the picture with the wandering minstrel, the soft-lipped princess, the pious recluse, and the timid Israelite. That was a time of colour, when the sunlight fell on glancing steel and floating banners, a time of adventure and fierce struggle, nay, of living religious art and religious enthusiasm. For were not cathedrals built in those days, and did not great emperors leave their western palaces to die before the infidel strongholds in the sacred east? Therefore it is that these Rhine castles thrill me with a sense of poetry, 
they belong to the grand historic life of humanity and raise up for me the vision of an epoch but these dead-tinted hollow-eyed angular skeletons of villages on the rhone oppress me with the feeling that human life very much of it is a narrow ugly grovelling existence which even calamity does not elevate but rather tends to exhibit in all its bare vulgarity of conception and i have a cruel conviction that the lives these ruins are the traces of were part of a gross sum of obscure vitality that will be swept into the same oblivion with the generations of ants and beavers perhaps something akin to this oppressive feeling may have weighed upon you in watching this old-fashioned family life on the banks of the floss which even sorrow hardly suffices to lift above the level of the tragicomic. It is a sordid life, you say, this of the Tullivers and Dodsons, irradiated by no sublime principles, no romantic visions, no active self-renouncing faith, moved by none of those wild, uncontrollable passions which create the dark shadows of misery and crime, without that primitive rough simplicity of wants, that hard submissive ill-paid toil, that childlike spelling out of what nature has written, which gives its poetry to peasant life. Here one has conventional worldly notions and habits without instruction and without polish, surely the most prosaic form of human life proud respectability in a gig of unfashionable build, worldliness without side-dishes. Observing these people narrowly, even when the iron hand of misfortune has shaken them from their unquestioning hold on the world, one sees little trace of religion, still less of a distinctively Christian creed, their belief in the unseen, so far as it manifests itself at all, seems to be rather of a pagan kind. Their moral notions, though held with strong tenacity, seem to have no standard beyond hereditary custom. You could not live among such people. You are stifled for want of an outlet towards something beautiful, great, or noble. You are irritated with these dull men and women, as a kind of population out of keeping with the earth on which they live. With this rich plain where the great river flows forever onward, and links the small pulse of the old English town with the beatings of the world's mighty heart. A vigorous superstition, that lashes its gods or lashes its own back, seems to be more congruous with the mystery of the human lot than the mental condition of these emmet-like Dodsons and Tullivers. I share with you this sense of oppressive narrowness, but it is necessary that we should feel it if we care to understand how it acted on the lives of Tom and Maggie, how it has acted on young natures in many generations, that in the onward tendency of human things have risen above the mental level of the generation before them, to which they have been nevertheless tied by the strongest fibres of their hearts. The suffering, whether of martyr or victim, which belongs to every historical advance of mankind, is represented in this way in every town, and by hundreds of obscure hearths. And we need not shrink from this comparison of small things with great, for does not science tell us that its highest striving is after the ascertainment of a unity which shall bind the smallest things with the greatest? In natural science, I have understood, there is nothing petty to the mind that has a large vision of relations, and to which every single object suggests a vast sum of conditions. It is surely the same with the observation of human life. Certainly, the religious and moral ideas of the Dodsons and Tullivers were of too specific a kind to be arrived at deductively, from the statement that they were part of the Protestant population of Great Britain. 
their theory of life had its core of soundness, as all theories must have, on which decent and prosperous families have been reared and have flourished. But it had the very slightest tincture of theology. If, in the maiden days of the Dodson sisters, their Bibles opened more easily at some parts than others, it was because of dried tulip petals which had been distributed quite impartially, without preference for the historical, devotional, or doctrinal. Their religion was of a simple, semi-pagan kind, but there was no heresy in it, if heresy properly means choice, for they didn't know there was any other religion except that of chapel-goers, which appeared to run in families, like asthma. How should they know? The vicar of their pleasant rural parish was not a controversialist, but a good hand at whist, and one who had a joke always ready for a blooming female parishioner. The religion of the Dodsons consisted in revering whatever was customary and respectable. It was necessary to be baptised, else one could not be buried in the churchyard, and to take the sacrament before death as a security against more dimly understood perils. But it was of equal necessity to have the proper pallbearers and well-cured hams at one's funeral, and to leave an unimpeachable will. A Dodson would not be taxed with the omission of anything that was becoming, or that belonged to that eternal fitness of things which was plainly indicated in the practice of the most substantial parishioners. And in the family traditions, such as obedience to parents, faithfulness to kindred, industry, rigid honesty, thrift, the thorough scouring of wooden and copper utensils, the hoarding of coins likely to disappear from the currency, the production of first-rate commodities for the market, and the general preference for whatever was home-made. The Dodsons were a very proud race, and their pride lay in the utter frustration of all desire to tax them with a breach of traditional duty or propriety a wholesome pride in many respects, since it identified honour with perfect integrity, thoroughness of work, and faithfulness to admitted rules. And society owes some worthy qualities in many of her members to mothers of the Dodson class, who made their butter and their fromenty well, and would have felt disgraced to make it otherwise. To be honest and poor— was never a Dodson motto, still less to seem rich though being poor. Rather, the family badge was to be honest and rich, and not only rich, but richer than was supposed. To live respected, and have the proper bearers at your funeral, was an achievement of the ends of existence that would be entirely nullified if, on the reading of your will, you sank in the opinion of your fellow-men, either by turning out to be poorer than they expected, or by leaving your money in a capricious manner, without strict regard to degrees of kin. The right thing must always be done towards kindred. The right thing was to correct them severely, if they were other than a credit to the family, but still not to alienate from them the smallest rightful share in the family shoe-buckles and other property. A conspicuous quality in the Dodson character was its genuineness. Its vices and virtues alike were phases of a proud, honest egoism, which had a hearty dislike to whatever made against its own credit and interest, and would be frankly hard of speech to inconvenient kin but would never forsake or ignore them, would not let them want bread, but only require them to eat it with bitter herbs. The same sort of traditional belief ran in the Tulliver veins, but it was carried in richer blood, having elements of generous imprudence, warm affection, and hot-tempered rashness. 
Mr. Tulliver's grandfather had been heard to say that he was descended from one Ralph Tulliver, a wonderfully clever fellow who had ruined himself. It is likely enough that the clever Ralph was a high liver, rode spirited horses, and was very decidedly of his own opinion. On the other hand, nobody had ever heard of a Dodson who had ruined himself. It was not the way of that family. If such were the views of life on which the Dodsons and Tullivers had been reared in the praiseworthy past of pit and high prices, you will infer from what you already know concerning the state of society in St. Ogg's that there had been no highly modifying influence to act on them in their maturer life. It was still possible, even in that later time of anti-Catholic preaching, for people to hold many pagan ideas, and believe themselves good church people notwithstanding. So we need hardly feel any surprise at the fact that Mr. Tulliver, though a regular church-goer, recorded his vindictiveness on the fly-leaf of his Bible. It was not that any harm could be said concerning the vicar of that charming rural parish to which Dorcott Mill belonged, he was a man of excellent family, an irreproachable bachelor of elegant pursuits, had taken honours, and held a fellowship. Mr. Tulliver regarded him with dutiful respect, as he did everything else belonging to the church service, but he considered that church was one thing, and common sense another, and he wanted nobody to tell him what common sense was. Certain seeds which are required to find a nidus for themselves under unfavourable circumstances have been supplied by nature with an apparatus of hooks, so that they will get a hold on very unreceptive surfaces. The spiritual seed which had been scattered over Mr. Tulliver had apparently been destitute of any corresponding provision, and had slipped off to the winds again from a total absence of hooks. End of chapter 1 of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 2 of Book 4 of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The torn nest is pierced by the thorns. There is something sustaining in the very agitation that accompanies the first shocks of trouble, just as an acute pain is often a stimulus, and produces an excitement which is transient strength. It is in the slow, changed life that follows, in the time when sorrow has become stale, and has no longer an emotive intensity that counteracts its pain, in the time when day follows day in dull, unexpectant sameness, and trial is a dreary routine. It is then that despair threatens, it is then that the peremptory hunger of the soul is felt and eye and ear are strained after some unlearned secret of our existence, which shall give to endurance the nature of satisfaction. This time of utmost need was come to Maggie, with her short span of thirteen years. To the usual precocity of the girl, she added that early experience of struggle, of conflict between the inward impulse and outward fact, which is the lot of every imaginative and passionate nature, and the years since she hammered the nails into her wooden fetish among the worm-eaten shelves of the attic had been filled with so eager a life in the triple world of reality, books, and waking dreams, that Maggie, 
was strangely old for her years in everything except in her entire want of that prudence and self-command which were the qualities that made Tom manly in the midst of his intellectual boyishness. And now her lot was beginning to have a still, sad monotony, which threw her more than ever on her inward self. Her father was able to attend to business again, his affairs were settled, and he was acting as Wakeham's manager on the old spot. Tom went to and fro every morning and evening, and became more and more silent in the short intervals at home. What was there to say? One day was like another, and Tom's interest in life, driven back and crushed on every other side, was concentrating itself into the one channel of ambitious resistance to misfortune. The peculiarities of his father and mother were very irksome to him, now they were laid bare of all the softening accompaniments of an easy, prosperous home. For Tom had very clear, prosaic eyes, not apt to be dimmed by mists of feeling or imagination. Poor Mrs. Tulliver, it seemed, would never recover her old self, her placid household activity. How could she? The objects among which her mind had moved complacently were all gone. All the little hopes and schemes and speculations, all the pleasant little cares about her treasures, which had made this world quite comprehensible to her for a quarter of a century, since she had made her first purchase of the sugar-tongs, had been suddenly snatched away from her, and she remained bewildered in this empty life. Why that should have happened to her, which had not happened to other women, remained an insoluble question, by which she expressed her perpetual ruminating comparison of the past with the present. It was piteous to see the comely woman getting thinner and more worn under a bodily as well as mental restlessness, which made her often wander about the empty house after her work was done, until Maggie, becoming alarmed about her, would seek her and bring her down by telling her how it vexed Tom that she was injuring her health by never sitting down and resting herself. Yet, amidst this helpless imbecility, there was a touching trait of humble, self-devoting maternity, which made Maggie feel tenderly towards her poor mother, amidst all the little wearing griefs caused by her mental feebleness. She would let Maggie do none of the work that was heaviest and most soiling to the hands, and was quite peevish when Maggie attempted to relieve her from her great brushing and scouring. "'Let it alone, me dear. Your hands'll get as hard as hard,' she would say. "'It's your mother's place to do that. I can't do the sewing. My eyes fail me.' And she would still brush and carefully tend Maggie's hair, which she had become reconciled to in spite of its refusal to curl, now it was so long and massy. Maggie was not her pet child, and in general would have been much better if she had been quite different. Yet the womanly heart, so bruised in its small personal desires, found a future to rest on in the life of this young thing, and the mother pleased herself with wearing out her own hands to save the hands that had so much more life in them. But the constant presence of her mother's regretful bewilderment was less painful to Maggie than that of her father's sullen, incommunicative depression. As long as the paralysis was upon him, and it seemed as if he might always be in a childlike condition of dependence, as long as he was still only half awakened to his trouble, Maggie had felt the strong tide of pitying love almost as an inspiration, a new power that would make the most difficult life easy for his sake. But now, instead of childlike dependence, there had come 
a taciturn, hard concentration of purpose, in strange contrast with his old vehement communicativeness and high spirit, and this lasted from day to day and from week to week, the dull eye never brightening with any eagerness or any joy. It is something cruelly incomprehensible to youthful natures, this sombre sameness in middle-aged and elderly people, whose life has resulted in disappointment and discontent, to whose faces a smile becomes so strange that the sad lines all about the lips and brow seem to take no notice of it, and it hurries away again for want of a welcome. "'Why will they not kindle up and be glad sometimes?' thinks young Elasticity. "'It would be so easy if they only liked to do it.' and these leaden clouds that never part are apt to create impatience even in the filial affection that streams forth in nothing but tenderness and pity in the time of more obvious affliction. Mr. Tulliver lingered nowhere away from home. He hurried away from market. He refused all invitations to stay and chat as in old times in the houses where he called on business he could not be reconciled with his lot. There was no attitude in which his pride did not feel its bruises, and in all behaviour toward him, whether kind or cold, he detected an allusion to the change in his circumstances. Even the days on which Wakeham came to ride round the land and inquire into the business were not so black to him as those market days on which he had met several creditors who had accepted a composition from him. To save something towards the repayment of those creditors was the object toward which he was now bending all his thoughts and efforts, and under the influence of this all-compelling demand of his nature, the somewhat profuse man, who hated to be stinted or to stint anyone else in his own house, was gradually metamorphosed into the keen-eyed grudger of morsels. Mrs. Tulliver could not economise enough to satisfy him in their food and firing, and he would eat nothing himself but what was of the coarsest quality. Tom, though depressed and strongly repelled by his father's sullenness and the dreariness of home, entered thoroughly into his father's feelings about paying the creditors, and the poor lad brought his first quarter's money with a delicious sense of achievement, and gave it to his father to put into the tin box which held the savings. The little store of sovereigns in the tin box seemed to be the only sight that brought a faint beam of pleasure into the miller's eyes, faint and transient for it was soon dispelled by the thought that the time would be long, perhaps longer than his life, before the narrow savings could remove the hateful incubus of debt. A deficit of more than five hundred pounds, with the accumulating interest, seemed a deep pit to fill with the savings from thirty shillings a week, even when Tom's probable savings were to be added. On this one point there was entire community of feeling in the four widely differing beings who sat round the dying fire of sticks which made a cheap warmth for them on the verge of bedtime. Mrs. Tulliver carried the proud integrity of the Dodsons in her blood, and had been brought up to think that to wrong people of their money, which was another phrase for debt, was a sort of moral pillory. It would have been wickedness to her mind to have run counter to her husband's desire to do the right thing and retrieve his name. She had a confused, dreamy notion that if the creditors were all paid, her plate and linen ought to come back to her, but she had an inbred perception that while people owed money they were unable to pay, they couldn't rightly call anything their own. She murmured a little, 
that Mr. Tulliver so peremptorily refused to receive anything in repayment from Mr. and Mrs. Moss, but to all his requirements of household economy she was submissive to the point of denying herself the cheapest indulgences of mere flavour. Her only rebellion was to smuggle into the kitchen something that would make rather a better supper than usual for Tom. These narrow notions about debt, held by the old-fashioned Tullivers, may perhaps excite a smile on the faces of many readers in these days of wide commercial views and wide philosophy, according to which everything writes itself without any trouble of ours. The fact that my tradesman is out of pocket by me is to be looked at through the serene certainty that somebody else's tradesman is in pocket by somebody else and since there must be bad debts in the world, why, it is mere egoism not to like that we in particular should make them instead of our fellow-citizens. I am telling the history of very simple people, who had never had any illuminating doubts as to personal integrity and honour. Under all this grim melancholy and narrowing concentration of desire, Mr. Tulliver retained the feeling towards his little wench, which made her presence a need to him, though it would not suffice to cheer him. She was still the desire of his eyes, but the sweet spring of fatherly love was now mingled with bitterness, like everything else. When Maggie laid down her work at night, it was her habit to get a low stool and sit by her father's knee, leaning her cheek against it. How she wished he would stroke her head, or give some sign that he was soothed by the sense that he had a daughter who loved him. But now she got no answer to her little caresses, either from her father or from Tom, the two idols of her life. Tom was weary and abstracted in the short intervals when he was at home, and her father was bitterly preoccupied with the thought that the girl was growing up, was shooting up into a woman, and how was she to do well in life? She had a poor chance for marrying, down in the world as they were, and he hated the thought of her marrying poorly, as her Aunt Gritty had done. That would be a thing to make him turn in his grave. The little wench so pulled down by children and toil as her Aunt Moss was. When uncultured minds, confined to a narrow range of personal experience, are under the pressure of continued misfortune, their inward life is apt to become a perpetually repeated round of sad and bitter thoughts. The same words, the same scenes, are evolved over and over again, the same mood accompanies them. The end of the year finds them as much what they were at the beginning, as if they were machines set to a recurrent series of movements. The sameness of the days was broken by few visitors. Uncles and aunts paid only short visits now. Of course they could not stay to meals, and the constraint caused by Mr. Tulliver's savage silence which seemed to add to the hollow resonance of the bare, uncarpeted room when the aunts were talking, heightened the unpleasantness of these family visits on all sides, and tended to make them rare. As for other acquaintances, there is a chill air surrounding those who are down in the world, and people are glad to get away from them, as from a cold room. Human beings, mere men and women, without furniture, without anything to offer you, who have ceased to count as anybody, present an embarrassing negation of reasons for wishing to see them, or of subjects on which to converse with them. At that distant day there was a dreary isolation in the civilised Christian society of these realms for families that had dropped below their original level, unless they belonged to a sectarian church which gets some warmth of brotherhood 
by walling in the sacred fire. End of chapter 2 of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Part 1 of Chapter 3 of Book 4 of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. A Voice from the Past One afternoon, when the chestnuts were coming into flower, Maggie had brought her chair outside the front door, and was seated there with a book on her knees. Her dark eyes had wandered from the book, but they did not seem to be enjoying the sunshine which pierced the screen of jasmine on the projecting porch at her right, and threw leafy shadows on her pale round cheek. They seemed rather to be searching for something that was not disclosed by the sunshine. It had been a more miserable day than usual. Her father, after a visit of Wakeham's, had had a paroxysm of rage, in which for some trifling fault he had beaten the boy who served in the mill. Once before, since his illness, he had had a similar paroxysm in which he had beaten his horse, and the scene had left a lasting terror in Maggie's mind. The thought had risen that some time or other he might beat her mother if she happened to speak in her feeble way at the wrong moment. The keenest of all dread with her was lest her father should add to his present misfortune the wretchedness of doing something irretrievably disgraceful. The battered school-book of Tom's, which she held on her knees, could give her no fortitude under the pressure of that dread, and again and again her eyes had filled with tears as they wandered vaguely seeing neither the chestnut trees nor the distant horizon, but only future scenes of home sorrow. Suddenly she was roused by the sound of the opening gate, and of footsteps on the gravel. It was not Tom who was entering, but a man in a sealskin cap and a blue plush waistcoat, carrying a pack on his back, and followed closely by a bull terrier of brindled coat and defiant aspect. "'Oh, Bob, it's you!' said Maggie, starting up with a smile of pleased recognition, for there had been no abundance of kind acts to efface the recollection of Bob's generosity. "'I'm so glad to see you!' "'Thank you, miss,' said Bob, lifting his cap and showing a delighted face but immediately relieving himself of some accompanying embarrassment by looking down at his dog, and saying in a tone of disgust, "'Get out, will you, you thundering sawney!' "'My brother is not at home yet, Bob,' said Maggie. "'He is always at St. Ogg's in the daytime.' "'Well, miss,' said Bob, "'I should be glad to see Mr. Tom, but that isn't just what I'm come for. Look here.' Bob was in the act of depositing his pack on the doorstep, and with it a row of small books fastened together with string. Apparently, however, they were not the object to which he wished to call Maggie's attention, but rather something which he had carried under his arm, wrapped in a red handkerchief. "'See here,' he said again, laying the red parcel on the others and unfolding it, you won't think I'm a-making too free, miss, I hope, but I lighted on these books, and I thought they might make up to you a bit for them as you've lost, for I heard you speak of pictures, and as for pictures, look here. The opening of the red handkerchief had disclosed a superannuated keepsake, and six or seven numbers of a portrait gallery in royal octavo and the emphatic request to look referred to a portrait of George the Fourth in all the majesty of his depressed cranium and voluminous neckcloth. "'There's all sorts of gentlemen here,' Bob went on, turning over the leaves with some excitement. "'We're all sorts of noses, and some bald, and some were wigs. 
Parliament gentlemen, I reckon. And here, he added, opening the keepsake, here's ladies for you, some with curly hair, and some with smooth, and some a smiling with their heads at one side, and some as if they was going to cry. Look here, a sitting on the ground out a door, dressed like the ladies I ain't seen get out of the carriages at the balls in the old hall there. My eyes! I wonder what the chaps wear as go a court in em. I sot up till the clock was gone twelve last night, a looking at em I did, till they stared at me out of the pictures, as if they'd know when I spoke to em. But laws, I shouldn't know what to say to em. They'll be more fitting company for you, miss, and the man at the bookstall, he said they banged everything for pictures. He said there was a first-rate article. "'And you've brought them for me, Bob?' said Maggie, deeply touched by this simple kindness. "'How very, very good of you! But I'm afraid you gave a great deal of money for them.' "'Not me,' said Bob. I'd a give three times the money if they'll make up to you a bit as for them as was sold away from you, miss, for I never forgot how you looked when you fretted about the books being gone. It stuck by me, as if it was a picture hanging before me. And when I see the book up in upon the stall, with a lady looking out of it, we eyes a bit like yourn when you was fretting. You'll excuse me taking the liberty, miss, I thought I'd make free to buy it for you, and then I bought the books full of gentlemen to match, and then— Here Bob took up the small stringed packet of books. I thought you might like a bit more print as well as the pictures, and I got these for a say-so. They're cram full of print, and I thought they'd do no harm coming along with these bettermost books, and I hope you won't say me nay— and tell me as you won't have him, like Mr. Tom did with the sovereigns. "'No, indeed, Bob,' said Maggie. "'I'm very thankful to you for thinking of me, and being so good to me and Tom. I don't think any one ever did such a kind thing for me before. I haven't many friends who care for me.' "'Have a dog, miss. They're better friends nor any Christian,' said Bob laying down his pack again, which he had taken up with the intention of hurrying away, for he felt considerable shyness in talking to a young lass like Maggie, though, as he usually said of himself, his tongue overrun him when he began to speak. "'I can't give you mumps, because he'd break his heart to go away from me. Eh, hey, mumps, what do you say, you riff-raff?' Mumps declined to express himself more diffusely than by a single affirmative movement of his tail. "'But I'll get you a pup, miss, and welcome.' "'No, thank you, Bob. We have a yard dog, and I mayn't keep a dog of my own.' "'Eh, that's a pity. Else there's a pup. If you don't mind about it not being thoroughbred, its mother acts in the punch show. An uncommon sensible bitch, she seems more sense we her bark nor half the chaps can put into their talk from breakfast to sundown. There's one chap carries pots, a poor low trade as any on the road. He says, Why, Toby's not but a mongrel, there's not to look at in her. But I says to him, Why, what do you you send but a mongrel? There wasn't much picking of your father and mother to look at you. Not but what I like a bit of breed myself, but I can't abide to see one cur grinning at another. I wish you good evening, miss, said Bob, abruptly taking up his pack again, under the consciousness that his tongue was acting in an undisciplined manner. Won't you come in the evening some time and see my brother, Bob? said Maggie. Yes, miss, thank you, another time. "'You'll give my duty to him, if you please. "'He is a fine growed chap, Mr. Tom is. "'He took to grow into the legs, and I didn't.' "'The pack was down again now, "'the hook of the stick having somehow gone wrong. "'You don't call Mumps a cur, I suppose,' "'said Maggie, divining that any interest she showed in Mumps "'would be gratifying to his master.' 
"'No, miss, a fine way off that,' said Bob, with a pitying smile. "'Mumps is as fine a cross as you'll see anywhere along the floss, "'and I ain't been up it with the barges times in o. "'Why, the gentry stops to look at him, "'but you won't catch Mumps a-looking at the gentry much. "'He minds his own business, he does.' The expression of Mumps's face, which seemed to be tolerating the superfluous existence of objects in general, was strongly confirmatory of this high praise. "'He looks dreadfully surly,' said Maggie. "'Would he let me pat him?' "'Aye, that he wouldn't, thank you. He knows his company, Mumps does. He isn't a dog as'll be caught with gingerbread.' "'He'll smell a thief a good deal stronger nor the gingerbread, he would. "'Laws, I talk to him by the hour together when I'm walking in lone places, "'and if I'm done a bit of mischief, I always tell him. "'I ain't got no secrets but what Mumps knows em. "'He knows about my big thumb, he does.' "'Your big thumb? What's that, Bob?' said Maggie. "'That's what it is, miss.' said Bob quickly, exhibiting a singularly broad specimen of that difference between the man and the monkey. "'It tells him measuring out the flannel, you see. I carry flannel because it's light for me pack, and it's dear stuff, you see, so a big thumb tells. I clap my thumb at the end of the yard, and cut to the hither side of it, and the old women aren't up to it.' "'But, Bob!' said Maggie, looking serious. "'That's cheating. I don't like to hear you say that.' "'Don't you, miss?' said Bob, regretfully. "'Then I'm sorry I said it. But I'm so used to talking to Mumps, and he doesn't mind a bit of cheating when it's them skinflint women as haggle and haggle and had like to get their flal for nothing, and had never ask themselves how I got my dinner out on't. I never cheat anybody as doesn't want to cheat me, miss. Laws, I'm an honest chap, I am. Only I must have a bit of sport, and now I don't go with the ferrets. I ain't got no varmint to come over but them haggling women. I wish you good evening, miss. Good-bye, Bob. Thank you very much for bringing me the books, and come again to see Tom. Yes, miss, said Bob moving on a few steps. Then, turning half round, he said, "'I'll leave off that trick with my big thumb, if you don't think well on me for it, miss. But it'd be a pity it would. I couldn't find another trick so good. And what'd be the use of having a big thumb?' "'It might as well have been narrow. Maggie, thus exalted into Bob's directing Madonna, laughed in spite of herself, at which her worshipper's blue eyes twinkled too, and under these favouring auspices he touched his cap and walked away. The days of chivalry are not gone, notwithstanding Burke's grand dirge over them. They live still in that far-off worship paid by many a youth and man to the woman of whom he never dreams that he shall touch so much as her little finger or the hem of her robe. Bob, with the pack on his back, had as respectful an adoration for this dark-eyed maiden as if he had been a knight in armour calling aloud on her name as he pricked on to the fight. That gleam of merriment soon died away from Maggie's face, and perhaps only made the returning gloom deeper by contrast. She was too dispirited even to like answering questions about Bob's present of books, and she carried them away to her bedroom, laying them down there, and seating herself on her one stool, without caring to look at them just yet. She leaned her cheek against the window-frame, and thought that the light-hearted Bob had a lot much happier than hers. Maggie's sense of loneliness and utter privation of joy had deepened with the brightness of advancing spring. 
all the favourite outdoor nooks about home, which seemed to have done their part with her parents in nurturing and cherishing her, were now mixed up with the home sadness, and gathered no smile from the sunshine. Every affection, every delight the poor child had had, was like an aching nerve to her. There was no music for her any more, no piano, no harmonised voices, no delicious stringed instruments, with their passionate cries of imprisoned spirits, sending a strange vibration through her frame. And of all her school life there was nothing left her now but her little collection of school books, which she turned over with a sickening sense that she knew them all, and they were all barren of comfort. Even at school she had often wished for books with more in them, Everything she learned there seemed like the ends of long threads that snapped immediately. And now, without the indirect charm of school emulation, Telemaque was mere bran, so were the hard, dry questions on Christian doctrine. There was no flavour in them, no strength. Sometimes Maggie thought she could have been contented with absorbing fancies, if she could have had all Scott's novels and all Byron's poems, then perhaps she might have found happiness enough to dull her sensibility to her actual daily life. And yet they were hardly what she wanted. She could make dream-worlds of her own, but no dream-world would satisfy her now. She wanted some explanation of this hard, real life, the unhappy-looking father, seated at the dull breakfast-table, the childish, bewildered mother, the little sordid tasks that filled the hours, or the more oppressive emptiness of weary, joyless leisure, the need of some tender demonstrative love, the cruel sense that Tom didn't mind what she thought or felt, and that they were no longer playfellows together the privation of all pleasant things that had come to her more than to others. She wanted some key that would enable her to understand, and, in understanding, endure the heavy weight that had fallen on her young heart. If she had been taught real learning and wisdom such as great men knew, she thought she should have held the secrets of life. If she had only books, that she might learn for herself what wise men knew. Saints and martyrs had never interested Maggie so much as sages and poets. She knew little of saints and martyrs, and had gathered, as a general result of her teaching, that they were a temporary provision against the spread of Catholicism, and had all died at Smithfield. In one of these meditations it occurred to her that she had forgotten Tom's school-books, which had been sent home in his trunk, but she found the stock unaccountably shrunk down to the few old ones which had been well thumbed, the Latin dictionary and grammar, a delectus, a torn Eutropius, the well-worn Virgil, Aldrich's logic, and the exasperating Euclid. Still, Latin, Euclid, and logic would surely be a considerable step in masculine wisdom, in that knowledge which made men contented and even glad to live. Not that the yearning for effectual wisdom was quite unmixed. A certain mirage would now and then rise on the desert of the future, in which she seemed to see herself honoured for her surprising attainments. And so the poor child, with her soul's hunger and her illusions of self-flattery, began to nibble at this thick-rinded fruit of the tree of knowledge, filling her vacant hours with Latin, geometry, and the forms of the syllogism, and feeling a gleam of triumph now and then, that her understanding was quite equal to these peculiarly masculine studies. For a week or two, she went on resolutely enough, though with an occasional sinking of heart, as if she had set out toward the promised land alone, and found it a thirsty, trackless, uncertain journey. 
In the severity of her early resolution, she would take Aldridge out into the fields, and then look off her book towards the sky, where the lark was twinkling, or to the reeds and bushes by the river, from which the waterfowl rustled forth on its anxious, awkward flight, with a startled sense that the relation between Aldrich and this living world was extremely remote for her. The discouragement deepened as the days went on, and the eager heart gained faster and faster on the patient mind. Somehow, when she sat at the window with her book, her eyes would fix themselves blankly on the outdoor sunshine. Then they would fill with tears, and sometimes, if her mother was not in the room, the studies would all end in sobbing. She rebelled against her lot. She fainted under its loneliness, and fits, even of anger and hatred, toward her father and mother, who were so unlike what she would have them to be, towards Tom, who checked her, and met her thought or feeling always by some thwarting difference, would flow out over her affections and conscience like a lava stream, and frighten her with a sense that it was not difficult for her to become a demon. Then her brain would be busy with wild romances of a flight from home in search of something less sordid and dreary. She would go to some great man, Walter Scott perhaps, and tell him how wretched and how clever she was, and he would surely do something for her. But in the middle of her vision her father would perhaps enter the room for the evening, and surprised that she sat still without noticing him, would say complainingly, "'Come, am I to fetch my slippers myself?' The voice pierced through Maggie like a sword. There was another sadness besides her own, and she had been thinking of turning her back on it and forsaking it. End of Part 1 of Chapter 2 of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Part Two of Chapter Three of Book Fourth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. A Voice from the Past Continued. This afternoon the sight of Bob's cheerful, freckled face had given her discontent a new direction. She thought it was part of the hardship of her life, that there was laid upon her the burden of larger wants than others seemed to feel, that she had to endure this wide, hopeless yearning for that something, whatever it was, that was greatest and best on this earth. She wished she could have been like Bob, with his easily satisfied ignorance, or like Tom, who had something to do on which he could fix his mind with a steady purpose, and disregard everything else. Poor child! As she leaned her head against the window-frame, with her hands clasped tighter and tighter, and her foot beating the ground, she was as lonely in her trouble as if she had been the only girl in the civilised world of that day, who had come out of her school life with a soul untrained for inevitable struggles, with no other part of her inherited share in the hard-won treasures of thought which generations of painful toil have laid up for the race of men, than shreds and patches of feeble literature and false history. With much futile information about Saxon and other kings of doubtful example, but unhappily quite without that knowledge of the irreversible laws within and without her, which, governing the habits, becomes morality, and developing the feelings of submission and dependence, becomes religion, as lonely in her trouble, as if every other girl besides herself had been cherished and watched over by elder minds, 
not forgetful of their own early time when need was keen and impulse strong. At last Maggie's eyes glanced down on the books that lay on the window-shelf, and she half forsook her reverie to turn over listlessly the leaves of the portrait gallery, but she soon pushed this aside to examine the little row of books tied together with string. Beauties of the Spectator, Rasselas, Economy of Human Life, Gregory's Letters, she knew the sort of matter that was inside all these. The Christian Year. That seemed to be a hymn-book, and she laid it down again. But Thomas a Kempis? The name had come across her in her reading, and she felt the satisfaction, which every one knows, of getting some ideas to attach to a name that strays solitary in the memory. She took up the little old clumsy book with some curiosity. It had the corners turned down in many places, and some hand, now forever quiet, had made at certain passages strong pen and ink marks, long since browned by time. Maggie turned from leaf to leaf, and read where the quiet hand pointed. "'Know that the love of thyself doth hurt thee more than anything in the world.' If thou seekest this or that, and wouldst be here or there to enjoy thy own will and pleasure, thou shalt never be quiet nor free from care, for in everything somewhat will be wanting, and in every place there will be some that will cross thee, both above and below, which way soever thou dost turn thee, everywhere thou shalt find the cross, and everywhere of necessity thou must have patience if thou wilt have inward peace, and enjoy an everlasting crown. If thou desire to mount unto this height, thou must set out courageously, and lay the axe to the root, that thou mayst pluck up and destroy that hidden, inordinate inclination to thyself, and unto all private and earthly good. On this sin, that a man inordinately loveth himself, almost all dependeth, whatsoever is thoroughly to be overcome. Which evil being once overcome and subdued, there will presently ensue great peace and tranquillity. It is but little thou sufferest in comparison of them that have suffered so much, were so strongly tempted, so grievously afflicted, so many ways tried and exercised. Thou oughtest therefore to call to mind the more heavy sufferings of others, that thou mayest the easier bear thy little adversities. And if they seem not little unto thee, beware lest thy impatience be the cause thereof. Blessed are those ears that receive the whispers of the divine voice, and listen not to the whisperings of the world. Blessed are those ears which hearken not unto the voice which soundeth outwardly, but unto the truth which teacheth inwardly. A strange thrill of awe passed through Maggie while she read, as if she had been wakened in the night by a strain of solemn music, telling of beings whose souls had been astir while hers was in stupor. She went on from one brown mark to another, where the quiet hand seemed to point, hardly conscious that she was reading, seeming rather to listen, while a low voice said, "'Why dost thou here gaze about, since this is not the place of thy rest? In heaven ought to be thy dwelling, and all earthly things are to be looked on as they forward thy journey thither. All things pass away, and thou together with them. Beware thou cleave not unto them, lest thou be entangled and perish. If a man should give all his substance, yet it is as nothing. And if he should do great penances, yet are they but little. And if he should attain to all knowledge, he is yet far off. And if he should be of great virtue, and very fervent devotion, yet there is much wanting, to wit one thing which is most necessary for him, what is that? 
that having left all, he leave himself, and go wholly out of himself, and retain nothing of self-love. I have often said unto thee, and now again I say the same, Forsake thyself, resign thyself, and thou shalt enjoy much inward peace. Then shall all vain imaginations, evil perturbations, and superfluous cares fly away. Then shall immoderate fear leave thee, and inordinate love shall die. Maggie drew a long breath, and pushed her heavy hair back as if to see a sudden vision more clearly. Here, then, was a secret of life that would enable her to renounce all other secrets. Here was a sublime height to be reached without the help of outward things. Here was insight and strength and conquest to be won by means entirely within her own soul, where a supreme teacher was waiting to be heard. It flashed through her like the suddenly apprehended solution of a problem that all the miseries of her young life had come from fixing her heart on her own pleasure, as if that were the central necessity of the universe. And for the first time she saw the possibility of shifting the position from which she looked at the gratification of her own desires, of taking her stand out of herself, and looking at her own life as an insignificant part of a divinely guided whole. She read on and on in the old book, devouring eagerly the dialogues with the invisible teacher, the pattern of sorrow, the source of all strength. Returning to it after she had been called away, and reading till the sun went down behind the willows, with all the hurry of an imagination that could never rest in the present, she sat in the deepening twilight, forming plans of self-humiliation and entire devotedness, and in the ardour of first discovery, renunciation seemed to her the entrance into that satisfaction which she had so long been craving in vain. She had not perceived, how could she until she had lived longer, the inmost truth of the old monk's outpourings, that renunciation remains sorrow, though a sorrow born willingly. Maggie was still panting for happiness, and was in ecstasy, because she had found the key to it. She knew nothing of doctrines and systems, of mysticism or quietism, but this voice, out of the far-off Middle Ages, was the direct communication of a human soul's belief and experience, and came to Maggie as an unquestioned message. I suppose that is the reason why the small, old-fashioned book, for which you need pay only sixpence at a bookstall, works miracles to this day, turning bitter waters into sweetness, while expensive sermons and treatises newly issued leave all things as they were before. It was written down by a hand, that waited for the heart's prompting. It is the chronicle of a solitary, hidden anguish, struggle, trust, and triumph, not written on velvet cushions to teach endurance to those who are treading with bleeding feet on the stones. And so it remains to all time a lasting record of human needs and human consolations. The voice of a brother who ages ago felt and suffered and renounced, in the cloister perhaps, with serge gown and tonsured head, with much chanting and long fasts, and with a fashion of speech different from ours, but under the same silent far-off heavens, and with the same passionate desires, the same strivings, the same failures, the same weariness. In writing the history of unfashionable families, one is apt to fall into a tone of emphasis which is very far from being the tone of good society, where principles and beliefs are not only of an extremely moderate kind, but are always presupposed, 
no subject being eligible but such as can be touched with a light and graceful irony. But then, good society has its claret, and its velvet carpets, its dinner engagements six weeks deep, its opera, and its fairy ballrooms. Rides off its ennui on thoroughbred horses, lounges at the club, has to keep clear of crinoline vortices, gets its science done by Faraday, and its religion by the superior clergy, who are to be met in the best houses. How should it have time or need for belief and emphasis? But good society, floated on gossamer wings of light irony, is a very expensive production, requiring nothing less than a wide and arduous national life condensed in unfragrant deafening factories, cramping itself in mines, sweating at furnaces, grinding, hammering, weaving under more or less oppression of carbonic acid, or else spread over sheep walks and scattered in lonely houses and huts on the clayey or chalky cornlands where the rainy days look dreary. This wide national life is based entirely on emphasis, the emphasis of want which urges it into all the activities necessary for the maintenance of good society and light irony. It spends its heavy years often in a chill, uncarpeted fashion, amidst family discord unsoftened by long corridors. Under such circumstances there are many among its myriads of souls who have absolutely needed an emphatic belief. Life in this unpleasurable shape, demanding some solution even to unspeculative minds. Just as you inquire into the stuffing of your couch when anything galls you there, whereas Eiderdown and perfect French springs excite no question. Some have an emphatic belief in alcohol, and seek their ecstasis or outside standing ground in gin. But the rest require something that good society calls enthusiasm, something that will present motives in an entire absence of high prizes, something that will give patience and feed human love when the limbs ache with weariness and human looks are hard upon us, something clearly that lies outside personal desires, that includes resignation for ourselves and active love for what is not ourselves. Now and then that sort of enthusiasm finds a far-echoing voice that comes from an experience springing out of the deepest need. And it was by being brought within the long lingering vibrations of such a voice that Maggie, with her girl's face and unnoted sorrows, found an effort and a hope that helped her through years of loneliness, making out a faith for herself, without the aid of established authorities and appointed guides, for they were not at hand, and her need was pressing. From what you know of her, you will not be surprised that she threw some exaggeration and willfulness, some pride and impetuosity, even into her self-renunciation. Her own life was still a drama for her, in which she demanded of herself that her part should be played with intensity. And so it came to pass that she often lost the spirit of humility by being excessive in the outward act. She often strove after too high a flight, and came down with her poor little half-fledged wings dabbled in the mud. For example, she not only determined to work at plain sewing that she might contribute something towards the fund in the tin box, but she went in the first instance, in her zeal of self-mortification, to ask for it at a linen shop in St. Ogg's, instead of getting it in a more quiet and indirect way, and could see nothing but what was entirely wrong and unkind, nay persecuting, in Tom's reproof of her for this unnecessary act. "'I don't like my sister to do such things,' said Tom. "'I'll take care that the debts are paid without your lowering yourself in that way.' Surely there was some tenderness and bravery mingled with the worldliness and self-assertion of that little speech. 
but Maggie held it as dross, overlooking the grains of gold, and took Tom's rebuke as one of her outward crosses. Tom was very hard to her, she used to think, in her long night watchings, to her who had always loved him so. And then she strove to be contented with that hardness, and to require nothing. That is the path we all like, when we set out on our abandonment of egoism, the path of martyrdom and endurance, where the palm branches grow, rather than the steep highway of tolerance, just allowance, and self-blame, where there are no leafy honours to be gathered and worn. The old books, Virgil, Euclid, and Aldrich, that wrinkled fruit of the tree of knowledge, had been all laid by, for Maggie had turned her back on the vain ambition to share the thoughts of the wise. In her first ardour she flung away the books with a sort of triumph that she had risen above the need of them, and if they had been her own she would have burned them, believing that she would never repent. She read so eagerly and constantly in her three books, the Bible, Thomas a Kempis, and the Christian Year, no longer rejected as a hymn-book, that they filled her mind with a continual stream of rhythmic memories, and she was too ardently learning to see all nature and life in the light of her new faith, to need any other material for her mind to work on, as she sat with her well-plied needle, making shirts and other complicated stitchings, falsely called plain, by no means plain to Maggie, since wristband and sleeve and the like had a capability of being sewed in wrong side outwards in moments of mental wandering. Hanging diligently over her sewing, Maggie was a sight any one might have been pleased to look at. That new inward life of hers, notwithstanding some volcanic upheavings of imprisoned passions, yet shone out in her face with a tender, soft light that mingled itself as added loveliness with the gradually enriched colour and outline of her blossoming youth. Her mother felt the change in her with a sort of puzzled wonder that Maggie should be growing up so good. It was amazing that this once contrary child was become so submissive, so backward to assert her own will. Maggie used to look up from her work and find her mother's eyes fixed upon her. They were watching and waiting for the large young glance, as if her elder frame got some needful warmth from it. The mother was getting fond of her tall brown girl, the only bit of furniture now on which she could bestow her anxiety and pride. And Maggie, in spite of her own ascetic wish to have no personal adornment, was obliged to give way to her mother about her hair, and submit to have the abundant black locks plaited into a coronet on the summit of her head, after the pitiable fashion of those antiquated times. "'Let your mother have that bit of pleasure, my dear,' said Mrs. Tulliver. "'I'd trouble enough with your hair once.' So Maggie, glad of anything that would soothe her mother, and cheer their long day together, consented to the vain decoration, and showed a queenly head above her old frocks, steadily refusing, however, to look at herself in the glass. Mrs. Tulliver liked to call the father's attention to Maggie's hair, and other unexpected virtues, but he had a brusque reply to give. "'I knew well enough what she'd be before now. It's nothing new to me.' "'But it's a pity she isn't made of commoner stuff. "'She'll be thrown away, I doubt. "'There'll be nobody to marry her as is fit for her.' "'And Maggie's graces of mind and body fed his gloom. "'He sat patiently enough while she read him a chapter, "'or said something timidly when they were alone together "'about trouble being turned into a blessing. "'He took it all as part of his daughter's goodness.' which made his misfortunes the sadder to him, because they damaged her chance in life. 
in a mind charged with an eager purpose and an unsatisfied vindictiveness, there is no room for new feelings. Mr. Tulliver did not want spiritual consolation. He wanted to shake off the degradation of debt, and to have his revenge. End of chapter 3 of Book 4 End of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter One of Book Fifth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Book Fifth Wheat and Tares. Chapter One In the Red Deeps. The family sitting room was a long room with a window at each end one looking towards the croft and along the ripple to the banks of the floss, the other into the mill-yard. Maggie was sitting with her work against the latter window when she saw Mr. Wakeham entering the yard, as usual, on his fine black horse, but not alone, as usual. Someone was with him, a figure in a cloak on a handsome pony, Maggie had hardly time to feel that it was Philip come back before they were in front of the window, and he was raising his hat to her, while his father, catching the movement by a side glance, looked sharply round at them both. Maggie hurried away from the window and carried her work upstairs, for Mr. Wakeham sometimes came in and inspected the books, and Maggie felt that the meeting with Philip would be robbed of all pleasure in the presence of the two fathers. Some day, perhaps, she should see him when they could just shake hands, and she could tell him that she remembered his goodness to Tom, and the things he had said to her in the old days, though they could never be friends any more. It was not at all agitating to Maggie to see Philip again. She retained her childish gratitude and pity towards him, and remembered his cleverness, and, in the early weeks of her loneliness, she had continually recalled the image of him among the people who had been kind to her in life, often wishing she had him for a brother and a teacher, as they had fancied it might have been in their talk together. But that sort of wishing had been banished, along with other dreams that savoured of seeking her own will, and she thought, besides, that Philip might be altered by his life abroad. He might have become worldly, and really not care about her saying anything to him now. And yet his face was wonderfully little altered. It was only a larger, more manly copy of the pale, small-featured boy's face, with the grey eyes and the boyish waving brown hair. There was the old deformity to awaken the old pity, and after all her meditations Maggie felt that she really should like to say a few words to him. He might still be melancholy as he always used to be, and like her to look at him kindly. She wondered if he remembered how he used to like her eyes. With that thought Maggie glanced towards the square looking-glass which was condemned to hang with its face towards the wall, and she half started from her seat to reach it down. But she checked herself, and snatched up her work, trying to repress the rising wishes by forcing her memory to recall snatches of hymns, until she saw Philip and his father returning along the road, and she could go down again. It was far on in June now, and Maggie was inclined to lengthen the daily walk which was her one indulgence. But this day and the following she was so busy with work which must be finished that she never went beyond the gate, and satisfied her need of the open air by sitting out of doors. One of her frequent walks, when she was not obliged to go to St. Ogg's, was to a spot that lay beyond what was called the hill, 
an insignificant rise of ground crowned by trees, lying along the side of the road which ran by the gates of Dalcott Mill. Insignificant, I call it, because in height it was hardly more than a bank. But there may come moments when nature makes a mere bank a means towards a fateful result, and that is why I ask you to imagine this high bank crowned with trees, making an uneven wall for some quarter of a mile along the left side of Dalcott Mill, and the pleasant fields behind it, bounded by the murmuring ripple. Just where this line of bank sloped down again to the level, a by-road turned off and led to the other side of the rise, where it was broken into very capricious hollows and mounds by the working of an exhausted stone quarry, so long exhausted that both mounds and hollows were now clothed with brambles and trees, and here and there by a stretch of grass which a few sheep kept close nibbled. In her childish days Maggie held this place, called the Red Deeps, in very great awe, and needed all her confidence in Tom's bravery to reconcile her to an excursion thither. Visions of robbers and fierce animals haunting every hollow. But now it had the charm for her, which any broken ground, any mimic rock and ravine, have for the eyes that rest habitually on the level, especially in summer, when she could sit on a grassy hollow under the shadow of a branching ash, stooping aslant from the steep above her, and listen to the hum of insects, like tiniest bells on the garment of silence, or see the sunlight piercing the distant boughs, as if to chase and drive home the truant heavenly blue of the wild hyacinths. In this June time, too, the dog-roses were in their glory. And that was an additional reason why Maggie should direct her walk to the Red Deeps, rather than to any other spot, on the first day she was free to wander at her will, a pleasure she loved so well that sometimes, in her ardours of renunciation, she thought she ought to deny herself the frequent indulgence in it. You may see her now as she walks down the favourite turning, and enters the deeps by a narrow path through a group of Scotch firs. Her tall figure and old lavender gown visible through an hereditary black silk shawl of some wide-meshed net-like material. And now she is sure of being unseen, she takes off her bonnet and ties it over her arm. One would certainly suppose her to be farther on in life than her seventeenth year, perhaps because of the slow, resigned sadness of the glance, from which all search and unrest seem to have departed. Perhaps because her broad-chested figure has the mould of early womanhood. Youth and health have withstood well the involuntary and voluntary hardships of her lot, and the nights in which she has lain on the hard floor for a penance have left no obvious trace. The eyes are liquid, the brown cheek is firm and rounded, the full lips are red with her dark colouring and jet crown surmounting her tall figure, she seems to have a sort of kinship with the grand Scotch firs, at which she is looking up as if she loved them well. Yet one has a sense of uneasiness in looking at her, a sense of opposing elements, of which a fierce collision is imminent. Surely there is a hushed expression, such as one often sees in older faces under borderless caps, out of keeping with the resistant youth, which one expects to flash out in a sudden passionate glance that will dissipate all the quietude, like a damped fire leaping out again when all seemed safe. But Maggie herself was not uneasy at this moment. She was calmly enjoying the free air, while she looked up at the old fir-trees, and thought that those broken ends of branches were the records of past storms, which had only made the red stems soar higher. But while her eyes were still turned upward, 
she became conscious of a moving shadow cast by the evening sun on the grassy path before her, and looked down with a startled gesture to see Philip Wakeham, who first raised his hat, and then, blushing deeply, came forward to her and put out his hand. Maggie, too, coloured with surprise, which soon gave way to pleasure. She put out her hand and looked down at the deformed figure before her with frank eyes, filled for the moment with nothing but the memory of her child's feelings, a memory that was always strong in her. She was the first to speak. "'You startled me,' she said, smiling faintly. "'I never meet anyone here. How came you to be walking here? Did you come to meet me?' It was impossible not to perceive that Maggie felt herself a child again. "'Yes, I did,' said Philip, still embarrassed. "'I wished to see you very much. I watched a long while yesterday on the bank near your house to see if you would come out, but you never came. Then I watched again to-day, and when I saw the way you took, I kept you in sight and came down the bank behind there.' I hope you will not be displeased with me. No, said Maggie, with simple seriousness, walking on as if she meant Philip to accompany her. I am very glad you came, for I wished very much to have an opportunity of speaking to you. I have never forgotten how good you were long ago to Tom, and me too. But I was not sure that you would remember us so well. Tom and I have had a great deal of trouble since then, and I think that makes one think more of what happened before the trouble came. "'I can't believe that you have thought of me so much as I have thought of you,' said Philip timidly. "'Do you know, when I was away, I made a picture of you as you looked that morning in the study, when you said you would not forget me?' Philip drew a large miniature case from his pocket and opened it. Maggie saw her old self leaning on a table, with her black locks hanging down behind her ears, looking into space with strange dreamy eyes. It was a water-colour sketch of real merit as a portrait. "'Oh, dear!' said Maggie, smiling and flushed with pleasure. "'What a queer little girl I was!' I remember myself with my hair in that way, in that pink frock. I really was like a gypsy. I dare say I am now," she added after a little pause. Am I like what you expected me to be? The words might have been those of a coquette, but the full bright glance Maggie turned on Philip was not that of a coquette. She really did hope he liked her face as it was now but it was simply the rising again of her innate delight in admiration and love. Philip met her eyes and looked at her in silence for a long moment before he said quietly, "'No, Maggie.' The light died out a little from Maggie's face, and there was a slight trembling of the lip. Her eyelids fell lower, but she did not turn away her head, and Philip continued to look at her. Then he said, slowly, "'You are very much more beautiful than I thought you would be.' "'Am I?' said Maggie, the pleasure returning in a deeper flush. She turned her face away from him and took some steps, looking straight before her in silence, as if she were adjusting her consciousness to this new idea." Girls are so accustomed to think of dress as the main ground of vanity, that in abstaining from the looking-glass Maggie had thought more of abandoning all care for adornment than of renouncing the contemplation of her face. Comparing herself with elegant, wealthy young ladies, it had not occurred to her that she could produce any effect with her person. Philip seemed to like the silence well. He walked by her side, watching her face as if that sight left no room for any other wish. They had passed from among the fir-trees, and had now come to
to a green hollow almost surrounded by an amphitheatre of the pale pink dog-roses. But as the light about them had brightened, Maggie's face had lost its glow. She stood still when they were in the hollows, and looking at Philip again, she said, in a serious, sad voice, "'I wish we could have been friends. I mean, if it would have been good and right for us. But that is the trial I have to bear in everything. I may not keep anything I used to love when I was little. The old books went, and Tom is different, and my father. It is like death. I must part with everything I cared for when I was a child. And I must part with you. We must never take any notice of each other again. That is what I wanted to speak to you for. I wanted to let you know that Tom and I can't do as we like about such things, and that if I behave as if I had forgotten all about you, it is not out of envy or pride or, or any bad feeling. Maggie spoke with more and more sorrowful gentleness as she went on, and her eyes began to fill with tears. The deepening expression of pain on Philip's face gave him a stronger resemblance to his boyish self, and made the deformity appeal more strongly to her pity. "'I know. I see all that you mean,' he said in a voice that had become feebler from discouragement. "'I know what there is to keep us apart on both sides. But it is not right, Maggie. Don't you be angry with me. I am so used to call you Maggie in my thoughts. It is not right to sacrifice everything to other people's unreasonable feelings. I would give up a great deal for my father, but I would not give up a friendship, or, or an attachment of any sort, in obedience to any wish of his that I didn't recognise as right. "'I don't know,' said Maggie musingly. "'Often, when I have been angry and discontented, it has seemed to me that I was not bound to give up anything, and I have gone on thinking till it has seemed to me that I could think away all my duty. But no good has ever come of that. It was an evil state of mind. I'm quite sure that whatever I might do, I should wish in the end that I had gone without anything for myself, rather than have made my father's life harder to him. "'But would it make his life harder if we were to see each other sometimes?' said Philip. He was going to say something else, but checked himself. "'Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like it. Don't ask me why, or anything about it,' said Maggie in a distressed tone. "'My father feels so strongly about some things. He is not at all happy.' "'No more am I,' said Philip impetuously. "'I am not happy.' "'Why?' said Maggie gently. "'At least I ought not to ask, but I'm very, very sorry.' Philip turned to walk on, as if he had not patience to stand still any longer, and they went out of the hollow, winding amongst the trees and bushes in silence. After that last word of Philip's, Maggie could not bear to insist immediately on their parting. "'I've been a great deal happier,' she said at last, timidly, "'since I have given up thinking about what is easy and pleasant, and being discontented because I couldn't have my own will. Our life is determined for us, and it makes the mind very free when we give up wishing and only think of bearing what is laid upon us, and doing what is given us to do. "'But I can't give up wishing,' said Philip impatiently. "'It seems to me we can never give up longing and wishing while we are thoroughly alive. There are certain things we feel to be beautiful and good, and we must hunger after them. How can we ever be satisfied without them until our feelings are deadened?' I delight in fine pictures. I long to be able to paint such. 
I strive and strive, and can't produce what I want. That is pain to me, and always will be pain, until my faculties lose their keenness, like aged eyes. Then there are many other things I long for. Here Philip hesitated a little, and then said, "'Things that other men have, and that will always be denied me. My life will have nothing great or beautiful in it. I would rather not have lived.' "'Oh, Philip,' said Maggie, "'I wish you didn't feel so.' But her heart began to beat with something of Philip's discontent. "'Well, then,' said he, turning quickly round and fixing his grey eyes entreatingly in her face, "'I should be contented to live if you would let me see you sometimes.' Then, checked by a fear which her face suggested, he looked away again and said more calmly, "'I have no friend to whom I can tell everything, no one who cares enough about me, and if I could only see you now and then, and you would let me talk to you a little, and show me that you cared for me, and that we may always be friends in heart, and help each other, then I might come to be glad of life.' "'But how can I see you, Philip?' said Maggie falteringly. "'Could she really do him good? "'It would be very hard to say good-bye this day "'and not speak to him again. "'Here was a new interest to vary the days. "'It was so much easier to renounce the interest before it came. "'If you would let me see you here sometimes, "'walk with you here, I would be contented if it were only once or twice in a month. That could injure no one's happiness, and it would sweeten my life. Besides, Philip went on, with all the inventive astuteness of love at one and twenty, if there is any enmity between those who belong to us, we ought all the more to try and quench it by our friendship. I mean that by our influence on both sides— we might bring about a healing of the wounds that have been made in the past, if I could know everything about them. And I don't believe there is any enmity in my own father's mind. I think he has proved the contrary. Maggie shook her head slowly and was silent under conflicting thoughts. It seemed to her inclination that to see Philip now and then, and keep up the bond of friendship with him, was something not only innocent, but good. Perhaps she might really help him to find contentment, as she had found it. The voice that said this made sweet music to Maggie, but athwart it there came an urgent, monotonous warning from another voice which she had been learning to obey, the warning that such interviews implied secrecy, implied doing something she would dread to be discovered in, something that, if discovered, must cause anger and pain, and that the admission of anything so near doubleness would act as a spiritual blight. Yet the music would swell out again like chimes borne onward by a recurrent breeze, persuading her that the wrong lay all in the faults and weaknesses of others and that there was such a thing as futile sacrifice for one to the injury of another. It was very cruel for Philip that he should be shrunk from, because of an unjustifiable vindictiveness towards his father. Poor Philip, whom some people would shrink from only because he was deformed. The idea that he might become her lover, or that her meeting him could cause disapproval in that light, had not occurred to her, and Philip saw the absence of this idea clearly enough, saw it with a certain pang, although it made her consent to his request the less unlikely. There was bitterness to him in the perception that Maggie was almost as frank and unconstrained towards him as when she was a child. "'I can't say either yes or no,' she said at last, turning round and walking towards the way she had come. "'I must wait. 
lest I should decide wrongly. I must seek for guidance. May I come again, then, to-morrow, or the next day, or next week? I think I had better write, said Maggie, faltering again. I have to go to St. Ogg's sometimes, and I can put the letter in the post. Oh, no, said Philip eagerly, that would not be so well. My father might see the letter, and he has not any enmity, I believe, but he views things differently from me. He thinks a great deal about wealth and position. Pray let me come here once more. Tell me when it shall be, or if you can't tell me, I will come as often as I can, till I do see you. I think it must be so, then, said Maggie, for I can't be quite certain of coming here any particular evening. Maggie felt a great relief in adjourning the decision. She was free now to enjoy the minutes of companionship. She almost thought she might linger a little. The next time they met she should have to pain Philip by telling him her determination. "'I can't help thinking,' she said, looking smilingly at him after a few moments of silence, "'how strange it is that we should have met and talked to each other just as if it had been only yesterday when we parted at Lawton, and yet we must both be very much altered in those five years. I think it is five years.' How was it you seemed to have a sort of feeling that I was the same Maggie? I was not quite so sure that you would be the same. I know you are so clever, and you must have seen and learned so much to fill your mind. I was not quite sure you would care about me now. I have never had any doubt that you would be the same whenever I might see you, said Philip. I mean— the same in everything that made me like you better than any one else. I don't want to explain that. I don't think any of the strongest effects our natures are susceptible of can ever be explained. We can neither detect the process by which they are arrived at, nor the mode in which they act on us. The greatest of painters only once painted a mysteriously divine child. He couldn't have told how he did it, and we can't tell why we feel it to be divine. I think there are stores laid up in our human nature that our understandings can make no complete inventory of. Certain strains of music affect me so strangely. I can never hear them without their changing my whole attitude of mind for a time, and if the effect would last, I might be capable of heroisms." "'Ah, I know what you mean about music. I feel so,' said Maggie, clasping her hands with her old impetuosity. "'At least,' she added, in a saddened tone, "'I used to feel so when I had any music. I never have any now except the organ at church.' "'And you long for it, Maggie?' said Philip, looking at her with affectionate pity. "'Ah, you can have very little that is beautiful in your life.' "'Have you many books? You were so fond of them when you were a little girl.' They were come back to the hollow round which the dog-roses grew, and they both paused under the charm of the fairy evening light, reflected from the pale pink clusters. "'No, I have given up books,' said Maggie quietly, "'except a very, very few.' Philip had already taken from his pocket a small volume, and was looking at the back, as he said, "'Ah, this is the second volume, I see, as you might have liked to take it home with you. I put it in my pocket, because I am studying a scene for a picture.' Maggie had looked at the back, too, and saw the title. It revived an old impression with overmastering force. "'The Pirate!' she said taking the book from Philip's hands. Oh, I began that once. I read to where Minna is walking with Cleveland, and I could never get to read the rest. I went on with it in my own head, 
and I made several endings, but they were all unhappy. I could never make a happy ending out of that beginning. Poor Minna! I wonder what is the real end. For a long while I couldn't get my mind away from the Shetland Isles. I used to feel the wind blowing on me from the rough sea. Maggie spoke rapidly with glistening eyes. "'Take that volume home with you, Maggie,' said Philip, watching her with delight. "'I don't want it now. I shall make a picture of you instead. You among the Scotch firs and the slanting shadows.' Maggie had not heard a word he had said. She was absorbed in a page at which she had opened. But suddenly she closed the book and gave it back to Philip, shaking her head with a backward movement as if to say, avaunt to floating visions. "'Do keep it, Maggie,' said Philip entreatingly. "'It will give you pleasure.' "'No, thank you,' said Maggie, putting it aside with her hand and walking on. It would make me in love with this world again, as I used to be. It would make me long to see and know many things. It would make me long for a full life. But you will not always be shut up in your present lot. Why should you starve your mind in that way? It is narrow asceticism. I don't like to see you persisting in it, Maggie. Poetry and art and knowledge are sacred and pure. But not for me, not for me, said Maggie, walking more hurriedly, because I should want too much. I must wait. This life will not last long. Don't hurry away from me without saying good-bye, Maggie, said Philip, as they reached the group of Scotch firs, and she continued still to walk along without speaking. I must not go any farther, I think, must I? Oh, no, I forgot. Good-bye, said Maggie, pausing, and putting out her hand to him. The action brought her feeling back in a strong current to Philip, and after they had stood looking at each other in silence for a few moments, with their hands clasped, she said, withdrawing her hand, I'm very grateful to you for thinking of me all those years. It is very sweet to have people love us. What a wonderful, beautiful thing it seems that God should have made your heart so that you could care about a queer little girl whom you only knew for a few weeks. I remember saying to you that I thought you cared for me more than Tom did. Ah, Maggie, said Philip, almost fretfully, you would never love me so well as you love your brother. Perhaps not, said Maggie simply, but then, you know, the first thing I ever remember in my life is standing with Tom by the side of the floss while he held my hand. Everything before that is dark to me, but I shall never forget you, though we must keep apart. Don't say so, Maggie, said Philip. If I kept that little girl in my mind for five years, didn't I earn some part in her? She ought not to take herself quite away from me. Not if I were free, said Maggie, but I am not. I must submit. She hesitated a moment and then added, And I wanted to say to you that you had better not take more notice of my brother than just bowing to him. He once told me not to speak to you again, and he doesn't change his mind. Oh, dear, the sun is set. I'm too long away. Good-bye. She gave him her hand once more. I shall come here as often as I can till I see you again, Maggie. Have some feeling for me as well as for others. Yes, yes, I have, said Maggie, hurrying away and quickly disappearing behind the last fir tree though Philip's gaze after her remained immovable for minutes, as if he saw her still. Maggie went home, with an inward conflict already begun. Philip went home to do nothing but remember and hope. You can hardly help blaming him severely. 
He was four or five years older than Maggie, and had a full consciousness of his feeling towards her to aid him in foreseeing the character his contemplated interviews with her would bear in the opinion of a third person. But you must not suppose that he was capable of a gross selfishness, or that he could have been satisfied without persuading himself that he was seeking to infuse some happiness into Maggie's life, seeking this even more than any direct ends for himself. He could give her sympathy, he could give her help. There was not the slightest promise of love towards him in her manner. It was nothing more than the sweet girlish tenderness she had shown him when she was twelve. Perhaps she would never love him. Perhaps no woman ever could love him. Well, then, he would endure that. He should at least have the happiness of seeing her, of feeling some nearness to her. And he clutched passionately the possibility that she might love him. Perhaps the feeling would grow if she could come to associate him with that watchful tenderness which her nature would be so keenly alive to. If any woman could love him, surely Maggie was that woman. There was such wealth of love in her, and there was no one to claim it all. Then the pity of it that a mind like hers should be withering in its very youth like a young forest tree for want of the light and space it was formed to flourish in. Could he not hinder that by persuading her out of her system of privation? He would be her guardian angel. He would do anything, bear anything for her sake, except not seeing her. End of chapter 1 of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Two, Part One of Book Fifth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Aunt Glegg learns the breadth of Bob's thumb. While Maggie's life struggles had lain almost entirely within her own soul, one shadowy army fighting another and the slain shadows forever rising again, Tom was engaged in a dustier, noisier warfare, grappling with more substantial obstacles, and gaining more definite conquests. So it has been since the days of Hecuba, and of Hector, tamer of horses. Inside the gates, the women with streaming hair, and uplifted hands, offering prayers, watching the world's combat from afar, filling their long empty days with memories and fears. Outside, the men, in fierce struggle with things divine and human, quenching memory in the stronger light of purpose, losing the sense of dread, and even of wounds, in the hurrying ardour of action. From what you have seen of Tom, I think he is not a youth, of whom you would prophesy failure in anything he had thoroughly wished. The wagers are likely to be on his side, notwithstanding his small success in the classics. For Tom had never desired success in this field of enterprise, and forgetting a fine, flourishing growth of stupidity, there is nothing like pouring out on a mind a good amount of subjects in which it feels no interest. But now Tom's strong will bound together his integrity, his pride, his family regrets, and his personal ambition, and made them one force, concentrating his efforts and surmounting discouragements. His uncle Dean, who watched him closely, soon began to conceive hopes of him, and to be rather proud that he had brought into the employment of the firm a nephew who appeared to be made of such good commercial stuff. The real kindness 
of placing him in the warehouse first was soon evident to Tom, in the hints his uncle began to throw out, that after a time he might perhaps be trusted to travel at certain seasons, and buy in for the firm various vulgar commodities with which I need not shock refined ears in this place. And it was doubtless with a view to this result that Mr. Dean, when he expected to take his wine alone, would tell Tom to step in and sit with him an hour, and would pass that hour in much lecturing and catechising concerning articles of export and import, with an occasional excursus of more indirect utility on the relative advantages to the merchants of St. Ogg's of having goods brought in their own and in foreign bottoms, a subject on which Mr. Dean, as a shipowner, naturally threw off a few sparks when he got warmed with talk and wine. Already in the second year Tom's salary was raised, but all, except the price of his dinner and clothes, went home into the tin box, and he shunned comradeship lest it should lead him into expenses in spite of himself. Not that Tom was moulded on the spoony type of the industrious apprentice. He had a very strong appetite for pleasure, would have liked to be a tamer of horses, and to make a distinguished figure in all neighbouring eyes, dispensing treats and benefits to others with well-judged liberality, and being pronounced one of the finest young fellows of those parts. Nay, he determined— to achieve these things sooner or later, but his practical shrewdness told him that the means to such achievements could only lie, for him, in present abstinence and self-denial. There were certain milestones to be passed, and one of the first was the payment of his father's debts. Having made up his mind on that point, he strode along without swerving, contracting some rather saturnine sternness, as a young man is likely to do who has a premature call upon him for self-reliance. Tom felt intensely that common cause with his father which springs from family pride, and was bent on being irreproachable as a son. But his growing experience caused him to pass much silent criticism on the rashness and imprudence of his father's past conduct. Their dispositions were not in sympathy, and Tom's face showed little radiance during his few home hours. Maggie had an awe of him, against which she struggled as something unfair to her consciousness of wider thoughts and deeper motives. But it was of no use to struggle. A character at unity with itself that performs what it intends, subdues every counteracting impulse, and has no visions beyond the distinctly possible, is strong by its very negations. You may imagine that Tom's more and more obvious unlikeness to his father was well fitted to conciliate the maternal aunts and uncles, and Mr. Dean's favourable reports and predictions to Mr. Glegg concerning Tom's qualifications for business, began to be discussed amongst them with various acceptance. He was likely, it appeared, to do the family credit without causing it any expense and trouble. Mrs. Pullet had always thought it strange if Tom's excellent complexion, so entirely that of the Dodsons, did not argue a certainty that he would turn out well his juvenile errors of running down the peacock, and general disrespect to his aunts, only indicating a tinge of Tulliver blood, which he had doubtless outgrown. Mr. Glegg, who had contracted a cautious liking for Tom ever since his spirited and sensible behaviour when the execution was in the house, was now warming into a resolution to further his prospects actively some time when an opportunity offered of doing so in a prudent manner, without ultimate loss. But Mrs. Glegg observed that she was not given to speak without book, as some people were, that those who said least 
were most likely to find their words made good, and that when the right moment came, it would be seen who could do something better than talk. Uncle Pullet, after silent meditation for a period of several lozenges, came distinctly to the conclusion that when a young man was likely to do well, it was better not to meddle with him. Tom, meanwhile, had shown no disposition to rely on any one but himself, though with a natural sensitiveness towards all indications of favourable opinion. He was glad to see his uncle Glegg look in on him sometimes, in a friendly way, during business hours, and glad to be invited to dine at his house, though he usually preferred declining, on the ground that he was not sure of being punctual. But about a year ago something had occurred which induced Tom to test his uncle Glegg's friendly disposition. Bob Jakin, who rarely returned from one of his rounds without seeing Tom and Maggie, awaited him on the bridge as he was coming home from St. Ogg's one evening, that they might have a little private talk. He took the liberty of asking if Mr. Tom had ever thought of making money by trading a bit on his own account. Trading how? Tom wished to know. Why, by sending out a bit of a cargo to foreign ports, because Bob had a particular friend who had offered to do a little business for him, in that way, in laysome goods, and would be glad to serve Mr. Tom on the same footing. Tom was interested at once, and begged for full explanation, wondering he had not thought of this plan before. He was so well pleased with the prospect of a speculation that might change the slow process of addition into multiplication, that he at once determined to mention the matter to his father, and get his consent to appropriate some of the savings in the tin box to the purchase of a small cargo. He would rather not have consulted his father, but he had just paid his last quarter's money into the tin box, and there was no other resource. All the savings were there, for Mr. Tulliver would not consent to put the money out at interest lest he should lose it. Since he had speculated in the purchase of some corn, and had lost by it, he could not be easy without keeping the money under his eye. Tom approached the subject carefully, as he was seated on the hearth with his father that evening, and Mr. Tulliver listened, leaning forward in his armchair and looking up in Tom's face with a sceptical glance. His first impulse was to give a positive refusal, but he was in some awe of Tom's wishes, and since he had the sense of being an unlucky father, he had lost some of his old peremptoriness and determination to be master. He took the key of the bureau from his pocket, got out the key of the large chest, and fetched down the tin box, slowly, as if he were trying to defer the moment of a painful parting. Then he seated himself against the table, and opened the box with that little padlock key which he fingered in his waistcoat pocket, in all vacant moments. There they were, the dingy banknotes and the bright sovereigns, and he counted them out on the table. Only a hundred and sixteen pounds in two years, after all the pinching. "'How much do you want, then?' he said, speaking as if the words burnt his lips. "'Suppose I begin with the thirty-six pounds, father.' said Tom. Mr. Tulliver separated this sum from the rest, and keeping his hand over it, said, "'It's as much as I can save out of my pay in a year.' "'Yes, father, it is such slow work saving out of the little money we get, and in this way we might double our savings.' "'Aye, my lad,' said the father, keeping his hand on the money, "'but you might lose it.' "'You might lose a year of my life, and I haven't got many.' Tom was silent. "'And you know I wouldn't pay a dividend with the first hundred, "'because I wanted to see it all in a lump. "'And when I see it, I'm sure on't. 
If you trust to luck, it's sure to be against me. It's old Harry's got the luck in his hands, and if I lose one year, I shall never pick it up again. Death'll overtake me. Mr. Tulliver's voice trembled, and Tom was silent for a few moments before he said, "'I'll give it up, father, since you object to it so strongly.' But, unwilling to abandon the scheme altogether, he determined to ask his uncle Glegg to venture twenty pounds on condition of receiving five per cent of the profits. That was really a very small thing to ask. So when Bob called the next day at the wharf to know the decision, Tom proposed that they should go together to his uncle Glegg's to open the business, for his diffident pride clung to him, and made him feel that Bob's tongue would relieve him from some embarrassment. Mr. Glegg, at the pleasant hour of four in the afternoon of a hot August day, was naturally counting his wall fruit to assure himself that the sum total had not varied since yesterday. To him entered Tom, in what appeared to Mr. Glegg very questionable companionship, that of a man with a pack on his back, for Bob was equipped of a new journey, and of a huge brindled bull-terrier who walked with a slow swaying movement from side to side, and glanced from under his eyelids with a surly indifference which might, after all, be a cover to the most offensive designs. Mr. Glegg's spectacles, which had been assisting him in counting the fruit, made these suspicious details alarmingly evident to him. "'Hey, hey, keep that dog back, will you?' he shouted, snatching up a stake and holding it before him as a shield when the visitors were within three yards of him. "'Get out with your mumps,' said Bob, with a kick. "'He's as quiet as a lamb, sir,' an observation which Mumps corroborated by a low growl as he retreated behind his master's legs. "'Why, whatever does this mean, Tom?' said Mr. Glegg. "'Have you brought information about the scoundrels as cut my trees?' If Bob came in the character of information, Mr. Glegg saw reasons for tolerating some irregularity. "'No, sir,' said Tom, "'I came to speak to you about a little matter of business of my own.' "'Aye, well, but what has this dog got to do with it?' said the old gentleman, getting mild again. "'It's my dog, sir,' said the ready Bob, and it's me as put Mr. Tom up to the bit of business, for Mr. Tom's been a friend of mine ever since I was a little chap. First thing ever I did was frightening the birds for the old master, and if a bit of luck turns up I'm always thinking if I can let Mr. Tom have a pull at it, and it's a downright roar in shame as when he's got the chance of making a bit of money with sending goods out, ten or twelve per cent clear when freight and commissions paid, as he shouldn't lay hold of the chance for want of money. And when there's the laysome goods, laws, they're made a purpose for folks as want to send out a little cargy. Light, and take up no room. You may pack twenty pound, so as you can't see the passil. And they're manufacturers as please fools, so I reckon they aren't like to want to mark it and I'd go to lay some and buy the goods for Mr. Tom along with me own. And there's the shooper cargo of the bit of a vessel as is going to take em out. I know him particular. He's a solid man and got a family in the town here. Salt his name is, and a briny chap he is too, and if you don't believe me I can take you to him. Uncle Glegg stood open-mouthed with astonishment at this unembarrassed loquacity, with which his understanding could hardly keep pace. He looked at Bob, first over his spectacles, then through them, then over them again, while Tom, doubtful of his uncle's impression, began to wish he had not brought this singular Aaron or mouthpiece. Bob's talk appeared less seemly, now some one besides himself was listening to it. 
"'You seem to be a knowing fellow,' said Mr. Glegg at last. "'Aye, sir, you say true,' returned Bob, nodding his head aside. "'I think my head's all alive inside like an old cheese, for I'm so full of plans one knocks another over. "'If I hadn't mumps to talk to, I should get top-heavy and tumble in a fit. "'I suppose it's because I never went to school much. "'That's what I jaw my old mother for.' I says, you should have sent me to school a bit more, I says, and then I could have read of the books like fun and kept me head cool and empty. Laws, she's fine and comfortable now, my old mother is. She ate her baked meat and taters as often as she likes. For I'm getting so full of money I must have a wife to spend it for me. But it's bothering a wife is, and mumps mightn't like her. Uncle Glegg, who regarded himself as a jocose man since he had retired from business, was beginning to find Bob amusing, but he still had a disapproving observation to make, which kept his face serious. "'Ah,' he said, "'I should think you're at a loss for ways of spending your money, else you wouldn't keep that big dog to eat as much as two Christians. It's shameful, shameful!' but he spoke more in sorrow than in anger, and quickly added, "'But come now, let's hear more about this business, Tom. I suppose you want a little sum to make a venture with. But where's all your own money? You don't spend it all, eh?' "'No, sir,' said Tom, colouring, "'but my father is unwilling to risk it, and I don't like to press him. If I could get twenty or thirty pounds to begin with, I could pay five per cent for it, and then I could gradually make a little capital of my own and do without a loan. "'Aye, aye,' said Mr. Glegg, in an approving tone. "'That's not a bad notion, and I won't say as I wouldn't be a man. But it'll be as well for me to see this salt as you talk on. And then, here's this friend of yours offers to buy the goods for you.' "'Perhaps you've got somebody to stand surety for you if the money's put into your hands,' added the cautious old gentleman, looking over his specs at Bob. "'I don't think that's necessary, Uncle,' said Tom. "'At least, I mean it would not be necessary for me, because I know Bob well. But perhaps it would be right for you to have some security.' "'You get your percentage out of the purchase, I suppose.' said Mr. Glegg, looking at Bob. "'No, sir,' said Bob, rather indignantly. "'I didn't offer to get a apple for Mr. Tom, a purpose to have a bite out of it myself. When I play folks' tricks, there'll be more fun in them than that.' "'Well, it's nothing but right you should have a small percentage,' said Mr. Glegg. "'I've no opinion of transactions where folks do things for nothing. It always looks bad.' "'Well, then,' said Bob, whose keenness saw at once what was implied, "'I'll tell you what I get by it, and it's money in my pocket in the end. I make myself look big we're making a bigger purchase. That's what I'm thinking on. Laws, I'm a cute chap, I am.' "'Mr. Glegg! Mr. Glegg!' said a severe voice from the open parlour window, "'Pray, are you coming in to tea, or are you going to stand talking with packmen till you get murdered in the open daylight?' "'Murdered,' said Mr. Glegg. "'What's the woman talking of? Here's your nephew Tom come about a bit of business. "'Murdered, yes. It isn't many sizes ago since a packman murdered a young woman in a lone place and stole her thimble and threw her body into a ditch.' "'Nay, nay,' said Mr. Glegg soothingly. "'You're thinking of the man with no legs as drove a dog-cart.' "'Well, it's the same thing, Mr. Glegg, only you're fond of contradicting what I say. And if my nephew's come about business, it'd be more fitting if you'd bring him into the house and let his aunt know about it, instead of whispering in corners in that plotting, undermining way.' "'Well, well,' said Mr. Glegg, "'we'll come in now.' "'You needn't stay here,' said the lady to Bob in a loud voice, 
adapted to the moral, not the physical, distance between them. "'We don't want anything. I don't deal with pack-men. Mind you shut the gate after you.' "'Stop a bit, not so fast,' said Mr. Glegg. "'I haven't done with this young man yet. "'Come in, Tom, come in,' he added, stepping in at the French window. "'Mr. Glegg,' said Mrs. G., in a fatal tone, "'if you're going to let that man and his dog in on my carpet before my very face, be so good as to let me know. A wife's got a right to ask that, I hope.' End of chapter 2, part 1 of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham Part Two of Chapter Two of Book Fifth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Aunt Glegg learned the breadth of Bob's thumb. Continued. Don't you be uneasy, Mum," said Bob, touching his cap. He saw at once that Mrs. Glegg was a bit of game worth running down, and longed to be at the sport. "'We'll stay out upon the gravel here, Mumps and me will. Mumps knows his company, he does. I might hish at him by the hour together before he'd fly at a real gentlewoman like you. It's wonderful how he knows which is the good-looking ladies, and particular fond of em when they've good shapes. Laws!' added Bob, laying down his pack on the gravel. "'It's a thousand pity such a lady as you shouldn't deal with a packman, instead of going into these new-fangled shops where there's half a dozen fine gents with their chins propped up with a stiff stock, a looking like bottles with ornamental stoppers, and all got to get their dinner out of a bit of calico. It stands to reason you must pay three times the price you pay a packman, as is the natural way of getting goods, and pays no rent, and isn't forced to throttle himself till the lies are squeezed out on him, whether he will or no. But laws, mum, you know what is better nor I do. You can see through them shopmen, I'll be bound. Yes, I reckon I can, and through the packmen too, observed Mrs. Glegg, intending to imply that Bob's flattery had produced no effect on her, while her husband, standing behind her with his hands in his pockets and legs apart, winked and smiled with conjugal delight at the probability of his wife's being circumvented. "'Aye, to be sure, mum,' said Bob. "'Why, you must have dealt with no end of packmen when you were a young lass, before the master here had the luck to set eyes on you. I know where you lived, I do. Seen the house many a time, close upon Squire Darley's, a stone house with steps. Ay, that it had, said Mrs. Clegg, pouring out the tea. You know something of my family, then? Are you akin to that packman with a squint in his eye, as used to bring the Irish linen? "'Look you there now,' said Bob, evasively. "'Didn't I know as you'd remember the best bargains you've made in your life was made with packmen? "'Why, you see, even a squinting packman's better nor a shopman as can see straight. "'Laws, if I'd had the luck to call at the stone house where my pack as lies here—' stooping and thumping the bundle emphatically with his fist, and the handsome young lasses all standing out on the stone steps, it had have been somewhat like opening a pack, that would. It's only the poor houses now, as the packman calls on, if it isn't for the sake of the servant maids. The paltry times these are. Why, mum, look at the printed cottons now, and what there was when you wore em. "'Why, you wouldn't put such a thing on now, I can see. "'It must be first-rate quality, the manufacture as you'd buy, "'some it as would wear as well as your own features.' "'Yes, 
better quality nor any you're like to carry you've got nothing first rate but brazenness i'll be bound said mrs glegg with a triumphant sense of her insurmountable sagacity mr glegg are you going ever to sit down to your tea tom there's a cup for you you speak true there mum said bob my pack isn't for ladies like you the time's gone by for that bargains picked up dirt cheap a bit of damage here and there as can be cut out or else never seen of the wearing but not fit to offer to rich folks as can pay for the look of things as nobody sees i'm not the man as had offered to open my pack to you mum no no i'm a imperant chap as you say these times makes folks imperant but i'm not up to the mark o' that why what goods do you carry in your pack said mrs glegg fine coloured things i suppose shawls and that all sorts mum all sorts said bob thumping his bundle but let us say no more about that if you please i'm here upon mr tom's business and i'm not the man to take up the time of me own and pray what is this business as is to be kept from me said mrs glegg who solicited by a double curiosity was obliged to let the one half wait a little plan o nephy tom's here said good-natured mr glegg and not altogether a bad un i think a little plan for making money that's the right sort of plan for young folks as have got their fortune to make eh jane but i hope it isn't a plan where he expects everything to be done for him by his friends that's what the young folks think of mostly nowadays and pray what has this packman got to do with what goes on in our family can't you speak for yourself tom and let your aunt know things as an effie should this is bob jakin aunt said tom bridling the irritation that aunt glegg's voice always produced i've known him ever since we were little boys he's a very good fellow and always ready to do me a kindness and he has had some experience in sending goods out a small part of a cargo as a private speculation and he thinks if i could begin to do a little in the same way i might make some money a large interest is got in that way large interest said aunt glegg with eagerness and what do you call large interest ten or twelve per cent bob says after expenses are paid then why wasn't i let to know such things before mr glegg said mrs glegg turning to her husband with a deep grating tone of reproach haven't you allus told me as there was no getting more'n a five per cent pooh pooh nonsense my good woman said mr glegg you couldn't go into trade could you you can't get more than five per cent with security but i can turn a bit o' money for you and welcome mum said bob if you'd like to risk it not as there's any risk to speak on but if you'd a mind to lend a bit o' money to mr tom he'd pay you six or seven per cent and get a trifle for himself as well and a good-natured lady like you would like the feel of the money better if your nephew took part on it what do you say mrs g said mr glegg i've a notion when i've made a bit more inquiry as i shall perhaps start tom here with a bit of a nest egg he'll pay me interest you know and if you've got some little sums lying idle twisted up in a stocking toe or that mr glegg it's beyond everything you go and give information to the tramps next as they may come and rob me well well as i was saying if you like to join me with twenty pounds ye can i'll make it fifty that'll be a pretty good nest egg eh tom you're not counting on me mr glegg i hope said his wife you could do fine things with my money i don't doubt very well said mr glegg rather snappishly then we'll do without you i shall go with you to see this salt 
he added, turning to Bob. "'And now, I suppose, you'll go all the other way, Mr. Glegg,' said Mrs. G., "'and want to shut me out of my own nephew's business. I never said I wouldn't put money into it. I don't say as it shall be twenty pounds, though you're so ready to say it for me, but he'll see some day as his aunt's in the right not to risk the money she's saved for him till it's proved as it won't be lost. "'Aye, that's a pleasant sort of risk, that is,' said Mr. Glegg, indiscreetly winking at Tom, who couldn't avoid smiling. But Bob stemmed the injured lady's outburst. "'Aye, mum,' he said admiringly, "'you know what's what you do.' then it's nothing but fair. You see how the first bit of a job answers, and then you'll come down handsome. Laws, it's a fine thing to have good kin. I got my bit of a nest egg, as the master calls it, all by my own sharpness. Ten sovereigns it was, with dowsing the fire at Torrey's mill, and it's growed and growed by a bit and a bit, till i ain't got a matter of thirty pound to lay out, "'besides making my mother comfortable. "'I should get more, only I'm such a soft with the women. "'I can't help letting them have such good bargains. "'There's this bundle now,' thumping it lustily. "'Any chap would make a pretty penny out on it. "'But me? Laws, I shall sell em for pretty near what I paid for em. "'Have you got a bit of good net now?' said Mrs. Glegg, in a patronising tone, moving from the tea-table and folding her napkin. "'Eh, hey, mum, not what you'd think it worth your while to look at. I'd scorn to show it you. It'd be an insult to you.' "'But let me see,' said Mrs. Glegg, still patronising. "'If they're damaged goods, they're like enough to be a bit the better quality.' "'No, mum, I know my place.' said Bob, lifting up his pack and shouldering it. "'I'm not going to expose the lowness of my trade to a lady like you. Pax is come down in the world. It had cut you to the heart to see the difference. I'm at your service, sir, when you've a mind to go and see Salt.' "'All in good time,' said Mr. Glegg, really unwilling to cut short the dialogue. "'Are you wanted at the wharf, Tom?' "'No, sir, I left Stowe in my place.' "'Come, put down your pack and let me see,' said Mrs. Glegg, drawing a chair to the window and seating herself with much dignity. "'Don't you ask it, mum,' said Bob entreatingly. "'Make no more words,' said Mrs. Glegg severely, "'but do as I tell you. "'Eh, hey, mum, I'm loath that I am,' said Bob, slowly depositing his pack on the step, and beginning to untie it with unwilling fingers. "'But what you order shall be done,' much fumbling in pauses between the sentences. "'It's not as you'll buy a single thing on me. I'd be sorry for you to do it. For think of them poor women up in the villages there as never stir a hundred yards from home. It'd be a pity for anybody to buy up their bargains.' "'Laws, it's as good as a junketing to em when they see me with me pack, "'and I shall never pick up such bargains for em again. "'Leastways I've no time now, for I'm off to lace em. "'See here now.' "'Bob went on, becoming rapid again, "'and holding up a scarlet wooden kerchief with an embroidered wreath in the corner. "'Here's a thing to make a lass's mouth water, and only two shilling. "'And why?' "'Why, cause there's a bit of a moth-hole in this plain end. "'Laws, I think the moths and the mildew were sent by Providence a purpose to cheapen the goods a bit, for the good-looking women as hadn't got much money. "'If it hadn't been for the moths now, every handkerchief on em had a gone to the rich handsome ladies like you, mum, at five shilling apiece, not a farthing less. But what does the moth do?' "'Why, it nibbles off three shillings of the price in all time, "'and then a packman like me can carry it to the poor lasses "'as live under the dark thack to make a bit of a blaze for em. "'Laws, it's as good as a fire to look at such a handkerchief.' 
Bob held it at a distance for admiration, but Mrs. Glegg said sharply, "'Yes, but nobody wants a fire this time of year. Put these coloured things by. Let me look at your nets, if you've got em. "'Eh, Mum, I told you how it'd be,' said Bob, flinging aside the coloured things with an air of desperation. "'I knowed it'd turn again you to look at such paltry articles as I carry. Here's a piece of figured muslin now. What's the use of your looking at it? You might as well look at poor folks as vittel, Mum. It'd only take away your appetite. There's a yard in the middle on it as the pattern's all missed. Laws, why, it's a muslin as the Princess Victoria might a wore. But—' added Bob, flinging it behind him onto the turf, as if to save Mrs. Glegg's eyes, it'll be bought up by the huckster's wife at Fib's end. That's where it'll go. Ten shilling for the whole lot. Ten yards, counting the damaged un. Five and twenty shilling had been the price, not a penny less. But I say no more, mum. It's nothing to you. A piece of muslin like that. You can afford to pay three times the money for a thing as isn't half so good. It's nets you talk, Don. Well, I've got a piece as'll serve you to make fun on. Bring me that muslin, said Mrs. Glegg. It's a buff. I'm partial to buff. Eh, but a damaged thing, said Bob in a tone of deprecating disgust. You do nothing with it, mum. You'd give it to the cook, I know you would, and it'd be a pity. She'd look too much like a lady in it. It's unbecoming for servants. Fetch it, and let me see you measure it, said Mrs. Glegg authoritatively. Bob obeyed with ostentatious reluctance. See what there is over measure, he said, holding forth the extra half-yard, while Mrs. Glegg was busy examining the damaged yard, and throwing her head back to see how far the fault would be lost on a distant view. "'I'll give you six shilling for it,' she said, throwing it down with the air of a person who mentions an ultimatum. "'Didn't I tell you now, Mum, as it'd hurt your feelings to look at my pack? That damaged bit's turned your stomach now, I see it has,' said Bob, wrapping the muslin up with the utmost quickness, and apparently about to fasten up his pack. "'You're used to seeing a different sort of article carried by packmen when you lived at the stone house. Packs is come down in the world. I told you that. My goods are for common folks. Mrs. Pepper'll give me ten shilling for that muslin, and be sorry as I didn't ask her more. Such articles answer i the wearing. They keep their colour till the threads melt away the wash-tub, and that won't be while I'm a young un. "'Well, seven shilling,' said Mrs. Glegg. "'Put it out of your mind, Mum. Now do,' said Bob. "'Here's a bit of net, then, for you to look at before I tie up my pack, just for you to see what my trade's come to. Spotted and sprigged, you see. Beautiful, but yellow. It's been lying by and got the wrong colour. I could never have bought such net if it hadn't been yellow.' "'Laws, it's took me a deal of study to know the value of such articles. "'When I begun to carry a pack, I was as ignorant as a pig. "'Net or calico was all the same to me. "'I thought them things the most valley as was the thickest. "'I was took in dreadful, for I'm a straight-forward chap, "'up to no tricks, mum, and I can only say my nose is my own, for if I went beyond I should lose myself pretty quick. And I give five and eightpence for that piece of net. If I was to tell you anything else I should be telling you fibs, and five and eightpence I shall ask for it, not a penny more, for it's a woman's article, and I like to accommodate the women. Five and eightpence for six yards— as cheap as if it was only the dirt on it as was paid for. "'I don't mind having three yards of it,' said Mrs. Glegg. "'Why, there's but six altogether,' said Bob, 
"'No, Mum, it isn't worth your while. "'You can go to the shop to-morrow and get the same pattern ready white, "'and it's only three times the money. "'What's that to a lady like you?' "'He gave an emphatic tie to his bundle. "'Come, lay me out that muslin,' said Mrs. Clegg. "'Here's eight shilling for it.' "'You will be joking, Mum,' said Bob, looking up with a laughing face. "'I seed you was a pleasant lady when I fust came to the window. "'Well, put it me out,' said Mrs. Clegg peremptorily. "'But if I let you have it for ten shilling, Mum, you'll be so good as not tell anybody. "'I should be a laughing-stock. The trade'd hoot me if they knowed it. "'I'm obliged to make believe as I ask more nor I do for my goods, "'else they'd find out I was a flat. "'I'm glad you don't insist upon buying the net, "'for then I should have lost my two best bargains "'for Mrs. Pepper of Fib's End, and she's a rare customer.' "'Let me look at the net again,' said Mrs. Glegg, "'yearning after the cheap spots and sprigs now they were vanishing.' "'Well, I can't deny you, Mum,' said Bob, handing it out. "'Ee, see what a pattern now. Real lay some goods. Now this is the sort of article I'm recommending Mr. Tom to send out. Laws, it's a fine thing for anybody as has got a bit of money. These lay some goods would make it breed like maggots. "'If I was a lady with a bit of money—' "'Why, I know one has put thirty pound into them goods. "'A lady with a cork leg, but a sharp. "'You wouldn't catch her running her head into a sack. "'She'd see her way clear out to anything afore she'd be in a hurry to start. "'Well, she let out thirty pound to a young man in the drapering line, "'and he laid it out to lay some goods, "'and a shooper cargo of my acquaintance, not salt, took em out, and she got her eight per cent first go off, and now you can't hold her, but she must be sending out cargies wi every ship till she's getting as rich as a Jew. Books her name is. She doesn't live a this town. Now then, mum, if you'll please to give me the net. Here's fifteen shilling then for the two, said Mrs. Glegg, but it's a shameful price. "'Nay, mum, you'll never say that, when you're upon your knees at church in five years' time. I'm making you a present of the articles, I am indeed. That eight pence shaves off my profit as clean as a razor. "'Now then, sir,' continued Bob, shouldering his pack, "'if you please, I'll be glad to go and see about making Mr. Tom's fortune.' E, I wish I'd got another twenty pound to lay out for Miss N. I shouldn't stay to say my catechism afore I knowed what to do with it. Stop a bit, Mr. Glegg, said the lady as her husband took his hat. You never will give me the chance of speaking. You'll go away now and finish everything about this business and come back and tell me it's too late for me to speak. As if I wasn't my nephew's own aunt, and the head of the family on his mother's side, and laid by guineas, all full weight for him, as he'll know who to respect when I'm laid in my coffin. "'Well, Mrs. G., say what you mean,' said Mr. G. hastily. "'Well, then, I desire as nothing may be done without my knowing. I don't say as I shan't venture twenty pounds.' "'if you make out as everything's right and safe. "'And if I do, Tom,' concluded Mrs. Glegg, "'turning impressively to her nephew, "'I hope you'll always bear it in mind "'and be grateful for such an aunt. "'I mean you to pay me interest, you know. "'I don't approve of giving. "'We never looked for that in my family.' "'Thank you, aunt,' said Tom rather proudly. "'I prefer having the money only lent to me.' "'Very well, that's the Dodson spirit,' said Mrs. Glegg, rising to get her knitting, with the sense that any further remark after this would be bathos. Salt, that eminently briny chap, having been discovered in a cloud of tobacco smoke at the Anchor Tavern, 
Mr. Glegg commenced inquiries which turned out satisfactorily enough to warrant the advance of the nest egg, to which Aunt Glegg contributed twenty pounds, and in this modest beginning you see the ground of a fact which might otherwise surprise you, namely, Tom's accumulation of a fund, unknown to his father, that promised in no very long time to meet the more tardy process of saving, and quite cover the deficit. When once his attention had been turned to this source of gain, Tom determined to make the most of it, and lost no opportunity of obtaining information and extending his small enterprises. In not telling his father, he was influenced by that strange mixture of opposite feelings which often gives equal truth to those who blame an action and those who admire it. Partly it was that disinclination to confidence which is seen between near kindred, that family repulsion which spoils the most sacred relations of our lives. Partly it was the desire to surprise his father with a great joy. He did not see that it would have been better to soothe the interval with a new hope, and prevent the delirium of a too sudden elation. At the time of Maggie's first meeting with Philip, Tom had already nearly a hundred and fifty pounds of his own capital, and while they were walking by the evening light in the red deeps, he, by the same evening light, was riding into Laysom, proud of being on his first journey on behalf of Guest and Company, and revolving in his mind all the chances that by the end of another year he should have doubled his gains, lifted off the obloquy of debt from his father's name, and perhaps, for he should be twenty-one, have got a new start for himself on a higher platform of employment. Did he not deserve it? He was quite sure that he did. End of chapter 2 of Book 5 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 3 of Book 5th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham The Wavering Balance I said that Maggie went home that evening from the Red Deeps, with a mental conflict already begun. You have seen clearly enough in her interview with Philip what that conflict was. Here suddenly was an opening in the rocky wall which shut in the narrow valley of humiliation, where all her prospect was the remote, unfathomed sky, and some of the memory-haunting earthly delights were no longer out of her reach. She might have books, converse, affection, she might hear tidings of the world from which her mind had not yet lost its sense of exile, and it would be a kindness to Philip too, who was pitiable, clearly not happy. And perhaps here was an opportunity indicated for making her mind more worthy of its highest service. Perhaps the noblest, completest devoutness could hardly exist without some width of knowledge. Must she always live in this resigned imprisonment? It was so blameless, so good a thing that there should be a friendship between her and Philip. The motives that forbade it were so unreasonable, so unchristian. But the severe, monotonous warning came again and again, that she was losing the simplicity and clearness of her life by admitting a ground of concealment, and that by forsaking the simple rule of renunciation she was throwing herself under the seductive guidance of illimitable wants. She thought she had one strength to obey the warning before she allowed herself the next week to turn her steps in the evening to the red deeps. But while she was resolved to say an affectionate farewell to Philip, how she looked forward to that evening walk in the still, fleckered shade of the hollows, away from all that was harsh and unlovely, 
to the affectionate, admiring looks that would meet her, to the sense of comradeship that childish memories would give to wiser, older talk, to the certainty that Philip would care to hear everything she said, which no one else cared for. It was a half-hour that it would be very hard to turn her back upon, with the sense that there would be no other like it. Yet she said what she meant to say. She looked firm as well as sad. "'Philip, I have made up my mind. It is right that we should give each other up in everything but memory. I could not see you without concealment. Stay, I know what you are going to say. It is other people's wrong feelings that make concealment necessary, but concealment is bad, however it may be caused. I feel that it would be bad for me, for us both. And then, if our secret were discovered, there would be nothing but misery. Dreadful anger! And then we must part after all, and it would be harder when we were used to seeing each other. Philip's face had flushed, and there was a momentary eagerness of expression, as if he had been about to resist this decision with all his might. But he controlled himself, and said with assumed calmness, "'Well, Maggie, if we must part, let us try and forget it for one half-hour. Let us talk together a little while, for the last time.' He took her hand and Maggie felt no reason to withdraw it. His quietness made her all the more sure she had given him great pain, and she wanted to show him how unwillingly she had given it. They walked together hand in hand in silence. "'Let us sit down in the hollow,' said Philip, "'where we stood the last time. See how the dog-roses have strewed the ground, and spread their opal petals over it. They sat down at the roots of the slanting ash. "'I've begun my picture of you among the Scotch firs, Maggie,' said Philip. "'So you must let me study your face a little while you stay, since I am not to see it again. Please turn your head this way.' This was said in an entreating voice, and it would have been very hard of Maggie to refuse. The full, lustrous face with the bright black coronet looked down like that of a divinity well pleased to be worshipped on the pale-hued, small-featured face that was turned up to it. "'I shall be sitting for my second portrait, then,' she said, smiling. "'Will it be larger than the other?' "'Oh, yes, much larger.' It is an oil painting. You will look like a tall hamadryad, dark and strong and noble, just issued from one of the fir trees, when the stems are casting their afternoon shadows on the grass. You seem to think more of painting than of anything now, Philip. Perhaps I do, said Philip rather sadly, but I think of too many things. Sow all sorts of seeds and get no great harvest from any one of them. I'm cursed with susceptibility in every direction, and effective faculty in none. I care for painting and music, I care for classical literature, and medieval literature, and modern literature. I flutter always and fly in none. "'But surely that is a happiness to have so many tastes, to enjoy so many beautiful things, when they are within your reach,' said Maggie musingly. "'It always seemed to me a sort of clever stupidity only to have one sort of talent, almost like a carrier pigeon.' "'It might be a happiness to have many tastes if I were like other men,' said Philip bitterly. I might get some power and distinction by mere mediocrity, as they do. At least I should get those middling satisfactions which make men contented to do without great ones. I might think society at St. Ogg's agreeable, then. But nothing could make life worth the purchase money of pain to me. 
but some faculty that would lift me above the dead level of provincial existence. Yes, there is one thing. A passion answers as well as a faculty. Maggie did not hear the last words. She was struggling against the consciousness that Philip's words had set her own discontent vibrating again as it used to do. "'I understand what you mean,' she said, "'though I know so much less than you do. I used to think I could never bear life if it kept on being the same every day, and I must always be doing things of no consequence, and never know anything greater.' "'Dear Philip, I think we are only like children that some one who is wiser is taken care of. Is it not right to resign ourselves entirely, whatever may be denied us? I have found great peace in that for the last two or three years, even joy in subduing my own will.' "'Yes, Maggie,' said Philip vehemently, and you are shutting yourself up in a narrow, self-delusive fanaticism which is only a way of escaping pain by starving into dullness all the highest powers of your nature. Joy and peace are not resignation. Resignation is the willing endurance of a pain that is not allayed, that you don't expect to be allayed. Stupefaction is not resignation, and it is stupefaction to remain in ignorance, to shut up all the avenues by which the life of your fellow men might become known to you. I am not resigned. I am not sure that life is long enough to learn that lesson. You are not resigned. You are only trying to stupefy yourself. Maggie's lips trembled. She felt there was some truth in what Philip said, and yet there was a deeper consciousness that, for any immediate application it had to her conduct, it was no better than falsity. Her double impression corresponded to the double impulse of the speaker. Philip seriously believed what he said, but he said it with vehemence, because it made an argument against the resolution that opposed his wishes but Maggie's face, made more childlike by the gathering tears, touched him with a tenderer, less egoistic feeling. He took her hand, and said gently, "'Don't let us think of such things in this short half-hour, Maggie. Let us only care about being together. We shall be friends, in spite of separation. We shall always think of each other.' I shall be glad to live as long as you are alive, because I shall think there may always come a time when I can, when you will let me help you in some way. "'What a dear good brother you would have been, Philip,' said Maggie, smiling through the haze of tears. "'I think you would have made as much fuss about me, and been as pleased for me to love you, as would have satisfied even me.' You would have loved me well enough to bear with me, and forgive me everything. That was what I always longed that Tom should do. I was never satisfied with a little of anything. That is why it is better for me to do without earthly happiness altogether. I never felt that I had enough music. I wanted more instruments playing together. I wanted voices to be fuller and deeper. Do you ever sing now, Philip? she added abruptly, as if she had forgotten what went before. "'Yes,' he said, "'every day almost, but my voice is only middling like everything else in me. Oh, sing me something, just one song. I may listen to that before I go, something you used to sing at Lawton on a Saturday afternoon, when we had the drawing-room all to ourselves, and I put my apron over my head to listen.' "'I know,' said Philip, and Maggie buried her face in her hands, while he sang sotto voce, "'Love in her eyes sits playing,' and then said, "'That's it, isn't it?' "'Oh, no, I won't stay,' said Maggie, starting up. "'It will only haunt me. Let us walk, Philip. I must go home.' 
she moved away so that he was obliged to rise and follow her. "'Maggie,' he said, in a tone of remonstrance, "'don't persist in this willful, senseless privation. It makes me wretched to see you benumbing and cramping your nature in this way. You were so full of life when you were a child. I thought you would be a brilliant woman, all wit and bright imagination, and it flashes out in your face still until you draw that veil of dull quiescence over it. "'Why do you speak so bitterly to me, Philip?' said Maggie. "'Because I foresee it will not end well. You can never carry on this self-torture.' "'I shall have strength given me,' said Maggie tremulously. "'No, you will not, Maggie. No one has strength given to do what is unnatural. It is mere cowardice to seek safety in negations. No character becomes strong in that way. You will be thrown into the world some day, and then every rational satisfaction of your nature that you deny now will assault you like a savage appetite. Maggie started and paused, looking at Philip with alarm in her face. "'Philip, how dare you shake me in this way! You are a tempter!' "'No, I am not. But love gives insight, Maggie, and insight often gives foreboding. Listen to me. Let me supply you with books. Do let me see you sometimes. Be your brother and teacher, as you said at Lawton. It is less wrong that you should see me than that you should be committing this long suicide. Maggie felt unable to speak. She shook her head and walked on in silence till they came to the end of the Scotch firs, and she put out her hand in sign of parting. "'Do you banish me from this place for ever, then, Maggie? Surely I may come and walk in it sometimes. If I meet you by chance there is no concealment in that.' "'It is the moment when our resolution seems about to become irrevocable.' when the fatal iron gates are about to close upon us, that tests our strength. Then, after hours of clear reasoning and firm conviction, we snatch at any sophistry that will nullify our long struggles, and bring us the defeat that we love better than victory. Maggie felt her heart leap at this subterfuge of Philip's, and there passed over her face that almost imperceptible shock which accompanies any relief. He saw it, and they parted in silence. Philip's sense of the situation was too complete for him not to be visited with glancing fears lest he had been intervening too presumptuously in the action of Maggie's conscience, perhaps for a selfish end. But no, he persuaded himself his end was not selfish. He had little hope that Maggie would ever return the strong feeling he had for her, and it must be better for Maggie's future life when these petty family obstacles to her freedom had disappeared, that the present should not be entirely sacrificed, and that she should have some opportunity of culture some interchange with a mind above the vulgar level of those she was now condemned to live with. If we only look far enough off for the consequences of our actions, we can always find some point in the combination of results by which those actions can be justified, by adopting the point of view of a providence who arranges results, or of a philosopher who traces them. We shall find it possible to obtain perfect complacency in choosing to do what is most agreeable to us in the present moment. And it was in this way that Philip justified his subtle efforts to overcome Maggie's true prompting against a concealment that would introduce doubleness into her own mind, and might cause new misery to those who had the primary natural claim on her. 
but there was a surplus of passion in him that made him half independent of justifying motives. His longing to see Maggie, and make an element in her life, had in it some of that savage impulse to snatch an offered joy which springs from a life in which the mental and bodily constitution have made pain predominate. He had not his full share in the common good of men. He could not even pass muster with the insignificant, but must be singled out for pity, and accepted from what was a matter of course with others. Even to Maggie he was an exception. It was clear that the thought of his being her lover had never entered her mind. Do not think too hardly of Philip. Ugly and deformed people have great need of unusual virtues, because they are likely to be extremely uncomfortable without them. But the theory that unusual virtues spring by a direct consequence out of personal disadvantages, as animals get thicker wool in severe climates, is perhaps a little overstrained. The temptations of beauty are much dwelt upon, but I fancy they only bear the same relation to those of ugliness as the temptation to excess at a feast, where the delights are varied for eye and ear as well as palate, bears to the temptations that assail the desperation of hunger. Does not the hunger tower stand as the type of the utmost trial to what is human in us? Philip had never been soothed by that mother's love which flows out to us in the greater abundance because our need is greater, which clings to us the more tenderly because we are the less likely to be winners in the game of life. And the sense of his father's affection and indulgence towards him was marred by the keener perception of his father's faults. Kept aloof from all practical life as Philip had been, and by nature half feminine in sensitiveness, he had some of the woman's intolerant repulsion towards worldliness and the deliberate pursuit of sensual enjoyment. And this one strong natural tie in his life, his relation as a son, was like an aching limb to him. Perhaps there is inevitably something morbid in a human being who is any way unfavourably accepted from ordinary conditions until the good force has had time to triumph, and it has rarely had time for that at two and twenty. That force was present in Philip in much strength, but the sun himself looks feeble through the morning mists. End of chapter 3 of Book 5 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 4 of Book 5th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Another Love Scene Early in the following April, nearly a year after that dubious parting you have just witnessed, you may, if you like, again see Maggie entering the red deeps through the group of Scotch firs. But it is early afternoon and not evening, and the edge of sharpness in the spring air makes her draw her large shawl close about her, and trip along rather quickly. Though she looks round, as usual, that she may take in the sight of her beloved trees. There is a more eager, inquiring look in her eyes than there was last June, and a smile is hovering about her lips, as if some playful speech were awaiting the right hearer. The hearer was not long in appearing. "'Take back your Corinne," said Maggie, drawing a book from under her shawl. You were right in telling me she would do me no good, but you were wrong in thinking I should wish to be like her. "'Wouldn't you really like to be a tenth muse, then, Maggie?' said Philip, looking up in her face 
as we look at a first parting in the clouds that promises us a bright heaven once more. "'Not at all,' said Maggie, laughing. "'The muses were uncomfortable goddesses, I think, obliged always to carry rolls and musical instruments about with them. If I carried a harp in this climate, you know, I must have a green baize cover for it, and I should be sure to leave it behind me by mistake. You agree with me in not liking Corinne, then? I didn't finish the book, said Maggie. As soon as I came to the blonde-haired young lady reading in the park, I shut it up, and determined to read no further. I foresaw that the light-complexioned girl would win away all the love from Corinne and make her miserable. I'm determined to read no more books where the blonde-haired women carry away all the happiness. I should begin to have a prejudice against them. If you could give me some story now where the dark woman triumphs, it would restore the balance. I want to avenge Rebecca and Flora MacIver and Minna and all the rest of the dark unhappy ones. Since you are my tutor, you ought to preserve my mind from prejudices. You are always arguing against prejudices. Well, perhaps you will avenge the dark women in your own person, and carry away all the love from your cousin Lucy. She is sure to have some handsome young man of St. Ogg's at her feet now, and you have only to shine upon him. Your fair little cousin will be quite quenched in your beams. Philip, that is not pretty of you to apply my nonsense to anything real, said Maggie, looking hurt, as if I, with my old gowns and want of all accomplishments, could be a rival of dear little Lucy who knows and does all sorts of charming things, and is ten times prettier than I am, even if I were odious and base enough to wish to be her rival. Besides, I never go to Aunt Dean's when any one is there. It is only because dear Lucy is good, and loves me, that she comes to see me, and will have me go to see her sometimes. Maggie! said Philip, with surprise, it is not like you to take playfulness literally. You must have been in St. Ogg's this morning, and brought away a slight infection of dullness. Well, said Maggie, smiling, if you meant that for a joke, it was a poor one. But I thought it was a very good reproof. I thought you wanted to remind me that I am vain, and wish every one to admire me most. But it isn't for that that I'm jealous for the dark women, not because I'm dark myself. It's because I always care the most about the unhappy people. If the blonde girl were forsaken, I should like her best. I always take the side of the rejected lover in the stories. Then you would never have the heart to reject one yourself, should you, Maggie? said Philip, flushing a little. I don't know said Maggie hesitatingly. Then, with a bright smile, I think perhaps I could if he were very conceited. And yet, if he got extremely humiliated afterwards, I should relent. I've often wondered, Maggie, Philip said, with some effort, whether you wouldn't really be more likely to love a man that other women were not likely to love. "'That would depend on what they didn't like him for,' said Maggie, laughing. "'He might be very disagreeable. "'He might look at me through an eyeglass stuck in his eye, "'making a hideous face, as young Torrey does. "'I should think other women are not fond of that, "'but I never felt any pity for young Torrey. "'I've never felt any pity for conceited people, "'because I think they carry their comfort about with them.' But suppose, Maggie, suppose it was a man who was not conceited, who felt he had nothing to be conceited about, who had been marked from childhood for a peculiar kind of suffering, and to whom you were the day-star of his life, who loved you, worshipped you so entirely that he felt it happiness enough for him if you would let him see you at rare moments. Philip paused with a pang of dread, lest his confession should cut short this very happiness, a pang of the same dread that had kept his love mute through long months. 
A rush of self-consciousness told him that he was besotted to have said all this. Maggie's manner this morning had been as unconstrained and indifferent as ever. But she was not looking indifferent now. Struck with the unusual emotion in Philip's tone, she had turned quickly to look at him, and as he went on speaking, a great change came over her face, a flush and slight spasm of the features, such as we see in people who hear some news that will require them to readjust their conceptions of the past. She was quite silent, and walking on towards the trunk of a fallen tree, she sat down as if she had no strength to spare for her muscles. She was trembling. "'Maggie,' said Philip, getting more and more alarmed in every fresh moment of silence, "'I was a fool to say it. Forget that I've said it. I shall be contented if things can be as they were.' The distress with which he spoke urged Maggie to say something. "'I am so surprised, Philip. I had not thought of it.' And the effort to say this brought the tears down, too. "'Has it made you hate me, Maggie?' said Philip impetuously. "'Do you think I'm a presumptuous fool?' "'Oh, Philip,' said Maggie, "'how can you think I have such feelings? As if I were not grateful for any love, but—but but I had never thought of your being my lover.' It seemed so far off, like a dream, only like one of the stories one imagines, that I should ever have a lover. "'Then can you bear to think of me as your lover, Maggie?' said Philip, seating himself by her and taking her hand, in the elation of a sudden hope. "'Do you love me?' Maggie turned rather pale. This direct question seemed not easy to answer, but her eyes met Philip's, which were in this moment liquid and beautiful, with beseeching love. She spoke with hesitation, yet with sweet, simple, girlish tenderness. "'I think I could hardly love any one better. There is nothing but what I love you for.' She paused a little while, and then added, "'But it will be better for us not to say any more about it. Won't it, dear Philip? You know we couldn't even be friends if our friendship were discovered. I have never felt that I was right in giving way about seeing you, though it has been so precious to me in some ways. And now the fear comes upon me strongly again, that it will lead to evil. But no evil has come, Maggie, and if you had been guided by that fear before, you would only have lived through another dreary, benumbing year, instead of reviving into your real self. Maggie shook her head. It has been very sweet, I know, all the talking together, and the books, and the feeling that I had the walk to look forward to, when I could tell you the thoughts that had come into my head while I was away from you. But it has made me restless. It has made me think a great deal about the world. And I have impatient thoughts again. I get weary of my home." and then it cuts me to the heart afterwards that I should ever have felt weary of my father and mother. I think what you call being benumbed was better, better for me, for then my selfish desires were benumbed. Philip had risen again and was walking backwards and forwards impatiently. No, Maggie, you have wrong ideas of self-conquest, as I've often told you what you call self-conquest, blinding and deafening yourself to all but one train of impressions, is only the culture of monomania in a nature like yours. He had spoken with some irritation, but now he sat down by her again and took her hand. Don't think of the past now, Maggie. Think only of our love. If you can really cling to me with all your heart, 
every obstacle will be overcome in time. We need only wait. I can live on hope. Look at me, Maggie. Tell me again, it is possible for you to love me. Don't look away from me to that cloven tree. It is a bad omen. She turned her large, dark glance upon him with a sad smile. "'Come, Maggie, say one kind word, or else you were better to me at Lawton. You asked me if I should like you to kiss me, don't you remember? And you promised to kiss me when you met me again. You never kept the promise.' The recollection of that childish time came as a sweet relief to Maggie. It made the present moment less strange to her. She kissed him almost as simply and quietly as she had done when she was twelve years old. Philip's eyes flushed with delight, but his next words were words of discontent. "'You don't seem happy enough, Maggie.' You are forcing yourself to say you love me out of pity. No, Philip, said Maggie, shaking her head in her old childish way. I'm telling you the truth. It is all new and strange to me, but I don't think I could love any one better than I love you. I should like always to live with you, to make you happy. I have always been happy when I have been with you. There is only one thing I will not do for your sake. I will never do anything to wound my father. You must never ask that from me. No, Maggie, I will ask nothing. I will bear everything. I'll wait another year only for a kiss, if you will only give me the first place in your heart." No, said Maggie, smiling, I won't make you wait so long as that. But then, looking serious again, she added, as she rose from her seat, But what would your own father say, Philip? Oh, it is quite impossible we can ever be more than friends, brother and sister in secret as we have been. Let us give up thinking of everything else. No, Maggie, I can't give you up unless you are deceiving me, unless you really only care for me as if I were your brother. Tell me the truth. Indeed I do, Philip. What happiness have I ever had so great as being with you, since I was a little girl, the days Tom was good to me, and your mind is a sort of world to me. You can tell me all I want to know." I think I should never be tired of being with you. They were walking hand in hand, looking at each other. Maggie, indeed, was hurrying along, for she felt it was time to be gone. But the sense that their parting was near made her more anxious lest she should have unintentionally left some painful impression on Philip's mind. It was one of those dangerous moments when speech is at once sincere and deceptive, when feeling, rising high above its average depth, leaves flood-marks which are never reached again. They stopped to part among the Scotch firs. "'Then my life will be filled with hope, Maggie, and I shall be happier than other men in spite of all. We do belong to each other, for always, whether we are apart or together—' Yes, Philip, I should like never to part. I should like to make your life very happy. I am waiting for something else. I wonder whether it will come. Maggie smiled, with glistening tears, and then stooped her tall head to kiss the pale face that was full of pleading, timid love, like a woman's. She had a moment of real happiness then, a moment of belief that, if there was sacrifice in this love, it was all the richer and more satisfying. She turned away and hurried home, feeling that in the hour since she had trodden this road before, a new era had begun for her. 
the tissue of vague dreams must now get narrower and narrower, and all the threads of thought and emotion be gradually absorbed in the woof of her actual daily life. End of chapter 4 of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 5 of Book 5th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The Cloven Tree. Secrets are rarely betrayed or discovered according to any programme our fear has sketched out. Fear is almost always haunted by terrible dramatic scenes, which recur in spite of the best argued probabilities against them, and during a year that Maggie had had the burthen of concealment on her mind, the possibility of discovery had continually presented itself under the form of a sudden meeting with her father or Tom when she was walking with Philip in the Red Deep. She was aware that this was not one of the most likely events, but it was the scene that most completely symbolised her inward dread. Those slightly indirect suggestions which are dependent on apparently trivial coincidences and incalculable states of mind are the favourite machinery of fact, but are not the stuff in which imagination is apt to work. Certainly one of the persons about whom Maggie's fears were farthest from troubling themselves was her aunt Pullet, on whom, seeing that she did not live in St. Ogg's, and was neither sharp-eyed nor sharp-tempered, it would surely have been quite whimsical of them to fix rather than on Aunt Glegg. And yet the channel of fatality, the pathway of the lightning, was no other than Aunt Pullet. She did not live at St. Ogg's, but the road from Garum Firs lay by the Red Deeps, at the end opposite that by which Maggie entered. The day after Maggie's last meeting with Philip, being a Sunday, on which Mr. Pullet was bound to appear in funeral hat-band and scarf at St. Ogg's Church, Mrs. Pullet made this the occasion of dining with Sister Glegg, and taking tea with poor Sister Tulliver. Sunday was the one day in the week on which Tom was at home in the afternoon, and to-day the brighter spirits he had been in of late had flowed over in unusually cheerful open chat with his father, and in the invitation, "'Come, Magsy, you come too!' when he strolled out with his mother in the garden to see the advancing cherry-blossoms. He had been better pleased with Maggie since she had been less odd and ascetic. He was even getting rather proud of her. Several persons had remarked in his hearing that his sister was a very fine girl. Today there was a peculiar brightness in her face, due in reality to an undercurrent of excitement which had as much doubt and pain as pleasure in it, but it might pass for a sign of happiness. "'You look very well, my dear,' said Aunt Pullet, shaking her head sadly as they sat round the tea-table. "'I never thought your girl would be so good-looking, Bessie. But you must wear pink, my dear. That blue thing as your Aunt Glegg gave you turns you into a crow-flower. Jane never was tasty. Why don't you wear that gown of mine? It is so pretty and so smart, aunt. I think it's too showy for me, at least for my other clothes, that I must wear with it. To be sure it'd be unbecoming, if it wasn't well known you've got them belonging to you as can afford to give you such things when they've done with them themselves. It stands to reason I must give my own niece clothes now and then, 
such clothes as I buy every year, and never wear anything out. And as for Lucy, there's no giving to her, for she's got everything of the choicest. Sister Dean may well hold her head up, though she looks dreadful yellow, poor thing. I doubt this liver complaint'll carry her off. That's what this new vicar, this Dr. Ken, said in the funeral sermon to-day. "'Ah, he's a wonderful preacher, by all account, isn't he, Sophie?' said Mrs. Tulliver. "'Why, Lucy had got a collar on this blessed day,' continued Mrs. Pullet, with her eyes fixed in a ruminating manner, "'as I don't say as I haven't got as good, but I must look out my best to match it.' "'Miss Lucy's called the Bella St. Oggs, they say. "'That's a curious word,' observed Mr. Pullet, "'on whom the mysteries of etymology sometimes fell with an oppressive weight. "'Pooh!' said Mr. Tulliver, jealous for Maggie. "'She's a small thing, not much of a figure. "'But fine feathers make fine birds. "'I see nothing to admire so much in those diminutive women.' They look silly by the side of the men, out of proportion. When I chose my wife, I chose her the right size, neither too little nor too big. The poor wife, with her withered beauty, smiled complacently. "'But the men aren't all big,' said Uncle Pullet, not without some self-reference, a young fellow may be good-looking, and yet not be a six-foot, like Master Tom here. Ah, it's poor talking about littleness and bigness. Anybody may think it's a mercy they're straight, said Aunt Pullard. There's that mismade son of lawyer Wakeham's. I saw him at church to-day. Dear, dear, to think of the property he's like to have. "'And they say he's very queer and lonely. "'Doesn't like much company. "'I shouldn't wonder if he goes out of his mind, "'for we never come along the road "'but he's a-scrambling out of the trees and brambles "'at the red deeps.' "'This wide statement by which Mrs. Pullard "'represented the fact that she had twice "'seen Philip at the spot indicated, "'produced an effect on Maggie.' which was all the stronger because Tom sat opposite her, and she was intensely anxious to look indifferent. At Philip's name she had blushed, and the blush deepened every instant from consciousness until the mention of the red deeps made her feel as if the whole secret were betrayed, and she dared not even hold her teaspoon lest she should show how she trembled. She sat with her hands clasped under the table, not daring to look round. Happily, her father was seated on the same side, with herself beyond her uncle Pullet, and could not see her face without stooping forward. Her mother's voice brought the first relief, turning the conversation, for Mrs. Tulliver was always alarmed when the name of Wakeham was mentioned in her husband's presence. Gradually Maggie recovered composure enough to look up. Her eyes met Tom's, but he turned away his head immediately, and she went to bed that night wondering if he had gathered any suspicion from her confusion. Perhaps not. Perhaps he would think it was only her alarm at her aunt's mention of Wakeham before her father. That was the interpretation her mother had put on it. To her father, Wakeham was like a disfiguring disease of which he was obliged to endure the consciousness, but was exasperated to have the existence recognised by others. And no amount of sensitiveness in her about her father could be surprising, Maggie thought. But Tom was too keen-sighted to rest satisfied with such an interpretation. He had seen clearly enough that there was something distinct from anxiety about her father in Maggie's excessive confusion. In trying to recall all the details that could give shape to his suspicions, 
he remembered only lately hearing his mother scold Maggie for walking in the red deeps when the ground was wet, and bringing home shoes clogged with red soil. Still Tom, retaining all his old repulsion for Philip's deformity, shrank from attributing to his sister the probability of feeling more than a friendly interest in such an unfortunate exception to the common run of men. Tom's was a nature which had a sort of superstitious repugnance to everything exceptional. A love for a deformed man would be odious in any woman, in a sister intolerable. But if she had been carrying on any kind of intercourse whatever with Philip, a stop must be put to it at once. She was disobeying her father's strongest feelings and her brother's express commands, besides compromising herself by secret meetings. He left home the next morning in that watchful state of mind which turns the most ordinary course of things into pregnant coincidences. That afternoon, about half-past three o'clock, Tom was standing on the wharf talking with Bob Jakin about the probability of the good ship Adelaide coming in, in a day or two, with results highly important to both of them. "'Eh!' Hey, said Bob, parenthetically, as he looked over the fields on the other side of the river, "'there goes that crooked young Wakem. I know him or his shadow as far off as I can see him. I'm always lighting on him or that side of the river.' A sudden thought seemed to have darted through Tom's mind. "'I must go, Bob,' he said. "'I've something to attend to.' Hurrying off to the warehouse, where he left notice for someone to take his place, he was called away home on peremptory business. The swiftest pace and the shortest road took him to the gate, and he was pausing to open it deliberately that he might walk into the house with an appearance of perfect composure, when Maggie came out at the front door in bonnet and shawl. His conjecture was fulfilled, and he waited for her at the gate. She started violently when she saw him. "'Tom, how is it you are come home? Is there anything the matter?' Maggie spoke in a low, tremulous voice. "'I'm come to walk with you to the Red Deeps, and meet Philip Wakem,' said Tom, the central fold in his brow, which had become habitual with him, deepening as he spoke. Maggie stood helpless, pale and cold. By some means, then, Tom knew everything. At last she said, "'I'm not going,' and turned round. "'Yes, you are, but I want to speak to you first. Where is my father?' "'Out on horseback. And my mother?' "'In the yard, I think, with the poultry. I can go in, then, without her seeing me.' They walked in together, and Tom, entering the parlour, said to Maggie, "'Come in here.' She obeyed, and he closed the door behind her. "'Now, Maggie, tell me this instant everything that has passed between you and Philip Wakem.' "'Does my father know anything?' said Maggie, still trembling. "'No,' said Tom indignantly, "'but he shall know if you attempt to use deceit towards me any further. I don't wish to use deceit, said Maggie, flushing into resentment at hearing this word applied to her conduct. Tell me the whole truth, then. Perhaps you know it. Never mind whether I know it or not. Tell me exactly what has happened, or my father shall know everything. I tell it for my father's sake, then. Yes, it becomes you to profess affection for your father, when you have despised his strongest feelings. "'You never do wrong, Tom,' said Maggie, tauntingly. "'Not if I know it,' answered Tom, with proud sincerity. "'But I have nothing to say to you beyond this. Tell me what has passed between you and Philip Wakem. When did you first meet him in the Red Deeps?' 
"'A year ago,' said Maggie quietly. Tom's severity gave her a certain fund of defiance, and kept her sense of error in abeyance. "'You need to ask me no more questions. We have been friendly a year. We have met and walked together often. He has lent me books.' "'Is that all?' said Tom, looking straight at her with his frown. Maggie paused a moment, then, determined to make an end of Tom's right to accuse her of deceit, she said haughtily, "'No, not quite all. On Saturday he told me that he loved me. I didn't think of it before then. I had only thought of him as an old friend. "'And you encouraged him?' said Tom, with an expression of disgust. "'I told him?' that I loved him too. Tom was silent a few moments, looking on the ground and frowning, with his hands in his pockets. At last he looked up and said coldly, "'Now then, Maggie, there are but two courses for you to take. Either you vow solemnly to me, with your hand on my father's Bible,' that you will never have another meeting or speak another word in private with Philip Wakeham, or you refuse, and I tell my father everything. And this month, when by my exertions he might be made happy once more, you will cause him the blow of knowing that you are a disobedient, deceitful daughter who throws away her own respectability by clandestine meetings with the son of a man that has helped to ruin her father. Choose. Tom ended with cold decision, going up to the large Bible, drawing it forward, and opening it at the fly-leaf where the writing was. It was a crushing alternative to Maggie. Tom, she said, urged out of pride into pleading, don't ask me that. I will promise to give up all intercourse with Philip if you will let me see him once, or even only write to him and explain everything, to give it up as long as it would ever cause any pain to my father. I feel something for Philip, too. He is not happy." I don't wish to hear anything of your feelings. I have said exactly what I mean. Choose, and quickly, lest my mother should come in. If I give you my word, that will be as strong a bond to me as if I laid my hand on the Bible. I don't require that to bind me. Do what I require, said Tom. I can't trust you, Maggie. There is no consistency in you. Put your hand on this Bible and say, I renounce all private speech and intercourse with Philip Wakeham from this time forth. Else you will bring shame on us all and grief on my father. And what is the use of my exerting myself and giving up everything else for the sake of paying my father's debts, if you are to bring madness and vexation on him, just when he might be easy and hold up his head once more. "'Oh, Tom, will the debts be paid soon?' said Maggie, clasping her hands, with a sudden flash of joy across her wretchedness. "'If things turn out as I expect,' said Tom, "'but—' he added, his voice trembling with indignation, while I have been contriving and working that my father may have some peace of mind before he dies, working for the respectability of our family. You have done all you can to destroy both. Maggie felt a deep movement of compunction. For the moment, her mind ceased to contend against what she felt to be cruel and unreasonable, and in her self-blame she justified her brother. "'Tom,' she said in a low voice, "'it was wrong of me. But I was so lonely, and I was sorry for Philip. 
and I think enmity and hatred are wicked.' "'Nonsense,' said Tom. "'Your duty was clear enough. Say no more, but promise in the words I told you.' "'I must speak to Philip once more.' "'You will go with me now and speak to him. "'I give you my word not to meet him or write to him again without your knowledge. "'That is the only thing I will say. "'I will put my hand on the Bible if you like.' "'Say it, then.' Maggie laid her hand on the page of manuscript and repeated the promise. Tom closed the book and said, "'Now let us go.' Not a word was spoken as they walked along. Maggie was suffering in anticipation of what Philip was about to suffer, and dreading the galling words that would fall on him from Tom's lips. But she felt it was in vain to attempt anything but submission. Tom had his terrible clutch on her conscience and her deepest dread. She writhed under the demonstrable truth of the character he had given to her conduct, and yet her whole soul rebelled against it as unfair from its incompleteness. He, meanwhile, felt the impetus of his indignation diverted towards Philip. He did not know how much of an old boyish repulsion and of mere personal pride and animosity was concerned in the bitter severity of the words by which he meant to do the duty of a son and a brother. Tom was not given to inquire subtly into his own motives any more than into other matters of an intangible kind. He was quite sure that his own motives as well as actions were good else he would have had nothing to do with them. Maggie's only hope was that something might for the first time have prevented Philip from coming. Then there would be delay, then she might get Tom's permission to write to him. Her heart beat with double violence when they got under the Scotch firs. It was the last moment of suspense, she thought. Philip always met her soon after she got beyond them, but they passed across the more open green space, and entered the narrow bushy path by the mound. Another turning, and they came so close upon him that both Tom and Philip stopped suddenly within a yard of each other. There was a moment's silence, in which Philip darted a look of inquiry at Maggie's face. He saw an answer there, in the pale parted lips, and the terrified tension of the large eyes. Her imagination, always rushing extravagantly beyond an immediate impression, saw her tall, strong brother grasping the feeble Philip bodily, crushing him and trampling on him. "'Do you call this acting the part of a man and a gentleman, sir?' Tom said, in a voice of harsh scorn, as soon as Philip's eyes were turned on him again. "'What do you mean?' answered Philip haughtily. "'Mean? Stand farther from me, lest I should lay hands on you, and I'll tell you what I mean. I mean taking advantage of a young girl's foolishness and ignorance to get her to have secret meetings with you. I mean daring to trifle with the respectability of a family that has a good and honest name to support. "'I deny that,' interrupted Philip impetuously. "'I could never trifle with anything that affected your sister's happiness. She is dearer to me than she is to you. I honour her more than you can ever honour her. I would give up my life to her.' "'Don't talk high-flown nonsense to me, sir. Do you mean to pretend that you didn't know it would be injurious to her to meet you here, week after week? Do you pretend you had any right to make professions of love to her, even if you had been a fit husband for her, when neither her father nor your father would ever consent to a marriage between you?' 
and you, you to try and worm yourself into the affections of a handsome girl who is not eighteen and has been shut out from the world by her father's misfortunes? That's your crooked notion of honour, is it? I call it base treachery. I call it taking advantage of circumstances to win what's too good for you, what you'd never get by fair means. "'It is manly of you to talk in this way to me,' said Philip bitterly, his whole frame shaken by violent emotions. "'Giants have an immemorable right to stupidity and insolent abuse. "'You are incapable of even understanding what I feel for your sister. "'I feel so much for her that I could even desire to be at friendship with you.' "'I should be very sorry to understand your feelings,' said Tom, with scorching contempt. "'What I wish is that you should understand me, that I should take care of my sister, and that if you dare to make the least attempt to come near her, or to write to her, or to keep the slightest hold on her mind, your puny, miserable body that ought to have put some modesty into your mind, shall not protect you. I'll thrash you, I'll hold you up to public scorn. Who wouldn't laugh at the idea of your turning lover to a fine girl? "'Tom, I will not bear it! I will listen no longer!' Maggie burst out in a convulsed voice. "'Stay, Maggie,' said Philip, making a strong effort to speak. Then, looking at Tom, "'You have dragged your sister here, I suppose, that she may stand by while you threaten and insult me. These naturally seem to you the right means to influence me. But you are mistaken. Let your sister speak. If she says she is bound to give me up, I shall abide by her wishes to the slightest word.' "'It was for my father's sake, Philip.' said Maggie imploringly. Tom threatens to tell my father, and he couldn't bear it. I have promised, I have vowed solemnly, that we will not have any intercourse without my brother's knowledge. It is enough, Maggie. I shall not change, but I wish you to hold yourself entirely free. But trust me, "'Remember that I can never seek for anything but good to what belongs to you.' "'Yes,' said Tom, exasperated by this attitude of Philip's, "'you can talk of seeking good for her and what belongs to her now. "'Did you seek her good before?' "'I did, at some risk, perhaps. "'But I wished her to have a friend for life who would cherish her who would do her more justice than a coarse and narrow-minded brother, that she has always lavished her affections on? Yes, my way of befriending her is different from yours, and I'll tell you what is my way. I'll save her from disobeying and disgracing her father. I'll save her from throwing herself away on you from making herself a laughing-stock, from being flouted by a man like your father because she's not good enough for his son. You know well enough what sort of justice and cherishing you are preparing for her. I'm not to be imposed upon by fine words. I can see what actions mean. Come away, Maggie. He seized Maggie's right wrist as he spoke, and she put out her left hand. Philip clasped it in an instant with one eager look, and then hurried away. Tom and Maggie walked on in silence for some yards. He was still holding her wrist tightly, as if he were compelling a culprit from the scene of action. At last Maggie, with a violent snatch, drew her hand away, and her pent-up, long-gathered irritation burst into utterance. "'Don't suppose that I think you are right, Tom, or that I bow to your will. 
I despise the feelings you have shown in speaking to Philip. I detest your insulting, unmanly allusions to his deformity. You have been reproaching other people all your life. You have been always sure you yourself are right. It is because you have not a mind large enough to see that there is anything better than your own conduct and your own petty aims. Certainly, said Tom coolly, I don't see that your conduct is better or your aims either. If your conduct and Philip Wakeham's conduct has been right, why are you ashamed of its being known? Answer me that. I know what I have aimed at in my conduct, and I've succeeded. Pray what good has your conduct brought to you or anyone else? "'I don't want to defend myself,' said Maggie, still with vehemence. "'I know I've been wrong, often, continually. But yet, sometimes, when I have done wrong, it has been because I have feelings that you would be the better for if you had them. If you were in fault ever, if you had done anything very wrong, I should be sorry for the pain it brought you. I should not want punishment to be heaped on you.' but you have always enjoyed punishing me, you have always been hard and cruel to me, even when I was a little girl and always loved you better than any one else in the world. You would let me go crying to bed without forgiving me. You have no pity. You have no sense of your own imperfection and your own sins. It is a sin to be hard. It is not fitting for a mortal— for a Christian. You are nothing but a Pharisee. You thank God for nothing but your own virtues. You think they are great enough to win you everything else. You have not even a vision of feelings by the side of which your shining virtues are mere darkness. Well, said Tom, with cold scorn, if your feelings are so much better than mine, let me see you show them in some other way than by conduct that's likely to disgrace us all, than by ridiculous flights first into one extreme and then into another. Pray, how have you shown your love that you talk of either to me or my father? By disobeying and deceiving us, I have a different way of showing my affection." "'Because you are a man, Tom, and have power, and can do something in the world.' "'Then, if you can do nothing, submit to those that can.' "'So I will submit to what I acknowledge and feel to be right. "'I will submit even to what is unreasonable from my father, "'but I will not submit to it from you. "'You boast of your virtues.' as if they purchased you a right to be cruel and unmanly, as you've been to-day. Don't suppose I would give up Philip Wakeham in obedience to you? The deformity you insult would make me cling to him and care for him the more. Very well. That is your view of things, said Tom more coldly than ever. You need say no more to show me what a wide distance there is between us. Let us remember that in future, and be silent. Tom went back to St. Ogg's to fulfil an appointment with his uncle Dean, and received directions about a journey on which he was to set out the next morning. Maggie went up to her own room to pour out all that indignant remonstrance against which Tom's mind was close-barred in bitter tears. Then, when the first burst of unsatisfied anger was gone by, came the recollection of that quiet time before the pleasure which had ended in today's misery had perturbed the clearness and simplicity of her life. She used to think in that time that she had made great conquests and won a lasting stand on serene heights above worldly temptations and conflict. And here 
she was down again in the thick of a hot strife with her own and others' passions. Life was not so short then, and perfect rest was not so near as she had dreamed when she was two years younger. There was more struggle for her, perhaps more falling. If she had felt that she was entirely wrong, and that Tom had been entirely right, she could sooner have recovered more inward harmony. But now her penitence and submission were constantly obstructed by resentment that would present itself to her no otherwise than as a just indignation. Her heart bled for Philip. She went on recalling the insults that had been flung at him with so vivid a conception of what he had felt under them that it was almost like a sharp bodily pain to her, making her beat the floor with her foot and tighten her fingers on her palm. And yet, how was it that she was now and then conscious of a certain dim background of relief in the forced separation from Philip? Surely it was only because the sense of a deliverance from concealment was welcome at any cost. End of chapter 5 of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Six of Book Fifth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The Hard Won Triumph. Three weeks later, when Dalcott Mill was at its prettiest moment in all the year, the great chestnuts in blossom and the grass all deep and daisied. Tom Tulliver came home to it earlier than usual in the evening, and as he passed over the bridge he looked with the old deep-rooted affection at the respectable red-brick house which always seemed cheerful and inviting outside, let the rooms be as bare and the hearts as sad as they might be inside. There is a very pleasant light in Tom's blue-grey eyes as he glances at the house windows, that fold in his brow never disappears, but it is not unbecoming. It seems to imply a strength of will that may possibly be without harshness when the eyes and mouth have their gentlest expression. His firm step becomes quicker, and the corners of his mouth rebel against the compression which is meant to forbid a smile. The eyes in the parlour were not turned towards the bridge just then, and the group there was sitting in unexpectant silence, Mr. Tulliver in his armchair, tired with a long ride, and ruminating with a worn look fixed chiefly on Maggie, who was bending over her sewing while her mother was making the tea. They all looked up with surprise when they heard the well-known foot— "'Why, what's up now, Tom?' said his father. "'You're a bit earlier than usual.' "'Oh, there was nothing more for me to do, so I came away. "'Well, mother?' Tom went up to his mother and kissed her, a sign of unusual good humour with him. Hardly a word or look had passed between him and Maggie in all the three weeks— but his usual incommunicativeness at home prevented this from being noticeable to their parents. "'Father,' said Tom, when they had finished tea, "'do you know exactly how much money there is in the tin box?' "'Only a hundred and ninety-three pound,' said Mr. Tulliver. "'You've brought less a late, but young fellows like to have their own way with their money.' "'Though I didn't do as I liked before I was of age,' he spoke with rather timid discontent. "'Are you quite sure that's the sum, father?' said Tom. "'I wish you would take the trouble to fetch the tin box down. I think you have perhaps made a mistake.' "'How should I make a mistake?' said his father sharply. "'I've counted it often enough, 
but I can fetch it if you won't believe me. It was always an incident Mr. Tulliver liked in his gloomy life, to fetch the tin box and count the money. "'Don't go out of the room, mother,' said Tom, as he saw her moving when his father was gone upstairs. "'And isn't Maggie to go?' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'because somebody must take away the things.' "'Just as she likes,' said Tom indifferently. That was a cutting word to Maggie. Her heart had leaped with the sudden conviction that Tom was going to tell their father the debts could be paid, and Tom would have let her be absent when that news was told. But she carried away the tray and came back immediately. The feeling of injury on her own behalf could not predominate at that moment. Tom drew to the corner of the table near his father, when the tin box was set down and opened, and the red evening light falling on them made conspicuous the worn, sour gloom of the dark-eyed father and the suppressed joy in the face of the fair-complexioned son. The mother and Maggie sat at the other end of the table, the one in blank patience, the other in palpitating expectation. Mr. Tulliver counted out the money, setting it in order on the table, and then said, glancing sharply at Tom, "'There, now, you see, I was right enough.' He paused, looking at the money with bitter despondency. "'There's more than a three hundred wanting. It'll be a fine while before I can save that. Losing that forty-two pound with a corn was a sore job. This world's been too many for me. It's took four year to lay this by. It's much if I'm above ground for another four year. I must trust unto you to pay em, he went on with a trembling voice. If you keep her the same mind now you're coming of age, but you're like enough to bury me first. He looked up in Tom's face with a querulous desire for some assurance. No, father, said Tom speaking with energetic decision, though there was tremor discernible in his voice too. "'You will live to see the debts all paid. You shall pay them with your own hand.' His tone implied something more than mere hopefulness or resolution. A slight electric shock seemed to pass through Mr. Tulliver, and he kept his eyes fixed on Tom with a look of eager inquiry, while Maggie, unable to restrain herself, rushed to her father's side and knelt down by him. Tom was silent a little while before he went on. A good while ago my uncle Glegg lent me a little money to trade with, and that has answered. I have three hundred and twenty pounds in the bank. His mother's arms were round his neck as soon as the last words were uttered, and she said, half crying, "'Oh, my boy, I knew you'd make everything right again when you got a man!' But his father was silent. The flood of emotion hemmed in all power of speech. Both Tom and Maggie were struck with fear, lest the shock of joy might even be fatal. But the blessed relief of tears came." The broad chest heaved, the muscles of the face gave way, and the grey-haired man burst into loud sobs. The fit of weeping gradually subsided, and he sat quiet, recovering the regularity of his breathing. At last he looked up at his wife and said, in a gentle tone, "'Bessie, you must come and kiss me now. The lad has made you amends. You'll see a bit of comfort again, belike. When she had kissed him, and he had held her hand a minute, his thoughts went back to the money. "'I wish you'd brought me the money to look at, Tom,' he said, fingering the sovereigns on the table. "'I should have felt surer.' "'You shall see it to-morrow, father,' said Tom. 
"'My Uncle Dean has appointed the creditors to meet to-morrow at the Golden Lion, "'and he has ordered a dinner for them at two o'clock. "'My Uncle Glegg and he will both be there. "'It was advertised in the messenger on Saturday.' "'Then wake em, nose aunt, said Mr. Tulliver, his eye kindling with triumphant fire. "'Ah!' he went on, with a long-drawn guttural enunciation, taking out his snuff-box, the only luxury he had left himself, and tapping it with something of his old air of defiance. "'I'll get from under his thumb now, though I must leave the old mill.' "'I thought I could have held out to die here, but I can't. "'We've got a glass of nothing in the house, have we, Bessie?' "'Yes,' said Mrs. Tulliver, drawing out her much-reduced bunch of keys. "'There's some brandy Sister Dean brought me when I was ill. "'Get it me, then, get it me. I feel a bit weak.' "'Tom, my lad,' he said, in a stronger voice when he had taken some brandy and water. "'You shall make a speech to em. I'll tell em it's you as got the best part of the money. They'll see I'm honest at last, and have got an honest son. Ah, Wakem would be fine and glad to have a son like mine, a fine straight fellow, instead of that poor crooked creature.' "'You'll prosper in the world, my lad. "'You'll maybe see the day when Wakem and his son'll be a round or two below you. "'You'll like enough be taken into partnership as your Uncle Dean was before you. "'You're in the right way for it. "'And then there's nothing to hinder your getting rich. "'And if ever you're rich enough, mind this, try and get the old mill again.' Mr. Tulliver threw himself back in his chair. His mind, which had so long been the home of nothing but bitter discontent and foreboding, suddenly filled by the magic of joy with visions of good fortune. But some subtle influence prevented him from foreseeing the good fortune as happening to himself. "'Shake hands with me, my lad,' he said, suddenly putting out his hand. "'It's a great thing when a man can be proud as he's got a good son. "'I've had that look.' "'Tom never lived to taste another moment so delicious as that, "'and Maggie couldn't help forgetting her own grievances. "'Tom was good, and in the sweet humility that springs in us all "'in moments of true admiration and gratitude,' she felt that the faults he had to pardon in her had never been redeemed as his faults were. She felt no jealousy this evening that for the first time she seemed to be thrown into the background in her father's mind. There was much more talk before bedtime. Mr. Tulliver naturally wanted to hear all the particulars of Tom's trading adventures, and he listened with growing excitement and delight. He was curious to know what had been said on every occasion, if possible what had been thought, and Bob Jakin's part in the business threw him into peculiar outbursts of sympathy with the triumphant knowingness of that remarkable packman. Bob's juvenile history, so far as it had come under Mr. Tulliver's knowledge, was recalled with that sense of astonishing promise it displayed, which is observable in all reminiscences of the childhood of great men. It was well that there was this interest of narrative to keep under the vague but fierce sense of triumph over Wakem, which would otherwise have been the channel his joy would have rushed into with dangerous force. Even as it was, that feeling from time to time gave threats of its ultimate mastery in sudden bursts of irrelevant exclamation. It was long before Mr. Tulliver got to sleep that night, and the sleep when it came was filled with vivid dreams. At half-past five o'clock in the morning, when Mrs. Tulliver was already rising, He alarmed her by starting up with a sort of smothered shout, and looking round in a bewildered way at the walls of the bedroom. "'What's the matter, Mr. Tulliver?' said his wife. 
He looked at her still with a puzzled expression, and said at last, "'Ah, I was dreaming. Did I make a noise? I thought I'd got hold of him.' End of chapter 6 of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 7 of Book 5th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham a day of reckoning. Mr. Tulliver was an essentially sober man, able to take his glass and not averse to it, but never exceeding the bounds of moderation. He had naturally an active hotspur temperament, which did not crave liquid fire to set it aglow. His impetuosity was usually equal to an exciting occasion, without any such reinforcements, and his desire for the brandy and water implied that the too sudden joy had fallen with a dangerous shock on a frame depressed by four years of gloom and unaccustomed hard fare. But that first doubtful, tottering moment passed. He seemed to gather strength with his gathering excitement, and the next day when he was seated at table with his creditors, his eye kindling and his cheek flushed with the consciousness that he was about to make an honourable figure once more. He looked more like the proud, confident, warm-hearted and warm-tempered Tulliver of old times, than might have seemed possible to any one who had met him a week before, riding along as had been his wont for the last four years since the sense of failure and debt had been upon him, with his head hanging down casting brief, unwilling looks on those who forced themselves on his notice. He made his speech, asserting his honest principles with his old confident eagerness, alluding to the rascals and the luck that had been against him, but that he had triumphed over, to some extent, by hard efforts and the aid of a good son and winding up with the story of how Tom had got the best part of the needful money. But the streak of irritation and hostile triumph seemed to melt for a little while into purer fatherly pride and pleasure, when Tom's health having been proposed, and Uncle Dean having taken occasion to say a few words of eulogy on his general character and conduct, Tom himself got up and made the single speech of his life. It could hardly have been briefer. He thanked the gentlemen for the honour they had done him. He was glad that he had been able to help his father in proving his integrity and regaining his honest name, and for his own part he hoped he should never undo that work and disgrace that name. But the applause that followed was so great, and Tom looked so gentlemanly as well as tall and straight, that Mr. Tulliver remarked in an explanatory manner to his friends on his right and left that he had spent a deal of money on his son's education. The party broke up in very sober fashion at five o'clock. Tom remained in St. Ogg's to attend to some business, and Mr. Tulliver mounted his horse to go home, and describe the memorable things that had been said and done, to poor Bessie and the little wench. The air of excitement that hung about him was but faintly due to good cheer or any stimulus but the potent wine of triumphant joy. He did not choose any back street to-day, but rode slowly, with uplifted head and free glances, along the principal street, all the way to the bridge. Why did he not happen to meet Wakeham? The want of that coincidence vexed him, and set his mind at work in an irritating way. Perhaps Wakeham was gone out of town to-day on purpose, to avoid seeing or hearing anything of an honourable action, which might well cause him some unpleasant twinges. 
if Wakem were to meet him then, Mr. Tulliver would look straight at him, and the rascal would perhaps be forsaken a little by his cool, domineering impudence. He would know by and by that an honest man was not going to serve him any longer, and lend his honesty to fill a pocket already overfull of dishonest gains. Perhaps the luck was beginning to turn. Perhaps the devil didn't always hold the best cards in this world. Simmering in this way, Mr. Tulliver approached the yard gates of Dalcott Mill, near enough to see a well-known figure coming out of them on a fine black horse. They met about fifty yards from the gates, between the great chestnuts and elms and the high bank. Tulliver, said Wakem abruptly, in a haughtier tone than usual, what a fool's trick you did, spreading those hard lumps on that far close. I told you how it would be, but you men never learn to farm with any method. Oh, said Tulliver, suddenly boiling up, get somebody else to farm for you, then, as I'll ask you to teach him. "'You have been drinking, I suppose,' said Wakem, really believing that this was the meaning of Tulliver's flushed face and sparkling eyes. "'No, I've not been drinking,' said Tulliver. "'I want no drinking to help me make up my mind, as I'll serve no longer under a scoundrel.' "'Very well. You may leave my premises to-morrow, then.' Hold your insolent tongue, and let me pass. Tulliver was backing his horse across the road to hem Wakem in. No, I shan't let you pass, said Tulliver, getting fiercer. I shall tell you what I think of you first. You're too big a rascal to get hanged, you— Let me pass, you ignorant brute, or I'll ride over you. Mr. Tulliver, spurring his horse and raising his whip, made a rush forward, and Wakem's horse, rearing and staggering backward, threw his rider from the saddle and sent him sideways on the ground. Wakem had had the presence of mind to loose the bridle at once, and as the horse only staggered a few paces and then stood still, he might have risen and remounted without more inconvenience than a bruise and a shake. But before he could rise, Tulliver was off his horse too. The sight of the long-hated, predominant man down and in his power threw him into a frenzy of triumphant vengeance, which seemed to give him preternatural agility and strength. He rushed on Wakem, who was in the act of trying to recover his feet, grasped him by the left arm so as to press Wakem's whole weight on the right arm which rested on the ground, and flogged him fiercely across the back with his riding-whip. Wakem shouted for help, but no help came, until a woman's scream was heard, and the cry of, "'Father! Father!' Suddenly Wakem felt something had arrested Mr. Tulliver's arm, for the flogging ceased and the grasp on his own arm was relaxed. "'Get away with you! Go!' said Tulliver angrily. But it was not to Wakem that he spoke. Slowly the lawyer rose, and as he turned his head, saw that Tulliver's arms were being held by a girl, rather by the fear of hurting the girl that clung to him with all her young might. "'Oh, look! Mother! Come and help Mr. Wakem!' Maggie cried, as she heard the longed-for footsteps. "'Help me on to that low horse,' said Wakem to Luke. "'Then I shall perhaps manage. Though, confound it, I think this arm is sprained.' With some difficulty Wakem was heaved on to Tulliver's horse, then he turned towards the miller and said with white rage, "'You'll suffer for this, sir. Your daughter is a witness that you've assaulted me.' 
"'I don't care,' said Mr. Tulliver, in a thick, fierce voice. "'Go and show your back, and tell em I thrashed you. Tell em I've made things a bit more even in the world.' "'Ride my horse home with me,' said Wakem to Luke. "'By the Tofton Ferry, not through the town.' "'Father, come in,' said Maggie imploringly. Then, seeing that Wakem had ridden off, and that no further violence was possible, she slackened her hold, and burst into hysteric sobs, while poor Mrs. Tulliver stood by in silence, quivering with fear. But Maggie became conscious that as she was slackening her hold, her father was beginning to grasp her and lean on her. The surprise checked her sobs. "'I feel ill, faintish,' he said. "'Help me in, Bessie. I'm giddy. I've a pain in the head.' He walked in slowly, propped by his wife and daughter, and tottered into his armchair. The almost purple flush had given way to paleness, and his hand was cold. "'Hadn't we better send for the doctor?' said Mrs. Tulliver. He seemed to be too faint and suffering to hear her, but presently, when she said to Maggie, "'Go and see for somebody to fetch the doctor,' he looked up at her with full comprehension and said, "'Doctor? No, no, doctor. It's my head, that's all. Help me to bed.' sad ending to the day that had risen on them all like a beginning of better times but mingled seed must bear a mingled crop in half an hour after his father had lain down tom came home bob jakin was with him come to congratulate the old master not without some excusable pride that he had had his share in bringing about Mr. Tom's good luck. And Tom had thought his father would like nothing better as a finish to the day than a talk with Bob. But now Tom could only spend the evening in gloomy expectation of the unpleasant consequences that must follow on this mad outbreak of his father's long-smothered hate. After the painful news had been told, he sat in silence. He had not spirit or inclination to tell his mother and sister anything about the dinner. They hardly cared to ask it. Apparently the mingled thread in the web of their life was so curiously twisted together that there could be no joy without a sorrow coming close upon it. Tom was dejected by the thought that his exemplary effort must always be baffled by the wrongdoing of others. Maggie was living through, over and over again, the agony of the moment in which she had rushed to throw herself on her father's arm, with a vague, shuddering foreboding of wretched scenes to come. Not one of the three felt any particular alarm about Mr. Tulliver's health. The symptoms did not recall his former dangerous attack, and it seemed only a necessary consequence that his violent passion and effort of strength, after many hours of unusual excitement, should have made him feel ill. Rest would probably cure him. Tom, tired out by his active day, fell asleep soon and slept soundly. It seemed to him as if he had only just come to bed, when he waked to see his mother standing by him in the grey light of early morning. "'My boy, you must get up this minute. I've sent for the doctor, and your father wants you and Maggie to come to him.' "'Is he worse, mother?' "'He's been very ill all night with his head, but he doesn't say it's worse. He only said sudden—' "'Bessie, fetch the boy and girl. Tell him to make haste.' 
Maggie and Tom threw on their clothes hastily in the chill grey light, and reached their father's room almost at the same moment. He was watching for them with an expression of pain on his brow, but with sharp and anxious consciousness in his eyes. Mrs. Tulliver stood at the foot of the bed, frightened and trembling, looking worn and aged from disturbed rest. Maggie was at the bedside first, but her father's glance was towards Tom, who came and stood next to her. "'Tom, my lad, it's come upon me, as I shan't get up again. This world's been too many for me, my lad, but you've done what you could to make things a bit even. Shake hands with me again, my lad, before I go away from you. The father and son clasped hands and looked at each other an instant. Then Tom said, trying to speak firmly, "'Have you any wish, father, that I can fulfil when—' "'Aye, my lad, you'll try and get the old mill back.' "'Yes, father. "'And there's your mother. "'You'll try and make her amends all you can for my bad luck.' "'And there's the little wench.' "'The father turned his eyes on Maggie, "'with a still more eager look, "'while she, with a bursting heart, "'sank on her knees to be closer to the dear, "'time-worn face which had been present with her "'through long years as the sign of her deepest love "'and hardest trial. "'You must take care of her, Tom. "'Don't you fret, my wench.' "'There'll come somebody as'll love you and take your part, "'and you must be good to her, my lad. "'I was good to my sister. "'Kiss me, Maggie. "'Come, Bessie. "'You'll manage to pay for a brick grave, Tom, "'so as your mother and me can lie together.' "'He looked away from them all when he had said this, "'and lay silent for some minutes.' while they stood watching him, not daring to move. The morning light was growing clearer for them, and they could see the heaviness gathering in his face and the dullness in his eyes. But at last he looked towards Tom and said, "'I had my turn. I beat him. That was nothing but fair. I never wanted anything but what was fair.' "'But father, dear father,' said Maggie, in an unspeakable anxiety predominating over her grief, "'you forgive him? You forgive every one now?' He did not move his eyes to look at her, but he said, "'No, my wench, I don't forgive him. What's forgiving to do? I can't love a rascal.' His voice had become thicker, but he wanted to say more, and moved his lips again and again, struggling in vain to speak. At length the words forced their way. "'Does God forgive rascals?' "'But if he does, he won't be hard with me.' His hands moved uneasily, as if he wanted them to remove some obstruction that weighed upon him. Two or three times there fell from him some broken words. "'This world's too many. Honest man, puzzling.' Soon they merged into mere mutterings. The eyes had ceased to discern, and then came the final silence but not of death. For an hour or more the chest heaved, the loud hard breathing continued, getting gradually slower as the cold dews gathered on the brow. At last there was total stillness, and poor Tulliver's dimly lighted soul had forever ceased to be vexed with the painful riddle of this world. Help was come now. Luke and his wife were there, 
and Mr. Turnbull had arrived, too late for everything but to say, "'This is death!' Tom and Maggie went downstairs together, into the room, where their father's place was empty. Their eyes turned to the same spot, and Maggie spoke. "'Tom, forgive me. Let us always love each other.' And they clung and wept together. End of chapter 7 of Book 5th End of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 1 of Book 6th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Book Sixth The Great Temptation. Chapter One A Duet in Paradise. The well furnished drawing room with the open grand piano and the pleasant outlook down a sloping garden to a boat-house by the side of the floss, is Mr. Deans. The neat little lady in mourning, whose light brown ringlets are falling over the coloured embroidery with which her fingers are busy, is of course Lucy Dean, and the fine young man who is leaning down from his chair to snap the scissors in the extremely abbreviated face of the King Charles lying on the young lady's feet, is no other than Mr. Stephen Guest, whose diamond ring, attar of roses, and air of nonchalant leisure at twelve o'clock in the day, are the graceful and odoriferous result of the largest oil-mill and the most extensive wharf in St. Ogg's. There is an apparent triviality in the action with the scissors, but your discernment perceives at once that there is a design in it which makes it eminently worthy of a large-headed, long-limbed young man. For you see that Lucy wants the scissors, and is compelled, reluctant as she may be, to shake her ringlets back, raise her soft hazel eyes, smile playfully down on the face that is so very nearly on a level with her knee, and holding out her little shell-pink palm to say, "'My scissors, please!' if you can renounce the great pleasure of persecuting my poor Minnie. The foolish scissors have slipped too far over the knuckles, it seems, and Hercules holds out his entrapped fingers hopelessly. Confound the scissors! The oval lies the wrong way. Please draw them off for me. Draw them off with your other hand, says Miss Lucy roguishly. "'Oh, but that's my left hand. I'm not left-handed.' Lucy laughs, and the scissors are drawn off with gentle touches from tiny tips, which naturally dispose Mr. Stephen for a repetition da capo. Accordingly, he watches for the release of the scissors, that he may get them into his possession again. "'No, no,' said Lucy, sticking them in her band. "'You shall not have my scissors again. "'You have strained them already. "'Now don't set Minnie growling again. "'Sit up and behave properly, "'and then I will tell you some news.' "'What is that?' said Stephen, "'throwing himself back "'and hanging his right arm over the corner of his chair. "'He might have been sitting for his portrait, "'which would have represented a rather striking young man "'of five-and-twenty with a square forehead, short dark brown hair standing erect, with a slight wave at the end, like a thick crop of corn, and a half-ardent, half-sarcastic glance from under his well-marked horizontal eyebrows. Is it a very important news? Yes, very. Guess. You are going to change Minnie's diet, and give him three ratafias soaked in a dessert spoonful of cream daily. Quite wrong. Well, then, 
Uh, Dr. Ken has been preaching against Buckram, and you ladies have all been sending him around Robin, saying, "'This is a hard doctrine. Who can bear it?' "'For shame,' said Lucy, adjusting her little mouth gravely. "'It is rather dull of you not to guess my news, because it is about something I mentioned to you not very long ago.' "'But you have mentioned many things to me not long ago.' Does your feminine tyranny require that when you say the thing you mean is one of several things, I should know it immediately by that mark? Yes, I know you think I'm silly. I think you are perfectly charming. And my silliness is part of my charm? I didn't say that. But I know you like women to be rather insipid. Philip Wakem betrayed you. He said so one day when you were not here. Oh, I know Phil is fierce on that point. He makes it quite a personal matter. I think he must be lovesick for some unknown lady, some exalted Beatrice whom he met abroad. By the by, said Lucy, pausing in her work, it has just occurred to me that I have never found out whether my cousin Maggie will object to see Philip as her brother does. Tom will not enter a room where Philip is if he knows it. Perhaps Maggie may be the same, and then we shan't be able to sing our glees, shall we? What? Is your cousin coming to stay with you? said Stephen, with a look of slight annoyance. Yes, that was my news, which you have forgotten. She's going to leave her situation, where she has been nearly two years, poor thing, ever since her father's death and she will stay with me a month or two. Many months, I hope. And I am bound to be pleased at that news. Oh, no, not at all, said Lucy, with a little air of pique. I am pleased, but that, of course, is no reason why you should be pleased. There is no girl in the world I love so well as my cousin Maggie. And you will be inseparable, I suppose, when she comes. There will be no possibility of a tete-a-tete -tete with you any more, unless you can find an admirer for her, who will pair off with her occasionally. What is the ground of dislike to Philip? He might have been a resource. It is a family quarrel with Philip's father. There were very painful circumstances, I believe. I never quite understood them, or knew them all. My uncle Tulliver was unfortunate, and lost all his property, and I think he considered Mr. Wakem was somehow the cause of it. Mr. Wakem bought Dorcott Mill, my uncle's old place, where he always lived. You must remember my uncle Tulliver, don't you? No, said Stephen, with rather supercilious indifference. I've always known the name, and uh, I dare say I knew the man by sight apart from his name. I know half the names and faces in the neighbourhood in that detached, disjointed way. He was a very hot-tempered man. I remember when I was a little girl and used to go to see my cousins, he often frightened me by talking as if he were angry. Papa told me there was a dreadful quarrel the very day before my uncle's death between him and Mr. Wakem, but it was hushed up. That was when you were in London. Papa says my uncle was quite mistaken in many ways. His mind had become embittered. But Tom and Maggie must naturally feel it very painful to be reminded of these things. They have had so much, so very much trouble. Maggie was at school with me six years ago, when she was fetched away because of her father's misfortunes, and she has hardly had any pleasure since, I think. She has been in a dreary situation in a school since her uncle's death, because she is determined to be independent, and not live with Aunt Pullet, and I could hardly wish her to come to me then, because dear Mamma was ill, and everything was so sad. That is why I want her to come to me now, and have a long, long holiday." "'Very sweet and angelic of you,' said Stephen. 
looking at her with an admiring smile, and all the more so if she has the conversational qualities of her mother. "'Poor auntie, you are cruel to ridicule her. She is very valuable to me, I know. She manages the house beautifully, much better than any stranger would. And she was a great comfort to me in mamma's illness. Yes, but in point of companionship, one would prefer that she should be represented by her brandy cherries and cream cakes. I think with a shudder that her daughter will always be present in person and have no agreeable proxies of that kind. A fat, blonde girl with round blue eyes who will stare at us silently. Oh, yes, exclaimed Lucy, laughing wickedly and clapping her hands. That is just my cousin Maggie. You must have seen her. No, indeed. I'm only guessing what Mrs. Tulliver's daughter must be. And then, if she is to banish Philip, our only apology for a tenor, that will be an additional bore. But I hope that may not be. I think I will ask you to call on Philip and tell him Maggie is coming to-morrow. He is quite aware of Tom's feeling, and always keeps out of his way. So he will understand, if you tell him, that I asked you to warn him not to come until I write to ask him. I think you had better write a pretty note for me to take. Phil is so sensitive, you know, the least thing might frighten him off coming at all, and we had hard work to get him. I can never induce him to come to the park. He doesn't like my sisters, I think. It is only your fairy touch that can lay his ruffled feathers. Stephen mastered the little hand that was straying towards the table, and touched it lightly with his lips. Little Lucy felt very proud and happy. She and Stephen were in that stage of courtship which makes the most exquisite moment of youth, the freshest blossom time of passion, when each is sure of the other's love, but no formal declaration has been made, and all is mutual divination, exalting the most trivial word, the lightest gesture, into thrills delicate and delicious as wafted jasmine scent. The explicitness of an engagement wears off this finest edge of susceptibility. It is jasmine gathered and presented in a large bouquet. But it is really odd that you should have hit so exactly on Maggie's appearance and manners, said the cunning Lucy, moving to reach her desk, because she might have been like her brother, you know, and Tom has not round eyes, and he is as far as possible from staring at people. Oh, I suppose he is like the father. He seems to be as proud as Lucifer, not a brilliant companion, though, I should think. I like Tom. He gave me my minnie when I lost Lolo, and Papa is very fond of him. He says Tom has excellent principles. It was through him that his father was able to pay all his debts before he died. Oh, I've heard about that. I heard your father and mine talking about it a little while ago, after dinner, in one of their interminable discussions about business. They think of doing something for young Tulliver. He saved them from a considerable loss by riding home in some marvellous way, like Turpin, to bring them news about the stoppage of a bank or something of that sort. But I was rather drowsy at the time. Stephen rose from his seat, and sauntered to the piano, humming in falsetto. Graceful consort! as he turned over the volume of The Creation, which stood open on the desk. "'Come and sing this,' he said, and he saw Lucy rising. "'What graceful consort! I don't think it suits your voice.' "'Never mind, it exactly suits my feeling, which, Philip will have it, is the grand element of good singing. I notice men with indifferent voices are usually of that opinion.' Philip burst into one of his invectives against the creation the other day, 
said Lucy, seating herself at the piano. He says it has a sort of sugared complacency and flattering make-believe in it, as if it were written for the birthday fate of a German Grand Duke. Oh, pooh! he is the fallen Adam with a soured temper. We are Adam and Eve unfallen, in paradise. Now then, the recitative, for the sake of the moral. You will sing the whole duty of women, and from obedience grows my pride and happiness. Oh, no, I shall not respect an Adam who drags the tempo as you will, said Lucy, beginning to play the duet. Surely the only courtship, unshaken by doubts and fears, must be that in which the lovers can sing together. The sense of mutual fitness that springs from the two deep notes fulfilling expectation just at the right moment between the notes of the silvery soprano, from the very perfect accord of descending thirds and fifths, from the preconcerted loving chase of a fugue, is likely enough to supersede any immediate demand for less impassioned forms of agreement. The contralto will not care to catechise the bass, the tenor will foresee no embarrassing dearth of remark in evenings spent with the lovely soprano. In the provinces, too, where music was so scarce in that remote time, how could the musical people avoid falling in love with each other? Even political principle must have been in danger of relaxation under such circumstances, and a violin, faithful to rotten boroughs, must have been tempted to fraternise in a demoralising way with a reforming violoncello. In this case the linnet-throated soprano and the full-toned bass singing, With thee delight is ever new, with thee is life incessant bliss, believed what they sang all the more because they sang it. "'Now for Raphael's great song,' said Lucy, when they had finished the duet. "'You do the heavy beasts to perfection.' "'That sounds complimentary,' said Stephen, looking at his watch. "'By Jove, it's nearly half-past one. Well, I can just sing this.' Stephen delivered with admirable ease the deep notes representing the tread of the heavy beasts, but when a singer has an audience of two, there is room for divided sentiments. Minnie's mistress was charmed, but Minnie, who had entrenched himself trembling in his basket as soon as the music began, found this thunder so little to his taste that he leaped out and scampered under the remotest chiffonier as the most eligible place in which a small dog could await the crack of doom. "'Adieu, graceful consort,' said Stephen, buttoning his coat across when he had done singing, and smiling down from his tall height with the air of rather a patronising lover at the little lady on the music-stool. "'My bliss is not incessant, for I must gallop home. I promised to be there at lunch.' "'You will not be able to call on Philip, then. It is of no consequence.' I have said everything in my note. You will be engaged with your cousin to-morrow, I suppose? Yes, we are going to have a little family party. My cousin Tom will dine with us, and poor Auntie will have her two children together for the first time. It will be very pretty. I think a great deal about it. But I may come the next day. Oh, yes! Come and be introduced to my cousin Maggie. "'though you can hardly be said not to have seen her, "'you have described her so well. "'Good-bye, then.' "'And there was that slight pressure of the hands "'and momentary meeting of the eyes, "'which will often leave a little lady "'with a slight flush and smile on her face "'that do not subside immediately when the door is closed, "'and with an inclination to walk up and down the room "'rather than to seat herself quietly at her embroidery, or other rational and improving occupation. At least this was the effect on Lucy, and you will not, I hope, 
consider it an indication of vanity predominating over more tender impulses that she just glanced in the chimney-glass as her walk brought her near to it the desire to know that one has not looked an absolute fright during a few hours of conversation may be construed as lying within the bounds of a laudable benevolent consideration for others and lucy had so much of this benevolence in her nature that i am inclined to think her small egoisms were impregnated with it just as there are people not altogether unknown to you whose small benevolences have a predominant and somewhat rank odour of egoism even now that she is walking up and down with a little triumphant flutter of her girlish heart at the sense that she is loved by the person of chief consequence in her small world you may see in her hazel eyes an ever-present sunny benignity in which the momentary harmless flashes of personal vanity are quite lost and if she is happy in thinking of her lover it is because the thought of him mingles readily with all the gentle affections and good-natured offices with which she fills her peaceful days even now her mind with that instantaneous alternation which makes two currents of feeling or imagination seem simultaneous is glancing continually from stephen to the preparations she has only half finished in maggie's room cousin maggie should be treated as well as the grandest lady visitor nay better for she should have lucy's best prints and drawings in her bedroom and the very finest bouquet of spring flowers on her table maggie would enjoy all that she was so fond of pretty things and there was poor aunt tulliver that no one made any account of she was to be surprised with the present of a cap of superlative quality and to have her health drunk in a gratifying manner for which lucy was going to lay a plot with her father this evening clearly she had not time to indulge in long reveries about her own happy love affairs with this thought she walked towards the door but paused there what's the matter then minnie she said stooping in answer to some whimpering of that small quadruped and lifting his glossy head against her pink cheek did you think i was going without you come then let us go and see sindbad sindbad was lucy's chestnut horse that she always fed with her own hand when he was turned out in the paddock she was fond of feeding dependent creatures and knew the private tastes of all the animals about the house delighting in the little rippling sounds of her canaries when their beaks were busy with fresh seed and in the small nibbling pleasures of certain animals which lest she should appear too trivial i will here call the more familiar rodents was not stephen guest right in his decided opinion that this slim maiden of eighteen was quite the sort of wife a man would not be likely to repent of marrying a woman who was loving and thoughtful for other women not giving them judas kisses with eyes askance on their welcome defects but with real care and vision for their half-hidden pains and mortifications with long ruminating enjoyment of little pleasures prepared for them perhaps the emphasis of his admiration did not fall precisely on this rarest quality in her perhaps he approved his own choice of her chiefly because she did not strike him as a remarkable rarity a man likes his wife to be pretty well lucy was pretty but not to a maddening extent a man likes his wife to be accomplished gentle affectionate and not stupid and lucy had all these qualifications stephen was not surprised to find himself in love with her and was conscious of excellent judgment in preferring her to miss leyburn the daughter of the county member although lucy was the only daughter of his father's subordinate partner besides 
he had had to defy and overcome a slight unwillingness and disappointment in his father and sisters, a circumstance which gives a young man an agreeable consciousness of his own dignity. Stephen was aware that he had sense and independence enough to choose the wife who was likely to make him happy, unbiased by any indirect considerations. He meant to choose Lucy. She was a little darling, and exactly the sort of woman he had always most admired. End of chapter one of book sixth. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter two of Book Sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. First Impressions "'He is very clever, Maggie,' said Lucy. She was kneeling on a footstool at Maggie's feet after placing that dark lady in the large crimson velvet chair. "'I feel sure you will like him. I hope you will.' "'I shall be very difficult to please,' said Maggie, smiling, and holding up one of Lucy's long curls, that the sunlight might shine through it. "'A gentleman who thinks he is good enough for Lucy must expect to be sharply criticised. "'Indeed he is a great deal too good for me, and sometimes when he is away I almost think it can't really be that he loves me. But I can never doubt it when he is with me, though I couldn't bear any one but you to know that I feel in that way, Maggie. "'Oh, then, if I disapprove of him, you can give him up, since you are not engaged,' said Maggie, with playful gravity. "'I would rather not be engaged. When people are engaged, they begin to think of being married soon,' said Lucy, too thoroughly preoccupied to notice Maggie's joke and I should like everything to go on for a long while just as it is. Sometimes I am quite frightened lest Stephen should say that he has spoken to papa, and from something that fell from papa the other day I feel sure he and Mr. Guest are expecting that. And Stephen's sisters are all very civil to me now. At first I think they didn't like his paying me attention, and that was natural." It does seem out of keeping that I should ever live in a great place like the Park House, such a little insignificant thing as I am. But people are not expected to be large in proportion to the houses they live in, like snails, said Maggie, laughing. Pray, are Mr. Guest's sisters giantesses? Oh, no, and not handsome. That is not very, said Lucy, half penitent at this uncharitable remark but he is. At least he is generally considered very handsome. Though you are unable to share that opinion? Oh, I don't know, said Lucy, blushing pink over brow and neck. It is a bad plan to raise expectation. You will perhaps be disappointed. But I have prepared a charming surprise for him. I shall have a glorious laugh against him. I shall not tell you what it is, though." Lucy rose from her knees and went to a little distance, holding her pretty head on one side, as if she had been arranging Maggie for a portrait, and wished to judge of the general effect. "'Stand up a moment, Maggie.' "'What is your pleasure now?' said Maggie, smiling languidly, as she rose from her chair and looked down on her slight aerial cousin, whose figure was quite subordinate to her faultless drapery of silk and crape. Lucy kept her contemplative attitude a moment or two in silence, and then said, "'I can't think what witchery it is in you, Maggie, that makes you look best in shabby clothes, though you really must have a new dress now. But do you know, last night I was trying to fancy you in a handsome, fashionable dress, and do what I would, 
that old limp merino would come back as the only right thing for you i wonder if marie antoinette looked all the grander when her gown was darned at the elbows now if i were to put anything shabby on i should be quite unnoticeable i should be a mere rag oh quite said maggie with mock gravity you would be able to be swept out of the room with the cobwebs and carpet dust and to find yourself under the grate like cinderella mayn't i sit down now yes now you may said lucy laughing then with an air of serious reflection unfastening her large jet brooch but you must change brooches maggie that little butterfly looks silly on you but won't that mar the charming effect of my consistent shabbiness said maggie seating herself submissively while lucy knelt again and unfastened the contemptible butterfly i wish my mother were of your opinion for she was fretting last night because this is my best frock i've been saving my money to pay for some lessons i shall never get a better situation without more accomplishments maggie gave a little sigh now don't put on that sad look again said lucy pinning the large brooch below maggie's fine throat you're forgetting that you've left that dreary schoolroom behind you and have no little girl's clothes to mend yes said maggie it is with me as i used to think it would be with the poor uneasy white bear i saw at the show i thought he must have got so stupid with the habit of turning backward and forward in that narrow space that he would keep doing it if they set him free one gets a bad habit of being unhappy but i shall put you under a discipline of pleasure that will make you lose that bad habit said lucy sticking the black butterfly absently in her own collar while her eyes met maggie's affectionately you dear tiny thing said maggie in one of her bursts of loving admiration you enjoy other people's happiness so much i believe you would do without any of your own i wish i were like you i've never been tried in that way said lucy i've always been so happy i don't know whether i could bear much trouble i never had any but poor mamma's death you have been tried maggie and i'm sure you feel for other people quite as much as i do no lucy said maggie shaking her head slowly i don't enjoy their happiness as you do else i should be more contented i do feel for them when they are in trouble i don't think i could ever bear to make any one unhappy and yet i often hate myself because i get angry sometimes at the sight of happy people i think i get worse as i get older more selfish that seems very dreadful now maggie said lucy in a tone of remonstrance i don't believe a word of that it is all a gloomy fancy just because you are depressed by a dull wearisome life well perhaps it is said maggie resolutely clearing away the clouds from her face with a bright smile and throwing herself backward in her chair perhaps it comes from the school diet watery rice pudding spiced with pinnock let us hope that it will give way before my mother's custards and this charming geoffrey crayon maggie took up the sketch-book which lay by her on the table do i look fit to be seen with this little brooch said lucy going to survey the effect in the chimney-glass oh no mr guest will be obliged to go out of the room again if he sees you in it pray make haste and put another on lucy hurried out of the room but maggie did not take the opportunity of opening her book she let it fall on her knees while her eyes wandered to the window where she could see the sunshine falling on the rich clumps of spring flowers and on the long hedge of laurels and beyond the silvery breadth of the dear old floss that at this instant seemed to be sleeping on a morning holiday 
the sweet, fresh garden scent came through the open window, and the birds were busy flitting and alighting, gurgling and singing. Yet Maggie's eyes began to fill with tears. The sight of the old scenes had made the rush of memories so painful that even yesterday she had only been able to rejoice in her mother's restored comfort and Tom's brotherly friendliness as we rejoice in good news of friends at a distance, rather than in the presence of a happiness which we share. Memory and imagination urged upon her a sense of privation too keen to let her taste what was offered in the transient present. Her future, she thought, was likely to be worse than her past, for after her years of contented renunciation she had slipped back into desire and longing. She found joyless days of distasteful occupation harder and harder, she found the image of the intense and varied life she yearned for, and despaired of, becoming more and more importunate. The sound of the opening door roused her, and hastily wiping away her tears, she began to turn over the leaves of her book. "'There is one pleasure I know, Maggie, that your deepest dismalness will never resist.' said Lucy, beginning to speak as soon as she entered the room. "'That is music, and I mean you to have quite a riotous feast of it. I mean you to get up to your playing again, which used to be so much better than mine when we were at Laysome. "'You would have laughed to see me playing the little girl's tunes over and over to them when I took them to practice,' said Maggie, "'just for the sake of fingering the dear keys again.' but I don't know whether I could play anything more difficult now than begone dull care. I know what a wild state of joy you used to be in when the glee men came round, said Lucy, taking up her embroidery, and we might have all those old glees that you used to love so if I were certain that you don't feel exactly as Tom does about some things. "'I should have thought there was nothing you might be more certain of,' said Maggie, smiling. "'I ought rather to have said one particular thing. "'Because if you feel just as he does about that, we shall want our third voice. "'St. Ogg's is so miserably provided with musical gentlemen. "'There are really only Stephen and Philip Wakeham who have any knowledge of music "'so as to be able to sing a part.' Lucy had looked up from her work as she uttered the last sentence, and saw that there was a change in Maggie's face. "'Does it hurt you to hear the name mentioned, Maggie? If it does, I will not speak of him again. I know Tom will not see him if he can avoid it.' "'I don't feel at all as Tom does on that subject,' said Maggie, rising and going to the window as if she wanted to see more of the landscape. I've always liked Philip Wakeham ever since I was a little girl and saw him at Lawton. He was so good when Tom hurt his foot. Oh, I'm so glad, said Lucy, then you won't mind his coming sometimes, and we can have much more music than we could without him. I'm very fond of poor Philip, only I wish he were not so morbid about his deformity. I suppose it is his deformity that makes him so sad and sometimes bitter. It is certainly very piteous to see his poor little crooked body and pale face among great strong people. "'But Lucy,' said Maggie, trying to arrest the prattling stream. "'Ah, there is the doorbell. That must be Stephen,' Lucy went on, not noticing Maggie's faint effort to speak. "'One of the things I most admire in Stephen is that he makes a greater friend of Philip than any one.' It was too late for Maggie to speak now. The drawing-room door was opening, and Minnie was already growling in a small way at the entrance of a tall gentleman who went up to Lucy and took her hand with a half-polite, half-tender glance and tone of inquiry, which seemed to indicate that he was unconscious of any other presence. "'Let me introduce you to my cousin, Miss Tulliver,' said Lucy turning with wicked enjoyment toward Maggie, who now approached from the farther window, 
This is Mr. Stephen Guest. For one instant, Stephen could not conceal his astonishment at the sight of this tall, dark-eyed nymph with her jet-black coronet of hair. The next, Maggie felt herself, for the first time in her life, receiving the tribute of a very deep blush and a very deep bow from a person toward whom she herself was conscious of timidity. This new experience was very agreeable to her, so agreeable that it almost effaced her previous emotion about Philip. There was a new brightness in her eyes, and a very becoming blush on her cheek, as she seated herself. "'I hope you perceive what a striking likeness you drew the day before yesterday,' said Lucy, with a pretty laugh of triumph. She enjoyed her lover's confusion. The advantage was usually on his side. "'This designing cousin of yours quite deceived me, Miss Dolliver,' said Stephen, seating himself by Lucy, and stooping to play with Minnie, only looking at Maggie furtively. "'She said you had light hair and blue eyes.' "'Nay, it was you who said so,' remonstrated Lucy. "'I only refrained from destroying your confidence in your own second sight.' "'I wish I could always err in the same way,' said Stephen, "'and find reality so much more beautiful than my preconceptions. "'Now you have proved yourself equal to the occasion,' said Maggie, "'and said what it was incumbent on you to say under the circumstances.' "'She flashed a slightly defiant look at him. "'It was clear to her that he had been drawing a satirical portrait of her beforehand.' Lucy had said he was inclined to be satirical, and Maggie had mentally supplied the addition, and rather conceited. "'An alarming amount of devil there,' was Stephen's first thought. The second, when she had bent over her work, was, "'I wish she would look at me again.' The next was to answer, "'I suppose all phrases of mere compliment have their turn to be true.' A man is occasionally grateful when he says thank you. It's rather hard upon him that he must use the same words with which all the world declines a disagreeable invitation. Don't you think so, Miss Dolliver? No, said Maggie, looking at him with her direct glance. If we use common words on a great occasion, they are the more striking, because they are felt at once to have a particular meaning, like old banners or everyday clothes hung up in a sacred place. "'Then my compliment ought to be eloquent,' said Stephen, really not quite knowing what he had said while Maggie looked at him, seeing that the words were so far beneath the occasion. "'No compliment can be eloquent except as an expression of indifference,' said Maggie, flushing a little. Lucy was rather alarmed. She thought Stephen and Maggie were not going to like each other. She had always feared lest Maggie should appear too old and clever to please that critical gentleman. "'Why, dear Maggie,' she interposed, "'you have always pretended that you are too fond of being admired, and now, I think, you are angry because someone ventures to admire you. Not at all, said Maggie. I like too well to feel that I am admired. But compliments never make me feel that. I will never pay you a compliment again, Miss Tulliver, said Stephen. Thank you. That will be a proof of respect. Poor Maggie. She was so unused to society that she could take nothing as a matter of course, and had never in her life spoken from the lips merely, so that she must necessarily appear absurd to more experienced ladies from the excessive feeling she was apt to throw into very trivial incidents. But she was even conscious herself of a little absurdity in this instance, it was true she had a theoretic objection to compliments, and had once said impatiently to Philip that she didn't see why women were to be told with a simper that they were beautiful, any more than old men were to be told that they were venerable. Still, 
to be so irritated by a common practice in the case of a stranger like Mr. Stephen Guest, and to care about his having spoken slightingly of her before he had seen her, were certainly unreasonable, and as soon as she was silent she began to be ashamed of herself. It did not occur to her that her irritation was due to the pleasanter emotion which preceded it, just as when we are satisfied with a sense of glowing warmth, an innocent drop of cold water may fall upon us as a sudden smart. Stephen was too well-bred not to seem unaware that the previous conversation could have been felt embarrassing, and at once began to talk of impersonal matters, asking Lucy if she knew when the bazaar was at length to take place, so that there might be some hope of seeing her reign the influence of her eyes on objects more grateful than those worsted flowers that were growing under her fingers. "'Some day next month, I believe,' said Lucy. "'But your sisters are doing more for it than I am. They are to have the largest stall.' "'Ah, yes, but they carry on their manufactures in their own sitting-room, where I don't intrude on them. "'I see you are not addicted to the fashionable vice of fancy-work, Miss Tulliver,' said Stephen, looking at Maggie's plain hemming. "'No,' said Maggie, "'I can do nothing more difficult or more elegant than shirt-making.' "'And your plain sewing is so beautiful, Maggie,' said Lucy, that I think I shall beg a few specimens of you to show us fancy work. Your exquisite sewing is quite a mystery to me. You used to dislike that sort of work so much in old days. It is a mystery easily explained, dear, said Maggie, looking up quietly. Plain sewing was the only thing I could get money by, so I was obliged to try and do it well. Lucy, good and simple as she was, could not help blushing a little. She did not quite like that Stephen should know that. Maggie need not have mentioned it. Perhaps there was some pride in the confession, the pride of poverty that will not be ashamed of itself. But if Maggie had been the queen of coquettes, she could hardly have invented a means of giving greater piquancy to her beauty in Stephen's eyes. I am not sure that the quiet admission of plain sewing and poverty would have done alone, but assisted by the beauty they made Maggie more unlike other women even than she had seemed at first. "'But I can knit, Lucy,' Maggie went on, "'if that will be of any use for your bazaar.' "'Oh, yes, of infinite use. I shall set you to work with scarlet wool to-morrow.' "'But your sister is the most enviable person,' continued Lucy, turning to Stephen, "'to have the talent of modelling. "'She is doing a wonderful bust of Dr. Ken, entirely from memory.' "'Why, if she can remember to put the eyes very near together, "'and the corners of the mouth very far apart, "'the likeness can hardly fail to be striking in St. Ogg's.' "'Now that is very wicked of you,' said Lucy, looking rather hurt. "'I didn't think you would speak disrespectfully of Dr. Ken.' "'I say anything disrespectful of Dr. Ken? Heaven forbid! But I am not bound to respect a libelous bust of him. I think Ken one of the finest fellows in the world.' I don't much care about the tall candlesticks he has put on the communion table, and I shouldn't like to spoil my temper by getting up to early prayers every morning, but he's the only man I ever knew personally, who seems to me to have anything of the real apostle in him, a man who has eight hundred a year, and is contented with deal furniture and boiled beef, because he gives away two-thirds of his income. That was a very fine thing of him, taking into his house that poor lad Grattan, who shot his mother by accident. He sacrifices more time than a less busy man could spare to save the poor fellow from getting into a morbid state of mind about it. He takes the lad out with him constantly, I see. "'That is beautiful,' said Maggie, who had let her work fall, and was listening with keen interest. "'I never knew any one who did such things.' 
"'And one admires that sort of action in Ken all the more,' said Stephen, "'because his manners in general are rather cold and severe. "'There's nothing sugary and maudlin about him.' "'Oh, I think he's a perfect character,' said Lucy, with pretty enthusiasm. "'No, there I can't agree with you.' said Stephen, shaking his head with sarcastic gravity. "'Now what fault can you point out in him?' "'He's an Anglican.' "'Well, those are the right views, I think,' said Lucy gravely. "'That settles the question in the abstract,' said Stephen, "'but not from a parliamentary point of view. He has set the dissenters and the church people by the ears, and a rising senator like myself, of whose services the country is very much in need, will find it inconvenient when he puts up for the honour of representing St. Ogg's in Parliament. "'Do you really think of that?' said Lucy, her eyes brightening with a proud pleasure that made her neglect the argumentative interests of Anglicanism. "'Decidedly. Whenever old Mr. Leyburn's public spirit and gout induce him to give way, my father's heart is set on it, and gifts like mine, you know. Here Stephen drew himself up, and rubbed his large white hands over his hair, with playful self-admiration. Gifts like mine involve great responsibilities. Don't you think so, Miss Tulliver? Yes, said Maggie, smiling, but not looking up. So much fluency and self-possession should not be wasted entirely on private occasions. "'Ah, I see how much penetration you have,' said Stephen. "'You have discovered already that I am talkative and impudent. Now superficial people never discern that owing to my manner, I suppose.' "'She doesn't look at me when I talk of myself,' he thought, while his listeners were laughing. "'I must try other subjects.' "'Did Lucy intend to be present at the meeting of the book club next week?' was the next question. Then followed the recommendation to choose Southey's Life of Cooper, unless she were inclined to be philosophical, and startle the ladies of St. Ogg's by voting for one of the Bridgewater treatises. Of course Lucy wished to know what these alarmingly learned books were, and as it is always pleasant to improve the minds of ladies by talking to them at ease, on subjects of which they know nothing, Stephen became quite brilliant in an account of Buckland's treatise, which he had just been reading. He was rewarded by seeing Maggie let her work fall, and gradually get so absorbed in his wonderful geological story that she sat looking at him, leaning forward with crossed arms, with an entire absence of self-consciousness, as if he had been the snuffiest of old professors, and she a downy-lipped alumna. He was so fascinated by the clear, large gaze, that at last he forgot to look away from it occasionally toward Lucy. But she, sweet child, was only rejoicing that Stephen was proving to Maggie how clever he was, and that they would certainly be good friends after all. "'I will bring you the book, shall I, Miss Tulliver?' said Stephen, when he found the stream of his recollections running rather shallow. "'There are many illustrations in it that you will like to see.' "'Oh, thank you,' said Maggie, blushing with returning self-consciousness at this direct address, and taking up her work again. "'No, no,' Lucy interposed. "'I must forbid your plunging Maggie in books. I shall never get her away from them.' and I want her to have delicious do-nothing days, filled with boating and chatting and riding and driving. That is the holiday she needs. Apropos, said Stephen, looking at his watch, shall we go out for a row on the river now? The tide will suit for us to the Tofton Way, and we can walk back. That was a delightful proposition to Maggie, for it was years since she had been on the river. When she was gone to put on her bonnet, Lucy lingered to give an order to the servant, and took the opportunity of telling Stephen that Maggie had no objection to seeing Philip, so that it was a pity she had sent that note the day before yesterday. But she would write another to-morrow, and invite him. 
"'I'll call and beat him up to-morrow,' said Stephen, "'and bring him with me in the evening, shall I? "'My sisters will want to call on you "'when I tell them your cousin is with you. "'I must leave the field clear for them in the morning.' "'Oh, yes, pray bring him,' said Lucy, "'and you will like Maggie, shan't you?' "'She added in a beseeching tone. "'Isn't she a dear, noble-looking creature?' "'Too tall,' said Stephen, smiling down upon her, "'and a little too fiery. "'She is not my type of woman, you know. "'Gentlemen, you are aware, "'are apt to impart these imprudent confidences to ladies "'concerning their unfavourable opinion of sister-fair ones. "'That is why so many women have the advantage of knowing "'that they are secretly repulsive to men "'who have self-denyingly made ardent love to them. "'And hardly anything could be more distinctively characteristic of Lucy "'than that she both implicitly believed what Stephen said, "'and was determined that Maggie should not know it. "'But you, who have a higher logic than the verbal to guide you, have already foreseen, as the direct consequence to that unfavourable opinion of Stephen's, that he walked down to the boat-house calculating, by the aid of a vivid imagination, that Maggie must give him her hand at least twice in consequence of this pleasant boating plan, and that a gentleman who wishes ladies to look at him is advantageously situated when he is rowing them in a boat." What then? Had he fallen in love with this surprising daughter of Mrs. Tulliver at first sight? Certainly not. Such passions are never heard of in real life. Besides, he was in love already, and half engaged to the dearest little creature in the world, and he was not a man to make a fool of himself in any way. But when one is five-and-twenty— one has not chalk-stones at one's finger-ends that the touch of a handsome girl should be entirely indifferent. It was perfectly natural and safe to admire beauty and enjoy looking at it, at least under such circumstances as the present. And there was really something very interesting about this girl, with her poverty and troubles. It was gratifying to see the friendship between the two cousins— Generally, Stephen admitted, he was not fond of women who had any peculiarity of character, but here the peculiarity seemed really of a superior kind, and provided one is not obliged to marry such women, why, they certainly make a variety in social intercourse. Maggie did not fulfil Stephen's hope by looking at him during the first quarter of an hour. Her eyes were too full of the old banks that she knew so well. She felt lonely, cut off from Philip, the only person who had ever seemed to love her devotedly, as she had always longed to be loved. But presently the rhythmic movement of the oars attracted her, and she thought she should like to learn how to row. This roused her from her reverie, and she asked if she might take an oar. It appeared that she required much teaching, and she became ambitious. The exercise brought the warm blood into her cheeks, and made her inclined to take her lesson merrily. "'I shall not be satisfied until I can manage both oars, and row you and Lucy,' she said, looking very bright as she stepped out of the boat. Maggie, we know, was apt to forget the thing she was doing— and she had chosen an inopportune moment for her remark. Her foot slipped, but happily Mr. Stephen Guest held her hand, and kept her up with a firm grasp. "'You have not hurt yourself at all, I hope,' he said, bending to look in her face with anxiety. It was very charming to be taken care of in that kind, graceful manner by someone taller and stronger than oneself. Maggie had never felt just in the same way before. When they reached home again, they found Uncle and Aunt Pullet seated with Mrs. Tulliver in the drawing-room, and Stephen hurried away, asking leave to come again in the evening. "'And pray 
"'Bring with you the volume of Purcell that you took away,' said Lucy. "'I want Maggie to hear your best songs.' Aunt Pullet, under the certainty that Maggie would be invited to go out with Lucy, probably to Park House, was much shocked at the shabbiness of her clothes, which, when witnessed by the higher society of St. Ogg's, would be a discredit to the family, that demanded a strong and prompt remedy, and the consultation as to what would be most suitable to this end, from among the superfluities of Mrs. Pullet's wardrobe, was one that Lucy as well as Mrs. Tulliver entered into with some zeal. Maggie must really have an evening dress as soon as possible, and she was about the same height as Aunt Pullet. "'But she's so much broader across the shoulders than I am. It's very ill-convenient,' said Mrs. Pullet, "'else she might wear that beautiful black brocade of mine without any alteration, and her arms are beyond everything.' added Mrs. Pullet sorrowfully, as she lifted Maggie's large round arm. "'She'd never get my sleeves on.' "'Oh, never mind that, and send us the dress,' said Lucy. "'I don't mean Maggie to have long sleeves, and I have abundance of black lace for trimming. Her arms will look beautiful.' "'Maggie's arms are a pretty shape,' said Mrs. Tulliver. They're like mine used to be, only mine was never brown. I wish she'd had our family skin. Nonsense, Auntie, said Lucy, patting her Aunt Tulliver's shoulder. You don't understand those things. A painter would think Maggie's complexion beautiful. Maybe, my dear, said Mrs. Tulliver submissively. You know better than I do. Only when I was young a brown skin wasn't thought well on among respectable folks. No, said Uncle Pullet, who took intense interest in the lady's conversation as he sucked his lozenges, though there was a song about the nut-brown maid, too. I think she was crazy, crazy Kate, but I can't justly remember. Oh, dear, dear, said Maggie, laughing but impatient. I think that will be the end of my brown skin, if it is always to be talked about so much. End of chapter 2 of Book 6 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 3 of Book 6 of the Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Confidential Moments. When Maggie went up to her bedroom that night, it appeared that she was not at all inclined to undress. She set down her candle on the first table that presented itself and began to walk up and down her room, which was a large one, with a firm, regular, and rather rapid step, which showed that the exercise was the instinctive vent of strong excitement. Her eyes and cheeks had an almost feverish brilliancy. Her head was thrown backward, and her hands were clasped with the palms outward, and with that tension of the arms which is apt to accompany mental absorption. Had anything remarkable happened? Nothing that you are not likely to consider in the highest degree unimportant. She had been hearing some fine music sung by a fine bass voice, but then it was sung in a provincial amateur fashion such as would left your critical ear much to desire and she was conscious of having been looked at a great deal, in rather a furtive manner, from beneath a pair of well-marked horizontal eyebrows, with a glance that seemed somehow to have caught the vibratory influence of the voice. Such things could have had no perceptible effect on a thoroughly well-educated young lady, with a perfectly balanced mind, who had had all the advantages of fortune, training, and refined society. But if Maggie had been that young lady, 
you would probably have known nothing about her. Her life would have had so few vicissitudes that it could hardly have been written. For the happiest women, like the happiest nations, have no history. In poor Maggie's highly strung, hungry nature, just come away from a third-rate schoolroom with all its jarring sounds and petty round of tasks, these apparently trivial causes had the effect of rousing and exalting her imagination in a way that was mysterious to herself. It was not that she thought distinctly of Mr. Stephen Guest, or dwelt on the indications that he looked at her with admiration. It was rather that she felt the half-remote presence of a world of love and beauty and delight, made up of vague mingled images from all the poetry and romance she had ever read, or had ever woven in her dreamy reveries. Her mind glanced back once or twice to the time when she had courted privation, when she had thought all longing, all impatience, was subdued. But that condition seemed irrecoverably gone, and she recoiled from the remembrance of it. No prayer, no striving now, would bring back that negative peace. The battle of her life, it seemed, was not to be decided in that short and easy way by perfect renunciation at the very threshold of her youth. The music was vibrating in her still, Purcell's music, with its wild passion and fancy, and she could not stay in the recollection of that bare, lonely past. She was in her brighter aerial world again, when a little tap came at the door. Of course it was her cousin, who entered in ample white dressing-gown. "'Why, Maggie, you naughty child, haven't you begun to undress?' said Lucy in astonishment. "'I promised not to come and talk to you, because I thought you must be tired.' "'But here you are, looking as if you were ready to dress for a ball. "'Come, come, get on your dressing-gown, and unplait your hair.' "'Well, you are not very forward,' retorted Maggie, "'hastily reaching her own pink cotton gown, "'and looking at Lucy's light brown hair, brushed back in curly disorder. "'Oh, I have not much to do. "'I shall sit down and talk to you.' till I see you are really on the way to bed. While Maggie stood and unplaited her long black hair over her pink drapery, Lucy sat down near the toilette table, watching her with affectionate eyes, and head a little aside like a pretty spaniel. If it appears to you at all incredible, that young ladies should be led on to talk confidentially in a situation of this kind, I will beg you to remember that human life furnishes many exceptional cases. "'You really have enjoyed the music tonight, haven't you, Maggie?' "'Oh, yes, that is what prevents me from feeling sleepy. I think I should have no other mortal wants if I could always have plenty of music.' it seems to infuse strength into my limbs and ideas into my brain life seems to go on without effort when i am filled with music at other times one is conscious of carrying a weight and stephen has a splendid voice hasn't he well perhaps we are neither of us judges of that said maggie laughing as she seated herself and tossed her long hair back "'You are not impartial, and I think any barrel-organ splendid. "'But tell me what you think of him now. "'Tell me exactly, good and bad, too.' "'Oh, I think you should humiliate him a little. "'A lover should not be so much at ease and so self-confident. "'He ought to tremble more.' "'Nonsense, Maggie, as if any one could tremble at me.' You think he is conceited? I see that. But you don't dislike him, do you? Dislike him? No. Am I in the habit of seeing such charming people that I should be very difficult to please? Besides, 
How could I dislike any one that promised to make you happy, you dear thing? Maggie pinched Lucy's dimpled chin. We shall have more music tomorrow evening, for Stephen will bring Philip Wakem with him. Oh, Lucy, I can't see him, said Maggie, turning pale. At least I could not see him without Tom's leave. Is Tom such a tyrant as that? said Lucy, surprised. I'll take the responsibility, then. Tell him it was my fault. But, dear, said Maggie falteringly, I promised Tom, very solemnly, before my father's death, I promised him I would not speak to Philip without his knowledge and consent. And I have a great dread of opening the subject with Tom, of getting into a quarrel with him again. But I never heard of anything so strange and unreasonable. What harm can poor Philip have done? May I speak to Tom about it? Oh, no, pray don't, dear, said Maggie. I'll go to him myself to-morrow and, and tell him that you wish Philip to come. I've thought before of asking him to absolve me from my promise, but I've not had the courage to determine on it. They were both silent for some moments, and then Lucy said, "'Maggie, you have secrets from me, and I have none from you.' Maggie looked meditatively away from Lucy. Then she turned to her and said, "'I should like to tell you about Philip, but, Lucy, you must not betray that you know it to any one, least of all to Philip himself.' or to Mr. Stephen Guest. The narrative lasted long, for Maggie had never before known the relief of such an outpouring. She had never before told Lucy anything of her inmost life, and the sweet face bent towards her with sympathetic interest, and the little hand pressing hers encouraged her to speak on. On two points only she was not expansive she did not betray fully what still rankled in her mind as Tom's great offence, the insults he had heaped on Philip. Angry as the remembrance still made her, she could not bear that any one else should know it all, both for Tom's sake and Philip's, and she could not bear to tell Lucy of the last scene between her father and Wakem though it was this scene which she had ever since felt to be a new barrier between herself and Philip. She merely said she saw now that Tom was on the whole right in regarding any prospect of love and marriage between her and Philip as put out of the question by the relation of the two families. Of course Philip's father would never consent. "'There, Lucy,' "'You have had my story,' said Maggie, smiling, with the tears in her eyes. "'You see, I am like Sir Andrew Aguecheek. I was adored once.' "'Ah, now I see how it is, you know, Shakespeare and everything, and have learnt so much since you left school, which always seemed to me witchcraft before, part of your general uncanniness,' said Lucy." She mused a little with her eyes downward, and then added, looking at Maggie, "'It is very beautiful that you should love Philip. I never thought such a happiness would befall him. And in my opinion, you ought not to give him up. There are obstacles now, but they may be done away with in time.' Maggie shook her head. "'Yes, yes,' persisted Lucy. I can't help being hopeful about it. There is something romantic in it, out of the common way, just what everything that happens to you ought to be. And Philip will adore you like a husband in a fairy tale. Oh, I shall puzzle my small brain to contrive some plot that will bring everybody into the right mind, so that you may marry Philip when I marry somebody else. Wouldn't that be a pretty ending to all my poor, poor Maggie's troubles? 
Maggie tried to smile, but shivered, as if she felt a sudden chill. "'Ah, dear, you are cold,' said Lucy. "'You must go to bed, and so must I. I dare not think what time it is.' They kissed each other, and Lucy went away, possessed of a confidence which had a strong influence over her subsequent impressions. Maggie had been thoroughly sincere. Her nature had never found it easy to be otherwise. But confidences are sometimes blinding, even when they are sincere. End of chapter 3 of Book Sixth Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Four of Book Sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Brother and Sister Maggie was obliged to go to Tom's lodgings in the middle of the day when he would be coming in to dinner, else she would not have found him at home. He was not lodging with entire strangers. Our friend Bob Jakin had, with Mumps's tacit consent, taken not only a wife about eight months ago, but also one of those queer old houses pierced with surprising passages by the waterside, where, as he observed, his wife and mother could keep themselves out of mischief by letting out two pleasure boats in which he had invested some of his savings and by taking in a lodger for the parlour and spare bedroom. Under these circumstances, what could be better for the interests of all parties, sanitary conditions apart, than that the lodger should be Mr. Tom? It was Bob's wife who opened the door to Maggie. She was a tiny woman with the general physiognomy of a Dutch doll, looking, in comparison with Bob's mother, who filled up the passage in the rear very much like one of those human figures which the artist finds conveniently standing near a colossal statue to show the proportions. The tiny woman curtsied and looked up at Maggie with some awe as soon as she had opened the door, but the words, "'Is my brother at home?' which Maggie uttered smilingly, made her turn round with sudden excitement and say, "'Eh, hey, mother, mother, tell Bob, it's Miss Maggie. Come in, miss, for goodness do,' she went on, opening a side door, and endeavouring to flatten her person against the wall, to make the utmost space for the visitor. Sad recollections crowded on Maggie as she entered the small parlour, which was now all that poor Tom had to call by the name of home, that name which had once, so many years ago, meant for both of them the same sum of dear, familiar objects. But everything was not strange to her in this new room. The first thing her eyes dwelt on was the large old Bible, and the sight was not likely to disperse the old memories. She stood without speaking. "'If you please to take the privilege of sitting down, miss,' said Mrs. Jakin, rubbing her apron over a perfectly clean chair, and then lifting up the corner of that garment and holding it to her face with an air of embarrassment, as she looked wonderingly at Maggie. "'Bob is at home, then,' said Maggie, recovering herself and smiling at the bashful Dutch doll. "'Yes, miss, but I think he must be washing and dressing himself. I'll go and see,' said Mrs. Jakin, disappearing." but she presently came back walking with new courage a little way behind her husband, who showed the brilliancy of his blue eyes and regular white teeth in the doorway, bowing respectfully. "'How do you do, Bob?' said Maggie, coming forward and putting out her hand to him. "'I always meant to pay your wife a visit, and I shall come another day on purpose for that, if she will let me. But I was obliged to come to-day to speak to my brother. "'He'll be in before long, miss,' 
"'He's doing finely, Mr. Tommies. "'He'll be one of the first men hereabouts. "'You'll see that.' "'Well, Bob, I'm sure he'll be indebted to you, whatever he becomes. "'He said so himself only the other night, when he was talking of you. "'Eh, hey, miss, that's his way of taking it. "'But I think the more on't when he says a thing, "'because his tongue doesn't overshoot him as mine does. "'Laws, I'm no better nor a tilted bottle I aren't. "'I can't stop Miss N when once I begin.' "'But you look rarely, miss. It does me good to see you. "'What do you say now, Prissy?' "'Here Bob turned to his wife. "'Isn't it all come true as I said? "'Though there isn't many sorts of goods as I can't overpraise "'when I set my tongue to it.' "'Mrs. Bob's small nose seemed to be following the example of her eyes "'in turning up reverentially towards Maggie.' but she was able now to smile and curtsy and say, "'I'd look for it like anything to seeing you, miss, for my husband's tongue's been running on you like as if he was light-headed ever since first he come a-courting on me.' "'Well, well,' said Bob, looking rather silly, "'go and see after the taters, else Mr. Tom'll have to wait for him." "'I hope Mumps is friendly with Mrs. Jake and Bob,' said Maggie, smiling. "'I remember you used to say he wouldn't like you marrying.' "'Eh, hey, miss,' said Bob, grinning, "'he made up his mind to it when he seed what a little and she was. "'He pretends not to see her mostly, or else to think as she isn't full growed. "'But about Mr. Tom, miss,' said Bob, speaking lower and looking serious, "'He's as close as a iron biler, he is. "'But I'm a cutish chap, and when I've left off carrying my pack, "'and am at a loose end, I've got more brains nor I know what to do we, "'and I'm forced to busy myself wi' other folks's insides. "'And it worrits me as Mr. Tom'll sit by himself so glumpish, "'and knitting his brow and a-looking at the fire of a night.' "'He should be a bit livelier now, a fine young fellow like him. "'My wife says, when she goes in sometimes, and he takes no notice of her, "'he sits looking into the fire and frowning as if he was watching folks at work in it.' "'He thinks so much about business,' said Maggie. "'Aye,' said Bob, speaking lower. "'But do you think it's nothing else, miss?' "'He's close, Mr. Tom is, but I'm a cute chap, I am, and I thought toward last Christmas as I'd found out a soft place in him. It was about a little black spaniel, a rare bit of breed, as he made a fuss to get, but since then so much come over him as he set his teeth again things more'n a river, for all he's had such good luck. And I wanted to tell you, miss, "'cause I thought you might work it out of him a bit now you come. "'He's a deal too lonely, and doesn't go into company enough. "'I'm afraid I have very little power over him, Bob,' said Maggie, "'a good deal moved by Bob's suggestion. "'It was a totally new idea to her mind that Tom could have his love troubles. "'Poor fellow! And in love with Lucy, too?' but it was, perhaps, a mere fancy of Bob's too officious brain. The present of the dog meant nothing more than cousinship and gratitude, but Bob had already said, "'Here's Mr. Tom,' and the outer door was opening. "'There's no time to spare, Tom,' said Maggie, as soon as Bob had left the room. "'I must tell you at once what I came about, else I shall be hindering you from taking your dinner.' Tom stood with his back against the chimney-piece, and Maggie was seated opposite the light. He noticed that she was tremulous, and he had a presentiment of the subject she was going to speak about. The presentiment made his voice colder and harder as he said, "'What is it?' This tone 
roused a spirit of resistance in Maggie, and she put her request in quite a different form from the one she had predetermined on. She rose from her seat, and looking straight at Tom, said, "'I want you to absolve me from my promise about Philip Wakem, or rather I promised you not to see him without telling you. I am come to tell you that I wish to see him.' "'Very well,' said Tom, still more coldly. But Maggie had hardly finished speaking in that chill, defiant manner before she repented, and felt the dread of alienation from her brother. "'Not for myself, dear Tom. Don't be angry. I shouldn't have asked it, only that Philip, you know, is a friend of Lucy's, and she wishes him to come, has invited him to come this evening. And I told her— I couldn't see him without telling you. I shall only see him in the presence of other people. There will never be anything secret between us again. Tom looked away from Maggie, knitting his brow more strongly for a little while. Then he turned to her and said slowly and emphatically, You know what is my feeling on that subject, Maggie. There is no need for my repeating anything I said a year ago. While my father was living, I felt bound to use the utmost power over you, to prevent you from disgracing him as well as yourself, and all of us. But now I must leave you to your own choice. You wish to be independent? You told me so after my father's death. My opinion is not changed. If you think of Philip Wakem as a lover again, you must give up me. I don't wish it, dear Tom, at least as things are. I see that it would lead to misery. But I shall soon go away to another situation, and I should like to be friends with him again while I am here. Lucy wishes it. The severity of Tom's face relaxed a little. I shouldn't mind your seeing him occasionally at my uncle's. I don't want you to make a fuss on the subject. But I have no confidence in you, Maggie. You would be led away to do anything. That was a cruel word. Maggie's lip began to tremble. Why will you say that, Tom? It is very hard of you. Have I not done and borne everything as well as I could? and I have kept my word to you, when, when, my life has not been a happy one any more than yours. She was obliged to be childish. The tears would come. When Maggie was not angry, she was as dependent on kind or cold words as a daisy on the sunshine or the cloud. The need of being loved would always subdue her, as in old days it subdued her in the worm-eaten attic. The brother's goodness came uppermost at this appeal, but it could only show itself in Tom's fashion. He put his hand gently on her arm, and said, in the tone of a kind pedagogue, "'Now listen to me, Maggie. I'll tell you what I mean.' You're always in extremes. You have no judgment and self-command, and yet you think you know best, and will not submit to be guided. You know I didn't wish you to take a situation. My Aunt Pullet was willing to give you a good home, and you might have lived respectably amongst your relations, until I could have provided a home for you with my mother. And that is what I should like to do." I wished my sister to be a lady, and I would always have taken care of you, as my father desired, until you were well married. But your ideas and mine never accord, and you will not give way. Yet you might have sense enough to see that a brother who goes out into the world and mixes with men necessarily knows better what is right and respectable for his sister than she can know herself. You think I am not kind, but my kindness can only be directed by what I believe to be good for you. Yes, I know, 
dear Tom, said Maggie, still half sobbing, but trying to control her tears, I know you would do a great deal for me. I know how you work, and don't spare yourself. I am grateful to you. But indeed you can't quite judge for me. Our natures are very different. You don't know how differently things affect me from what they do you. Yes, I do know. I know it too well. I know how differently you must feel about all that affects our family, and your dignity as a young woman, before you could think of receiving secret addresses from Philip Wakeham. If it was not disgusting to me in every other way, I should object to my sister's name being associated for a moment with that of a young man whose father must hate the very thought of us all, and would spurn you. With any one but you, I should think it quite certain that what you witnessed just before my father's death would secure you from ever thinking again of Philip Wakeham as a lover. But I don't feel certain of it with you. I never feel certain about anything with you. At one time you take pleasure in a sort of perverse self-denial, and at another you have not resolution to resist a thing that you know to be wrong. There was a terrible cutting truth in Tom's words, that hard rind of truth which is discerned by unimaginative, unsympathetic minds. Maggie always writhed under this judgment of Tom's. She rebelled and was humiliated in the same moment. It seemed as if he held a glass before her to show her her own folly and weakness, as if he were a prophetic voice predicting her future fallings. And yet, all the while, she judged him in return. She said inwardly that he was narrow and unjust, that he was below feeling those mental needs which were often the source of the wrongdoing or absurdity that made her life a planless riddle to him. She did not answer directly. Her heart was too full, and she sat down, leaning her arm on the table. It was no use trying to make Tom feel that she was near to him. He always repelled her. Her feeling under his words was complicated by the allusion to the last scene between her father and Wakeham, and at length that painful, solemn memory surmounted the immediate grievance. No, she did not think of such things with frivolous indifference, and Tom must not accuse her of that. She looked up at him with a grave, earnest gaze, and said, I can't make you think better of me, Tom, by anything I can say. But I am not so shut out from all your feelings as you believe me to be. I see, as well as you do, that from our position with regard to Philip's father, not on other grounds, it would be unreasonable, it would be wrong for us to entertain the idea of marriage, and I have given up thinking of him as a lover. I am telling you the truth, and you have no right to disbelieve me. I have kept my word to you, and you have never detected me in a falsehood. I should not only not encourage, I should carefully avoid any intercourse with Philip on any other footing than that of quiet friendship. You may think that I am unable to keep my resolutions— but at least you ought not to treat me with hard contempt on the ground of faults that I have not committed yet. Well, Maggie, said Tom, softening under this appeal, I don't want to overstrain matters. I think, all things considered, it will be best for you to see Philip Wakeham if Lucy wishes him to come to the house. I believe what you say. At least you believe it yourself, I know. I can only warn you. I wish to be as good a brother to you as you will let me. There was a little tremor in Tom's voice as he uttered the last words, 
and Maggie's ready affection came back with as sudden a glow as when they were children, and bit their cake together as a sacrament of conciliation. She rose and laid her hand on Tom's shoulder. "'Dear Tom, I know you mean to be good. I know you have had a great deal to bear, and have done a great deal. I should like to be a comfort to you, not to vex you. You don't think I'm altogether naughty now, do you?' Tom smiled at the eager face. His smiles were very pleasant to see when they did come, for the grey eyes could be tender underneath the frown. "'No, Maggie. I may turn out better than you expect.' "'I hope you will. And may I come some day and make tea for you, and see this extremely small wife of Bob's again?' "'Yes. But trot away now, for I've no more time to spare.' said Tom, looking at his watch. "'Not to give me a kiss?' Tom bent to kiss her cheek, and then said, "'There, be a good girl. I've got a great deal to think of to-day. I'm going to have a long consultation with my Uncle Dean this afternoon. "'You'll come to Aunt Legs to-morrow. We're going all to dine early.' that we may go there to tea. You must come. Lucy told me to say so. Oh, pooh! I've plenty else to do, said Tom, pulling his bell violently, and bringing down the small bell-rope. I'm frightened. I shall run away, said Maggie, making a laughing retreat, while Tom, with masculine philosophy, flung the bell-rope to the farther end of the room, not very far, either, a touch of human experience which I flatter myself will come home to the bosoms of not a few substantial or distinguished men who were once at an early stage of their rise in the world, and were cherishing very large hopes in very small lodgings. End of chapter 4 of Book 6 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Five of Book Sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Showing that Tom had opened the oyster. And now we've settled this Newcastle business, Tom, said Mr. Dean that same afternoon as they were seated in the private room at the bank together. "'There's another matter I want to talk to you about. "'Since you're likely to have rather a smoky, unpleasant time of it at Newcastle for the next few weeks, "'you'll want a good prospect of some sort to keep up your spirits.' "'Tom waited less nervously than he had done on a former occasion in this apartment, "'while his uncle took out his snuff-box and gratified each nostril with deliberate impartiality.' "'You see, Tom,' said Mr. Dean, at last, throwing himself backward, "'the world goes on at a smarter pace now than it did when I was a young fellow. "'Why, sir, forty years ago, when I was much such a strapping youngster as you, "'a man expected to pull between the shafts the best part of his life before he got the whip in his hand. "'The looms went slowish, and fashions didn't alter quite so fast.' I'd a best suit that lasted me six years. Everything was on a lower scale, sir, in point of expenditure, I mean. It's this steam, you see, that has made the difference. It drives on every wheel double pace, and the wheel of fortune along with them, as our Mr. Stephen Guest said at the anniversary dinner. He hits these things off wonderfully, considering he's seen nothing of business. I don't find fault with the change, as some people do. Trade, sir, opens a man's eyes, and if the population is to get thicker upon the ground as it's doing, the world must use its wits at inventions of one sort or another. 
I know I've done my share as an ordinary man of business. Somebody has said it's a fine thing to make two ears of corn grow where only one grew before. But, sir, it's a fine thing, too, to further the exchange of commodities and bring the grains of corn to the mouths that are hungry. And that's our line of business, and I consider it as honourable a position as a man can hold to be connected with it. Tom knew that the affair his uncle had to speak of was not urgent. Mr. Dean was too shrewd and practical a man to allow either his reminiscences or his snuff to impede the progress of trade. Indeed, for the last month or two there had been hints thrown out to Tom which enabled him to guess that he was going to hear some proposition for his own benefit. With the beginning of the last speech he had stretched out his legs, thrust his hands in his pockets, and prepared himself for some introductory diffuseness, tending to show that Mr. Dean had succeeded by his own merit, and that what he had to say to young men in general was that if they didn't succeed too, it was because of their own demerit. He was rather surprised, then, when his uncle put a direct question to him. "'Let me see. It's going on for seven years now since you applied to me for a situation, eh, Tom?' "'Yes, sir. I'm three and twenty now,' said Tom. "'Ah, it's as well not to say that, though, for you'd pass for a good deal older, and age tells well in business. I remember your coming very well. I remember I saw there was some pluck in you, and that was what made me give you encouragement.' and I'm happy to say I was right. I'm not often deceived. I was naturally a little shy at pushing my nephew, but I'm happy to say you've done me credit, sir, and if I'd had a son of my own, I shouldn't have been sorry to see him like you. Mr. Dean tapped his box and opened it again, repeating in a tone of some feeling, "'No, I shouldn't have been sorry,' to see him like you. I'm very glad I've given you satisfaction, sir. I've done my best, said Tom in his proud, independent way. Yes, Tom, you've given me satisfaction. I don't speak of your conduct as a son, though that weighs with me in my opinion of you. But what I have to do with, as a partner in our firm, is the qualities you've shown as a man of business. Ours is a fine business, a splendid concern, sir, and there's no reason why it shouldn't go on growing. There's a growing capital and growing outlets for it, but there's another thing that's wanted for the prosperity of every concern, large or small, and that's men to conduct it, men of the right habits." "'None of your flashy fellows, but such as are to be depended on. "'Now this is what Mr. Guest and I see, clear enough. Three years ago we took Gell into the concern. "'We gave him a share in the oil mill. "'And why? "'Why, because Gell was a fellow whose services were worth a premium. "'So it will always be, sir, so it was with me.' and though Gell is pretty near ten years older than you, there are other points in your favour. Tom was getting a little nervous as Mr. Dean went on speaking. He was conscious of something he had in his mind to say which might not be agreeable to his uncle, simply because it was a new suggestion rather than an acceptance of the proposition he foresaw. "'It stands to reason,' Mr. Dean went on, when he had finished his new pinch, "'that your being my nephew weighs in your favour. But I don't deny that if you'd be no relation of mine at all, your conduct in that affair of Pelly's bank would have led Mr. Guest and myself to make some acknowledgment of the service you've been to us. And backed by your general conduct and business ability, it has made us determine on giving you a share in the business, a share which we shall be glad to increase as the years go on. 
"'We think that'll be better on all grounds than raising your salary. "'It'll give you more importance and prepare you better "'for taking some of the anxiety off my shoulders by and by. "'I'm equal to a good deal of work at present, thank God, "'but I'm getting older, there's no denying that. "'I told Mr. Guest I would open the subject to you, "'and when you come back from this northern business—' "'We can go into particulars. "'This is a great stride for a young fellow of three-and-twenty, "'but I'm bound to say you've deserved it. "'I'm very grateful to Mr. Guest and you, sir. "'Of course I feel the most indebted to you, "'who first took me into the business "'and have taken a good deal of pains with me since.' Tom spoke with a slight tremor, and paused after he had said this. "'Yes, yes,' said Mr. Dean, "'I don't spare pains when I see they'll be of any use. I gave myself some trouble with Gell, else he wouldn't have been what he is. But there's one thing I should like to mention to you, Uncle. I've never spoken to you of it before. If you remember, at the time my father's property was sold, "'There was some thought of your firm buying the mill. "'I know you thought it would be a very good investment, "'especially if steam were applied. "'To be sure, to be sure, but Wakeham out bid us. "'He'd made up his mind to that. "'He's rather fond of carrying everything over other people's heads. "'Perhaps it's of no use my mentioning it at present,' Tom went on, "'but I wish you to know what I have in mind about the mill.' I've a strong feeling about it. It was my father's dying wish that I should try and get it back again whenever I could. It was in his family for five generations. I promised my father, and besides that, I'm attached to the place. I shall never like any other so well. And if it should ever suit your views to buy it for the firm, I should have a better chance of fulfilling my father's wish. I shouldn't have liked to mention the thing to you, only you've been kind enough to say my services have been of some value. And I'd give up a much greater chance in life, for the sake of having the mill again. I mean, having it in my own hands, and gradually working off the price. Mr. Dean had listened attentively, and now looked thoughtful. "'I see, I see,' he said after a while. "'The thing would be possible if there were any chance of Wakeham's parting with the property. But that I don't see. He's put that young Jetsam in the place, and he had his reasons when he bought it, I'll be bound.' "'He's a loose fish, that young Jetsam,' said Tom. "'He's taking to drinking.' "'and they say he's letting the business go down. "'Luke told me about it, our old miller. "'He says he shan't stay unless there's an alteration. "'I was thinking, if things went on in that way, "'Wakeham might be more willing to part with the mill. "'Luke says he's getting very sour about the way things are going on. "'Well, I'll turn it over, Tom.' I must inquire into the matter and go into it with Mr. Guest. But, you see, it's rather striking out a new branch and putting you to that, instead of keeping you where you are, which is what we'd wanted. I should be able to manage more than the mill when things were once set properly going, sir. I want to have plenty of work. There's nothing else I care about much." There was something rather sad in that speech from a young man of three-and-twenty, even in Uncle Dean's business-loving ears. "'Pooh, pooh! You'll be having a wife to care about one of these days, if you get on at this pace in the world. But as to this mill, we mustn't reckon on our chickens too early. However, I promise you to bear it in mind, and when you come back, we'll talk of it again. I am going to dinner now. Come and breakfast with us tomorrow morning, 
and say good-bye to your mother and sister before you start. End of chapter 5 of Book 6 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 6 of Book Sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Illustrating the Laws of Attraction. It is evident to you now that Maggie had arrived at a moment in her life which must be considered by all prudent persons as a great opportunity for a young woman launched into the higher society of St. Ogg's, with a striking person which had the advantage of being quite unfamiliar to the majority of beholders, and with such moderate assistance of costume as you have seen foreshadowed in Lucy's anxious colloquy with Aunt Pullet, Maggie was certainly at a new starting-point in life. At Lucy's first evening party, Young Torrey fatigued his facial muscles more than usual in order that the dark-eyed girl there in the corner might see him in all the additional style conferred by his eyeglass, and several young ladies went home intending to have short sleeves with black lace and to plait their hair in a broad coronet at the back of their head. That cousin of Miss Dean's looked so very well. In fact, Poor Maggie, with all her inward consciousness of a painful past, and her presentiment of a troublous future, was on the way to become an object of some envy, a topic of discussion in the newly established billiard-room, and between fair friends who had no secrets from each other on the subject of trimmings. The Miss Guests, who associated chiefly on terms of condescension with the families of St. Ogg's, and with a glass of fashion there, took some exception to Maggie's manners. She had a way of not assenting at once to the observations current in good society, and of saying that she didn't know whether those observations were true or not, which gave her an air of gaucherie, and impeded the even flow of conversation. But it is a fact capable of an amiable interpretation— that ladies are not the worst disposed towards a new acquaintance of their own sex, because she has points of inferiority. And Maggie was so entirely without those pretty airs of coquetry which have the traditional reputation of driving gentlemen to despair, that she won some feminine pity for being so ineffective in spite of her beauty. She had not had many advantages, poor thing, and it must be admitted there was no pretension about her. Her abruptness and unevenness of manner were plainly the result of her secluded and lowly circumstances. It was only a wonder that there was no tinge of vulgarity about her, considering what the rest of poor Lucy's relations were an illusion which always made the Miss Guests shudder a little. It was not agreeable to think of any connection by marriage with such people as the Gleggs and the Pullets, but it was of no use to contradict Stephen when once he had set his mind on anything, and certainly there was no possible objection to Lucy in herself. No one could help liking her. She would naturally desire that the Miss Guests should behave kindly to this cousin of whom she was so fond and Stephen would make a great fuss if they were deficient in civility. Under these circumstances the invitations to Park House were not wanting, and elsewhere also Miss Dean was too popular and too distinguished a member of society in St. Ogg's for any attention towards her to be neglected. Thus Maggie was introduced for the first time to the young lady's life and knew what it was to get up in the morning without any imperative reason for doing one thing more than another. 
this new sense of leisure and unchecked enjoyment amidst the soft-breathing airs and garden scents of advancing spring, amidst the new abundance of music and lingering strolls in the sunshine, and delicious dreaminess of gliding on the river, could hardly be without some intoxicating effect on her, after her years of privation. And even in the first week, Maggie began to be less haunted by her sad memories and anticipations. Life was certainly very pleasant just now. It was becoming very pleasant to dress in the evening, and to feel that she was one of the beautiful things of this springtime. And there were admiring eyes always awaiting her now. She was no longer an unheeded person liable to be chid, from whom attention was continually claimed, and on whom no one felt bound to confer any. It was pleasant, too, when Stephen and Lucy were gone out riding, to sit down at the piano alone, and find that the old fitness between her fingers and the keys remained, and revived like a sympathetic kinship, not to be worn out by separation to get the tunes she had heard the evening before, and repeat them again and again, until she had found out a way of producing them so as to make them a more pregnant, passionate language to her. The mere concord of octaves was a delight to Maggie, and she would often take up a book of studies rather than any melody that she might taste more keenly by abstraction the more primitive sensation of intervals. Not that her enjoyment of music was of the kind that indicates a great specific talent, it was rather that her sensibility to the supreme excitement of music was only one form of that passionate sensibility which belonged to her whole nature, and made her faults and virtues all merge in each other, made her affections sometimes an impatient demand, but also prevented her vanity from taking the form of mere feminine coquetry and device, and gave it the poetry of ambition. But you have known Maggie a long while, and need to be told not her characteristics, but her history, which is a thing hardly to be predicted even from the completest knowledge of characteristics. For the tragedy of our lives is not created entirely from within. Character, says Novalis, in one of his questionable aphorisms, character is destiny. But not the whole of our destiny. Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, was speculative and irresolute, and we have a great tragedy in consequence. But if his father had lived to a good old age, and his uncle had died an early death, we can conceive Hamlet's having married Ophelia, and got through life with a reputation of sanity, notwithstanding many soliloquies, and some moody sarcasms towards the fair daughter of Polonius, to say nothing of the frankest incivility to his father-in-law. Maggie's destiny, then, is at present hidden and we must wait for it to reveal itself like the course of an unmapped river. We only know that the river is full and rapid, and that for all rivers there is the same final home. Under the charm of her new pleasures, Maggie herself was ceasing to think, with her eager prefiguring imagination, of her future lot and her anxiety about her first interview with Philip was losing its predominance. Perhaps, unconsciously to herself, she was not sorry that the interview had been deferred. For Philip had not come the evening he was expected, and Mr. Stephen Guest brought word that he was gone to the coast, probably, he thought, on a sketching expedition, but it was not certain when he would return. It was just like Philip to go off in that way without telling anyone. It was not until the twelfth day that he returned to find both Lucy's notes awaiting him. He had left before he knew of Maggie's arrival. 
Perhaps one had need to be nineteen again, to be quite convinced of the feelings that were crowded for Maggie into those twelve days, of the length to which they were stretched for her by the novelty of her experience in them, and the varying attitudes of her mind. The early days of an acquaintance almost always have this importance for us, and fill up a larger space in our memory than longer subsequent periods which have been less filled with discovery and new impressions. There were not many hours in those ten days in which Mr. Stephen Guest was not seated by Lucy's side, or standing near her at the piano, or accompanying her on some outdoor excursion. His attentions were clearly becoming more assiduous, and that was what every one had expected. Lucy was very happy, all the happier because Stephen's society seemed to have become much more interesting and amusing since Maggie had been there. Playful discussions, sometimes serious ones, were going forward, in which both Stephen and Maggie revealed themselves to the admiration of the gentle, unobtrusive Lucy. And it more than once crossed her mind what a charming quartet they should have through life when Maggie married Philip. Is it an inexplicable thing that a girl should enjoy her lover's society the more for the presence of a third person, and be without the slightest spasm of jealousy that the third person had the conversation habitually directed to her? Not when that girl is as tranquil-hearted as Lucy, thoroughly possessed with a belief that she knows the state of her companion's affections, and not prone to the feelings which shake such a belief in the absence of positive evidence against it. Besides, it was Lucy by whom Stephen sat, to whom he gave his arm, to whom he appealed as the person sure to agree with him, and every day there was the same tender politeness towards her, the same consciousness of her wants and care to supply them. Was there really the same? It seemed to Lucy that there was more, and it was no wonder that the real significance of the change escaped her. It was a subtle act of conscience in Stephen, that even he himself was not aware of. His personal attentions to Maggie were comparatively slight, and there had even sprung up an apparent distance between them that prevented the renewal of that faint resemblance to gallantry into which he had fallen the first day in the boat. If Stephen came in when Lucy was out of the room, if Lucy left them together, they never spoke to each other. Stephen perhaps seemed to be examining books or music, and Maggie bent her head assiduously over her work. Each was oppressively conscious of the other's presence, even to the finger-ends. Yet each looked and longed for the same thing to happen the next day. Neither of them had begun to reflect on the matter, or silently to ask, "'To what does all this tend?' Maggie only felt that life was revealing something quite new to her, and she was absorbed in the direct, immediate experience— without any energy left for taking account of it, and reasoning about it. Stephen willfully abstained from self-questioning, and would not admit to himself that he felt an influence which was to have any determining effect on his conduct. And when Lucy came into the room again, they were once more unconstrained. Maggie could contradict Stephen and laugh at him, and he could recommend to her consideration the example of that most charming heroine, Miss Sophia Weston, who had a great respect for the understandings of men. Maggie could look at Stephen, which, for some reason or other, she always avoided when they were alone, and he could even ask her to play his accompaniment for him, since Lucy's fingers were so busy with that bazaar work, and lecture her on hurrying the tempo, which was certainly Maggie's weak point. One day, 
it was the day of Philip's return. Lucy had formed a sudden engagement to spend the evening with Mrs. Ken, whose delicate state of health, threatening to become confirmed illness through an attack of bronchitis, obliged her to resign her functions at the coming bazaar into the hands of other ladies, of whom she wished Lucy to be one. The engagement had been formed in Stephen's presence, and he had heard Lucy promise to rise early and call at six o'clock for Miss Torry, who brought Mrs. Ken's request. "'Here is another of the moral results of this idiotic bazaar,' Stephen burst forth, as soon as Miss Torry had left the room, "'taking young ladies from the duties of the domestic half into scenes of dissipation among urn-rugs and embroidered reticules. I should like to know what is the proper function of women if it is not to make reasons for husbands to stay at home, and still stronger reasons for bachelors to go out. If this goes on much longer, the bonds of society will be dissolved. "'Well, it will not go on much longer,' said Lucy, laughing, "'for the bazaar is to take place on Monday week.' "'Thank heaven!' said Stephen. "'Ken himself said the other day that he didn't like this plan of making vanity do the work of charity. But just as the British public is not reasonable enough to bear direct taxation, so St. Ogg's has not got force of motive enough to build and endow schools without calling in the force of folly.' "'Did he say so?' said little Lucy her hazel eyes opening wide with anxiety. I never heard him say anything of that kind. I thought he approved of what we were doing. "'I'm sure he approves you,' said Stephen, smiling at her affectionately. "'Your conduct in going out to-night looks vicious, I own, but I know there is benevolence at the bottom of it.' "'Oh, you think too well of me,' said Lucy, shaking her head with a pretty blush, and there the subject ended. But it was tacitly understood that Stephen would not come in the evening, and on the strength of that tacit understanding he made his morning visit the longer, not saying good-bye, until after four. Maggie was seated in the drawing-room alone shortly after dinner, with Minnie on her lap, having left her uncle to his wine and his nap, and her mother to the compromise between knitting and nodding, which, when there was no company, she always carried on in the dining-room till tea-time. Maggie was stooping to caress the tiny silken pet, and comforting him for his mistress's absence, when the sound of a footstep on the gravel made her look up, and she saw Mr. Stephen Guest walking up the garden as if he had come straight from the river. It was very unusual to see him so soon after dinner. He often complained that their dinner hour was late at Park House. Nevertheless, there he was in his black dress. He had evidently been home, and must have come again by the river. Maggie felt her cheeks glowing, and her heart beating. It was natural she should be nervous, for she was not accustomed to receive visitors alone. He had seen her look up through the open window, and raised his hat as he walked towards it, to enter that way instead of by the door. He blushed too, and certainly looked as foolish as a young man of some wit and self-possession can be expected to look, as he walked in with a roll of music in his hand, and said, with an air of hesitating improvisation, "'You are surprised to see me again, Miss Tulliver. I ought to apologise for coming upon you by surprise, but I wanted to come into the town, and I got our man to row me, so I thought I would bring these things from the maid of Artois for your cousin. I forgot them this morning. Will you give them to her?' Yes, said Maggie, who had risen confusedly with Minnie in her arms, and now, not quite knowing what else to do, sat down again. Stephen laid down his hat, with the music, 
which rolled on the floor and sat down in the chair close by her. He had never done so before, and both he and Maggie were quite aware that it was an entirely new position. "'Well, you pampered minion,' said Stephen, leaning to pull the long curly ears that drooped over Maggie's arm. It was not a suggestive remark, and as the speaker did not follow it up by further development, it naturally left the conversation at a standstill. It seemed to Stephen, like some action in a dream, that he was obliged to do, and wonder at himself all the while, to go on stroking Minnie's head. Yet it was very pleasant. He only wished he dared look at Maggie, and that she would look at him. Let him have one long look into those deep, strange eyes of hers, and then he would be satisfied, and quite reasonable after that. He thought it was becoming a sort of monomania with him to want that long look from Maggie, and he was racking his invention continually to find out some means by which he could have it without its appearing singular and entailing subsequent embarrassment. As for Maggie, she had no distinct thought, only the sense of a presence like that of a closely hovering, broad-winged bird in the darkness, for she was unable to look up, and saw nothing but Minnie's black wavy coat. "'But this must end some time. Perhaps it ended very soon, and only seemed long, as a minute's dream does. Stephen at last sat upright sideways in his chair, leaning one hand and arm over the back, and looking at Maggie. What should he say? "'We shall have a splendid sunset, I think. Shan't you go out and see it?' "'I don't know,' said Maggie. Then, courageously raising her eyes and looking out of the window, "'If I'm not playing cribbage with my uncle—' A pause, during which Minnie is stroked again, but has sufficient insight not to be grateful for it, to growl, rather. "'Do you like sitting alone?' A rather arch look came over Maggie's face, and just glancing at Stephen, she said, "'Would it be quite civil to say yes?' "'It was a rather dangerous question for an intruder to ask,' said Stephen, delighted with that glance, and getting determined to stay for another. "'But you will have more than half an hour to yourself after I am gone,' he added, taking out his watch. "'I know Mr. Dean never comes in till half-past seven. Another pause, during which Maggie looked steadily out of the window, till by a great effort she moved her head to look down at Minnie's back again, and said, "'I wish Lucy had not been obliged to go out. We'd lose our music.' "'We shall have a new voice to-morrow night,' said Stephen. "'Will you tell your cousin that our friend Philip Wakeham is come back? I saw him as I went home.' Maggie gave a little start. It seemed hardly more than a vibration that passed from head to foot in an instant. But the new images summoned by Philip's name dispersed half the oppressive spell she had been under. She rose from her chair with a sudden resolution, and, laying Minnie on his cushion, went to reach Lucy's large work-basket from its corner. Stephen was vexed and disappointed. He thought, perhaps, Maggie didn't like the name of Wakeham to be mentioned to her in that abrupt way, for he now recalled what Lucy had told him of the family quarrel. It was of no use to stay any longer. Maggie was seating herself at the table with her work, and looking chill and proud, and he? He looked like a simpleton for having come. A gratuitous, entirely superfluous visit of that sort was sure to make a man disagreeable and ridiculous. 
Of course it was palpable to Maggie's thinking that he had dined hastily in his own room for the sake of setting off again and finding her alone. A boyish state of mind for an accomplished young gentleman of five-and-twenty, not without legal knowledge, but a reference to history, perhaps, may make it not incredible. At this moment Maggie's ball of knitting-wool rolled along the ground, and she started up to reach it. Stephen rose too, and picking up the ball, met her with a vexed, complaining look that gave his eyes quite a new expression to Maggie, whose own eyes met them as he presented the ball to her. "'Good-bye,' said Stephen, in a tone that had the same beseeching discontent as his eyes. He dared not put out his hand. He thrust both hands into his tail-pockets as he spoke. Maggie thought she had perhaps been rude. "'Won't you stay?' she said timidly, not looking away, for that would have seemed rude again. "'No, thank you,' said Stephen, looking still into the half-unwilling, half-fascinated eyes, as a thirsty man looks towards the track of the distant brook. "'The boat is waiting for me. You'll tell your cousin?' "'Yes, that I brought the music, I mean. Yes, and that Philip is coming back. Yes, Maggie did not notice Philip's name this time. "'Won't you come out a little way into the garden?' said Stephen, in a still gentler tone. But the next moment he was vexed that she did not say no, for she moved away now towards the open window, and he was obliged to take his hat and walk by her side. But he thought of something to make him amends. "'Do take my arm,' he said in a low tone, as if it were a secret. There is something strangely winning to most women in that offer of the firm arm. The help is not wanted physically at that moment, but the sense of help, the presence of strength that is outside them and yet theirs, meets a continual want of the imagination. Either on that ground or some other, Maggie took the arm, and they walked together round the grass-plot and under the drooping green of the laburnums, in the same dim, dreamy state as they had been in a quarter of an hour before, only that Stephen had had the look he longed for, without yet perceiving in himself the symptoms of returning reasonableness and Maggie had darting thoughts across the dimness. How came she to be there? Why had she come out? Not a word was spoken. If it had been, each would have been less intensely conscious of the other. "'Take care of this step,' said Stephen at last. "'Oh, I will go in now,' said Maggie, feeling that the step had come like a rescue. "'Good evening.' In an instant she had withdrawn her arm, and was running back to the house. She did not reflect that this sudden action would only add to the embarrassing recollections of the last half-hour. She had no thought left for that. She only threw herself into the low armchair and burst into tears. "'Oh, Philip, Philip, I wish we were together again, so quietly in the red deeps.' Stephen looked after her a moment, and then went on to the boat, and was soon landed at the wharf. He spent the evening in the billiard-room, smoking one cigar after another, and losing lives at pool. But he would not leave off. He was determined not to think, not to admit any more distinct remembrance than was urged upon him by the perpetual presence of Maggie. He was looking at her, and she was on his arm. But there came the necessity of walking home in the cool starlight, and with it the necessity of cursing his own folly 
and bitterly determining that he would never trust himself alone with Maggie again. It was all madness. He was in love, thoroughly attached to Lucy, and engaged, engaged as strongly as an honourable man need be. He wished he had never seen this Maggie Tulliver to be thrown into a fever by her in this way. She would make a sweet, strange, troublesome, adorable wife to some man or other, but he would never have chosen her himself. Did she feel as he did? He hoped she did. Not. He ought not to have gone. He would master himself in future. He would make himself disagreeable to her, quarrel with her, perhaps. Quarrel with her? Was it possible to quarrel with a creature who had such eyes, defying and deprecating, contradicting and clinging, imperious and beseeching, full of delicious opposites. To see such a creature subdued by love for one would be a lot worth having to another man. There was a muttered exclamation which ended this inward soliloquy, as Stephen threw away the end of his last cigar, and, thrusting his hands into his pockets, stalked along at a quieter pace through the shrubbery. It was not of a benedictory kind. End of chapter 6 of Book Sixth Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Seven of Book Sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Philip re enters. The next morning was very wet, the sort of morning on which male neighbours who have no imperative occupation at home are likely to pay their fair friends an illimitable visit. The rain, which has been endurable enough for the walk or ride one way, is sure to become so heavy, and at the same time so certain to clear up by and by, that nothing but an open quarrel can abbreviate the visit. Latent detestation will not do at all. And if people happen to be lovers, what can be so delightful in England as a rainy morning? English sunshine is dubious, bonnets are never quite secure, and if you sit down on the grass it may lead to catars. But the rain is to be depended on. You gallop through it in a mackintosh, and presently find yourself in the seat you like best, a little above or a little below the one on which your goddess sits. It is the same thing to the metaphysical mind, and that is the reason why women are at once worshipped and looked down upon, with the satisfactory confidence that there will be no lady callers. "'Stephen will come earlier this morning, I know,' said Lucy. "'He always does when it's rainy.' Maggie made no answer. She was angry with Stephen. She began to think she should dislike him and if it had not been for the rain she would have gone to her aunt Glegg's this morning, and so have avoided him altogether. As it was, she must find some reason for remaining out of the room with her mother. But Stephen did not come earlier, and there was another visitor, a nearer neighbour, who preceded him. When Philip entered the room, he was going merely to bow to Maggie, feeling that their acquaintance was a secret which he was bound not to betray. But when she advanced towards him and put out her hand, he guessed at once that Lucy had been taken into her confidence. It was a moment of some agitation to both, though Philip had spent many hours in preparing for it but like all persons who have passed through life with little expectation of sympathy, he seldom lost his self-control, and shrank with the most sensitive pride from any noticeable betrayal of emotion. 
a little extra paleness, a little tension of the nostril when he spoke, and the voice pitched in a rather higher key, that to strangers would seem expressive of cold indifference, were all the signs Philip usually gave of an inward drama that was not without its fierceness. But Maggie, who had little more power of concealing the impressions made upon her than if she had been constructed of musical strings, felt her eyes getting larger with tears as they took each other's hands in silence. They were not painful tears. They had rather something of the same origin as the tears women and children shed when they have found some protection to cling to and look back on the threatened danger. For Philip, who a little while ago was associated continually in Maggie's mind with the sense that Tom might reproach her with some justice, had now in this short space become a sort of outward conscience to her that she might fly to for rescue and strength. Her tranquil, tender affection for Philip, with its root deep down in her childhood, and its memories of long quiet talk confirming by distinct successive impressions the first instinctive bias, the fact that in him the appeal was more strongly to her pity and womanly devotedness than to her vanity or other egoistic excitability of her nature, seemed now to make a sort of sacred place, a sanctuary where she could find refuge from an alluring influence which the best part of herself must resist, which must bring horrible tumult within, wretchedness without. This new sense of her relation to Philip multiplied the anxious scruples she would otherwise have felt, lest she should overstep the limit of intercourse with him that Tom would sanction and she put out her hand to him, and felt the tears in her eyes without any consciousness of an inward check. The scene was just what Lucy expected, and her kind heart delighted in bringing Philip and Maggie together again, though, even with all her regard for Philip, she could not resist the impression that her cousin Tom had some excuse for feeling shocked at the physical incongruity between the two. A prosaic person like Cousin Tom, who didn't like poetry and fairy tales. But she began to speak as soon as possible, to set them at ease. "'This was very good and virtuous of you,' she said in her pretty treble, like the low conversational notes of little birds, to come so soon after your arrival. And as it is, I think I will pardon you for running away in an inopportune manner, and giving your friends no notice. Come and sit down here, she went on, placing the chair that would suit him best, and you shall find yourself treated mercifully. You will never govern well, Miss Dean, said Philip, as he seated himself, because no one will ever believe in your severity. People will always encourage themselves in misdemeanours by the certainty that you will be indulgent. Lucy gave some playful contradiction, but Philip did not hear what it was, for he had naturally turned towards Maggie, and she was looking at him with that open, affectionate scrutiny which we give to a friend from whom we have been long separated. What a moment their parting had been! and Philip felt as if he were only in the morrow of it. He felt this so keenly, with such intense detailed remembrance, with such passionate revival of all that had been said and looked in their last conversation, that with that jealousy and distrust which in diffident natures is almost inevitably linked with a strong feeling, he thought he read in Maggie's glance and manner the evidence of a change. The very fact that he feared and half expected it would be sure to make this thought rush in, in the absence of positive proof to the contrary. "'I am having a great holiday, am I not?' said Maggie. "'Lucy is like a fairy godmother. She has turned me from a drudge into a princess in no time. I do nothing but indulge myself all day long.' 
and she always finds out what I want before I know it myself. "'I'm sure she is the happier for having you, then,' said Philip. "'You must be better than a whole menagerie of pets to her. "'And you look well. You are benefiting by the change.' Artificial conversation of this sort went on a little while, till Lucy, determined to put an end to it, exclaimed with a good imitation of annoyance that she had forgotten something, and was quickly out of the room. In a moment Maggie and Philip leaned forward, and the hands were clasped again with a look of sad contentment like that of friends who meet in the memory of recent sorrow. "'I told my brother I wished to see you, Philip. I asked him to release me from my promise, and he consented. Maggie, in her impulsiveness, wanted Philip to know at once the position they must hold towards each other. But she checked herself. The things that had happened since he had spoken of his love for her were so painful that she shrank from being the first to allude to them. It seemed almost like an injury towards Philip even to mention her brother, her brother who had insulted him. But he was thinking too entirely of her to be sensitive on any other point at that moment. "'Then we can at least be friends, Maggie. There is nothing to hinder that now.' "'Will not your father object?' said Maggie, withdrawing her hand. "'I should not give you up on any ground but your own wish, Maggie,' said Philip, colouring. "'There are points on which I should always resist, my father, as I used to tell you. "'That is one. "'Then there is nothing to hinder our being friends, Philip, "'seeing each other and talking to each other while I am here. "'I shall soon go away again. "'I mean to go very soon to a new situation.' "'Is that inevitable, Maggie?' "'Yes, I must not stay here long. "'It would unfit me for the life I must begin again at last. "'I can't live in dependence. "'I can't live with my brother, though he is very good to me. "'He would like to provide for me. "'But that would be intolerable to me.' "'Philip was silent a few moments.' and then said in that high, feeble voice, which with him indicated the resolute suppression of emotion, "'Is there no other alternative, Maggie? Is that life, away from those who love you, the only one you will allow yourself to look forward to?' "'Yes, Philip,' she said, looking at him pleadingly, as if she entreated him to believe that she was compelled to this course, at least as things are. I don't know what may be in years to come, but I begin to think there can never come much happiness to me from loving. I have always had so much pain mingled with it. I wish I could make myself a world outside it, as men do. Now you are returning to your old thought in a new form, Maggie. The thought I used to combat, said Philip, with a slight tinge of bitterness. You want to find out a mode of renunciation that will be an escape from pain. I tell you again, there is no such escape possible except by perverting or mutilating one's nature. What would become of me if I tried to escape from pain? Scorn and cynicism would be my only opium, unless I could fall into some kind of conceited madness and fancy myself a favourite of heaven, because I am not a favourite with men. The bitterness had taken on some impetuosity as Philip went on speaking. The words were evidently an outlet for some immediate feeling of his own, as well as an answer to Maggie. There was a pain pressing on him in that moment. He shrank with proud delicacy from the faintest allusion to the words of love, of plighted love that had passed between them. It would have seemed to him like reminding Maggie of a promise. It would have had for him something of the baseness of compulsion. He would not dwell on the fact that he himself had not changed. 
for that too would have had the air of an appeal. His love for Maggie was stamped even more than the rest of his experience, with the exaggerated sense that he was an exception, that she, that every one, saw him in the light of an exception. But Maggie was conscience-stricken. "'Yes, Philip,' she said, with her childish contrition when he used to chide her, "'you are right, I know. I do always think too much of my own feelings, and not enough of others, not enough of yours. I had need have you always to find fault with me and teach me. So many things have come true that you used to tell me.' Maggie was resting her elbow on the table, leaning her head on her hand, and looking at Philip with half-penitent, dependent affection as she said this, while he was returning her gaze with an expression that, to her consciousness, gradually became less vague, became charged with a specific recollection. Had his mind flown back to something that she now remembered, something about a lover of Lucy's? It was a thought that made her shudder. It gave new definiteness to her present position, and to the tendency of what had happened the evening before. She moved her arm from the table, urged to change her position by that positive physical oppression at the heart that sometimes accompanies a sudden mental pang. "'What is the matter, Maggie? Has something happened?' Philip said in inexpressible anxiety, his imagination being only too ready to weave everything that was fatal to them both. "'No, nothing,' said Maggie, rousing her latent will. Philip must not have that odious thought in his mind. She would banish it from her own. "'Nothing,' she repeated, "'except in my own mind.' You used to say I should feel the effect of my starved life, as you called it, and I do. I am too eager in my enjoyment of music, and all luxuries, now they are come to me. She took up her work, and occupied herself resolutely while Philip watched her, really in doubt whether she had anything more than this general illusion in her mind. It was quite in Maggie's character to be agitated by vague self-reproach, but soon there came a violent, well-known ring at the doorbell resounding through the house. "'Oh, what a startling announcement!' said Maggie, quite mistress of herself, though not without some inward flutter. "'I wonder where Lucy is.' Lucy had not been deaf to the signal and after an interval long enough for a few solicitous but not hurried inquiries, she herself ushered Stephen in. "'Well, old fellow,' he said, going straight up to Philip, and shaking him heartily by the hand, bowing to Maggie in passing, "'it's glorious to have you back again, only I wish you'd conduct yourself a little less like a sparrow with a residence on the housetop, and not go in and out constantly without letting the servants know.' This is about the twentieth time I've had to scamper up those countless stairs to that painting-room of yours, all to no purpose, because your people thought you were at home. Such incidents embitter friendship. I've so few visitors, it seems hardly worth while to leave notice of my exit and entrances, said Philip, feeling rather oppressed just then by Stephen's bright, strong presence, and strong voice. "'Are you quite well this morning, Miss Tolliver?' said Stephen, turning to Maggie with stiff politeness, and putting out his hand with the air of fulfilling a social duty. Maggie gave the tips of her fingers, and said, "'Quite well, thank you,' in a tone of proud indifference. Philip's eyes were watching them keenly, but Lucy was used to seeing variations in their manner to each other, and only thought with regret that there was some natural antipathy which every now and then surmounted their mutual good will. "'Maggie is not the sort of woman Stephen admires, and she is irritated by something in him which she interprets as conceit,' 
was the silent observation that accounted for everything to guileless Lucy. Stephen and Maggie had no sooner completed this studied greeting than each felt hurt by the other's coldness. And Stephen, while rattling on in questions to Philip about his recent sketching expedition, was thinking all the more about Maggie, because he was not drawing her into the conversation, as he had invariably done before. "'Maggie and Philip are not looking happy,' thought Lucy. "'This first interview has been saddening to them. "'I think we people who have not been galloping,' she said to Stephen, "'are all a little damped by the rain. "'Let us have some music. "'We ought to take advantage of having Philip and you together. "'Give us the duet in Massaniello. "'Maggie has not heard that, and I know it will suit her. "'Come, then,' said Stephen, going towards the piano, and giving a foretaste of the tune in his deep brum-brum, very pleasant to hear. "'You please, Philip, you play the accompaniment,' said Lucy, "'and then I can go on with my work. "'You will like to play, shan't you?' she added, with a pretty inquiring look, anxious as usual, lest she should have proposed what was not pleasant to another, but with yearnings towards her unfinished embroidery. Philip had brightened at the proposition, for there is no feeling, perhaps, except the extremes of fear and grief, that does not find relief in music, that does not make a man sing or play the better, and Philip had an abundance of pent-up feeling at this moment, as complex as any trio or quartet that was ever meant to express love and jealousy, and resignation and fierce suspicion, all at the same time. "'Oh, yes,' he said, seating himself at the piano, "'it is a way of eking out one's imperfect life, and being three people at once, to sing and make the piano sing, and hear them both all the while, or else to sing and paint.' "'Ah, there you are an enviable fellow. "'I can do nothing with my hands,' said Philip. "'That has generally been observed in men of great administrative capacity, I believe. "'A tendency to predominance of the reflective powers in me. "'Haven't you observed that, Miss Tulliver?' Stephen had fallen by mistake into his habit of playful appeal to Maggie and she could not repress the answering flush and epigram. "'I have observed a tendency to predominance,' she said, smiling, and Philip at that moment devoutly hoped that she had found the tendency disagreeable. "'Come, come,' said Lucy. "'Music, music! We will discuss each other's qualities another time.' Maggie always tried in vain to go on with her work when music began. She tried harder than ever to-day, for the thought that Stephen knew how much she cared for his singing was one that no longer roused a merely playful resistance, and she knew, too, that it was his habit always to stand so that he could look at her. But it was of no use. She soon threw her work down, and all her intentions were lost in the vague state of emotion produced by the inspiring duet, emotion that seemed to make her at once strong and weak, strong for all enjoyment, weak for all resistance. When the strain passed into the minor, she half started from her seat with the sudden thrill of that change. Poor Maggie! She looked very beautiful when her soul was being played on in this way by the inexorable power of sound. You might have seen the slightest perceptible quivering through her whole frame as she leaned a little forward, clasping her hands as if to steady herself, while her eyes dilated and brightened into that wide-open, childish expression of wondering delight which always came back in her happiest moments. Lucy, who at other times had always been at the piano when Maggie was looking in this way, could not resist the impulse to steal up to her and kiss her. Philip, too, 
caught a glimpse of her now and then round the open book on the desk, and felt that he had never before seen her under so strong an influence. "'More, more!' said Lucy, when the duet had been encored. "'Something spirited again. Maggie always says she likes a great rush of sound.' "'It must be, let us take the road, then,' said Stephen, "'so suitable for a wet morning. "'But are you prepared to abandon the most sacred duties of life, "'and come and sing with us?' "'Oh, yes,' said Lucy, laughing. "'If you will look out the beggar's opera from the large Canterbury, "'it has a dingy cover.' "'That is a great clue.' "'Considering there are about a score covers here of rival dinginess,' said Stephen, drawing out the Canterbury. "'Oh, play something the while, Philip,' said Lucy, noticing that his fingers were wandering over the keys. "'What is that you are falling into? Something delicious that I don't know?' "'Don't you know that?' said Philip, bringing out the tune more definitely. "'It's from the Somnambula.' "'Ah! Pacem non posso odiati. "'I don't know the opera, but it appears the tenor is telling the heroine "'that he shall always love her, though she may forsake him. "'You've heard me sing it to the English words, I love thee still.' "'It was not quite unintentionally that Philip had wandered into this song.' which might be an indirect expression to Maggie of what he could not prevail on himself to say to her directly. Her ears had been open to what he was saying, and when he began to sing, she understood the plaintive passion of the music. That pleading tenor had no very fine qualities as a voice, but it was not quite new to her. It had sung to her by snatches in a subdued way among the grassy walks and hollows, and underneath the leaning ash-tree in the red deeps. There seemed to be some reproach in the words. Did Philip mean that? She wished she had assured him more distinctly in their conversation that she desired not to renew the hope of love between them, only because it clashed with her inevitable circumstances. She was touched, not thrilled, by the song. It suggested distinct memories and thoughts, and brought quiet regret in the place of excitement. "'That's the way with you tenors,' said Stephen, who was waiting, with music in his hand, while Philip finished the song. "'You demoralise the fair sex by warbling your sentimental love and constancy under all sorts of vile treatment.' "'Nothing short of having your head served up in a dish like that medieval tenor or troubadour "'would prevent you from expressing your entire resignation. "'I must administer an antidote while Miss Dean prepares to tear herself away from her bobbins.' "'Stephen rolled out with saucy energy. "'Shall I wasting in despair?' die because a woman's fair and seemed to make all the air in the room alive with a new influence lucy always proud of what stephen did went towards the piano with laughing admiring looks at him and maggie in spite of her resistance to the spirit of the song and to the singer was taken hold of and shaken by the invisible influence was borne along by a wave too strong for her but angrily resolved not to betray herself she seized her work and went on making false stitches and pricking her fingers with much perseverance not looking up or taking notice of what was going forward, until all three voices united in Let Us Take the Road. I am afraid there would have been a subtle, stealing gratification in her mind if she had known how entirely this saucy, defiant Stephen was occupied with her, how he was passing rapidly from a determination to treat her with ostentatious indifference to an irritating desire for some sign of inclination from her, some interchange of subdued word or look with her. It was not long before he found an opportunity, when they had passed to the music of The Tempest. Maggie, 
feeling the need of a footstool, was walking across the room to get one, when Stephen, who was not singing just then, and was conscious of all her movements, guessed her want, and flew to anticipate her, lifting the footstool with an entreating look at her, which made it impossible not to return a glance of gratitude. And then, to have the footstool placed carefully by a too self-confident personage, not any self-confident personage, but one in particular, who suddenly looks humble and anxious, and lingers bending still to ask if there is not some draught in that position between the window and the fireplace, and if he may not be allowed to move the work-table for her. These things will summon a little of the too ready traitorous tenderness into a woman's eyes, compelled as she is in her girlish time to learn her life lessons in very trivial language. And to Maggie such things had not been everyday incidents, but were a new element in her life, and found her keen appetite for homage quite fresh. That tone of gentle solicitude obliged her to look at the face that was bent towards her, and to say, "'No, thank you,' and nothing could prevent that mutual glance from being delicious to both, as it had been the evening before. But it was an ordinary act of politeness in Stephen. It had hardly taken two minutes, and Lucy, who was singing, scarcely noticed it but to Philip's mind, filled already with a vague anxiety that was likely to find a definite ground for itself in any trivial incident, this sudden eagerness in Stephen, and the change in Maggie's face, which was plainly reflecting a beam from his, seemed so strong a contrast with the previous overwrought signs of indifference as to be charged with painful meaning. Stephen's voice, pouring in again, jarred upon his nervous susceptibility as if it had been the clang of sheet-iron, and he felt inclined to make the piano shriek in utter discord. He had really seen no communicable ground for suspecting any unusual feeling between Stephen and Maggie. His own reason told him so, and he wanted to go home at once, that he might reflect coolly on these false images, till he had convinced himself of their nullity. But then again he wanted to stay as long as Stephen stayed, always to be present when Stephen was present with Maggie. It seemed to poor Philip so natural, nay, inevitable, that any man who was near Maggie should fall in love with her. There was no promise of happiness for her if she were beguiled into loving Stephen Guest, and this thought emboldened Philip to view his own love for her in the light of a less unequal offering. He was beginning to play very falsely under this deafening inward tumult, and Lucy was looking at him in astonishment when Mrs. Tulliver's entrance to summon them to lunch came as an excuse for abruptly breaking off the music. "'Ah, Mr. Philip,' said Mr. Dean, when they entered the dining-room, "'I've not seen you for a long while. Your father's not at home, I think, is he? I went after him to the office the other day, and they said he was out of town. "'He's been to Mudport on business for several days,' said Philip, "'but he's come back now.' "'as fond of his farming hobby as ever, eh?' "'I believe so,' said Philip, rather wondering at this sudden interest in his father's pursuits. "'Ah,' said Mr. Dean, "'he's got some land in his own hands on this side the river as well as the other, I think.' "'Yes, he has.' "'Ah,' continued Mr. Dean, as he dispensed the pigeon pie, he must find farming a heavy item, an expensive hobby. I never had a hobby myself, never would give in to that, and the worst of all hobbies are those that people think they can get money at. They shoot their money down like corn out of a sack, then. 
Lucy felt a little nervous under her father's apparently gratuitous criticism of Mr. Wakeham's expenditure. But it ceased there, and Mr. Dean became unusually silent and meditative during his luncheon. Lucy, accustomed to watch all indications in her father, and having reasons which had recently become strong for an extra interest in what referred to the Wakeham's, felt an unusual curiosity to know what had prompted her father's questions. His subsequent silence made her suspect there had been some special reason for them in his mind. With this idea in her head, she resorted to her usual plan when she wanted to tell or ask her father anything particular. She found a reason for her Aunt Tulliver to leave the dining-room after dinner, and seated herself on a small stool at her father's knee. Mr. Dean, under those circumstances, considered that he tasted some of the most agreeable moments his merits had purchased him in life, notwithstanding that Lucy, disliking to have her hair powdered with snuff, usually began by mastering his snuff-box on such occasions. "'You don't want to go to sleep yet, papa, do you?' she said, as she brought up her stool and, and opened the large fingers that clutched the snuff-box. "'Not yet,' said Mr. Dean, glancing at the reward of merit in the decanter. "'But what do you want?' he added pinching the dimpled chin fondly. "'To cork some more sovereigns out of my pocket for your bazaar, eh?' "'No, I have no base motives at all to-day. I only want to talk, not to beg. I want to know what made you ask Philip Wakeham about his father's farming to-day, papa. It seemed rather odd, because you never hardly say anything to him about his father, and why should you care about Mr. Wakeham's losing money by his hobby?' "'Something to do with business,' said Mr. Dean, waving his hands, as if to repel intrusion into that mystery. "'But, papa, you always say Mr. Wakeham has brought Philip up like a girl. How came you to think you should get any business knowledge out of him?' Those abrupt questions sounded rather oddly. Philip thought them queer. "'Nonsense, child,' said Mr. Dean, willing to justify his social demeanour, with which he had taken some pains in his upward progress. "'There's a report that Wakeham's mill and farm on the other side of the river, Dalkert Mill, your Uncle Tulliver's, you know, isn't answering so well as it did.' I wanted to see if your friend Philip would let anything out about his father's being tired of farming. "'Why, would you buy the mill, papa, if he would part with it?' said Lucy eagerly. "'Oh, tell me everything. Here, you shall have your snuff-box, if you'll tell me. Because Maggie says all their hearts are set on Tom's getting back the mill some time. It was one of the last things her father said to Tom— that he must get back the mill. "'Hush, you little puss,' said Mr. Dean, availing himself of the restored snuff-box. "'You must not say a word about this thing, do you hear? There's very little chance of their getting the mill, or of anybody's getting it out of Wakeham's hands. And if he knew that we wanted it with a view to the Tulliver's getting it again, he'd be the less happy to part with it. It's natural after what happened.' He behaved well enough to Tulliver before, but a horse-whipping is not likely to be paid for with sugar-plums. "'Now, papa,' said Lucy, with a little air of solemnity, "'will you trust me? You must not ask me all my reasons for what I am going to say. Now, papa,' said Lucy, with a little air of solemnity, "'will you trust me?' "'You must not ask me all my reasons for what I am going to say, "'but I have very strong reasons, and I am very cautious. "'I am, indeed.' "'Well, let us hear.' "'Why, I believe, if you will let me take Philip Wakeham into our confidence, "'let me tell him all about your wish to buy and what it's for, "'that my cousins wish to have it, and why they wish to have it, I believe Philip would help to bring it about. 
I know he would desire to do it. "'I don't see how that can be, child,' said Mr. Dean, looking puzzled. "'Why should he care?' Then, with a sudden penetrating look at his daughter, "'You don't think the poor lad's fond of you, and so you can make him do what you like?' Mr. Dean felt quite safe about his daughter's affections. "'No, papa, he cares very little about me, not so much as I care about him. But I have a reason for being quite sure of what I say. Don't you ask me, and if you ever guess, don't tell me. Only give me leave to do as I think fit about it.' Lucy rose from her stool to seat herself on her father's knee, and kissed him with that last request. "'Are you sure you won't do mischief now?' he said, looking at her with delight. "'Yes, papa. Quite sure. I'm very wise. I've got all your business talents. Didn't you admire my account book now when I showed it you?' "'Well, well, if this youngster will keep his counsel, there won't be much harm done. And to tell the truth, I think there's not much chance for us any other way. Now let me go off to sleep. End of chapter 7 of Book 6 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 8 of Book 6 of the Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Wakem in a New Light. Before three days had passed after the conversation you have just overheard between Lucy and her father, she had contrived to have a private interview with Philip during a visit of Maggie's to her Aunt Glegg. For a day and a night Philip turned over in his mind with restless agitation all that Lucy had told him in that interview, till he had thoroughly resolved on a course of action. He thought he saw before him now a possibility of altering his position with respect to Maggie, and removing at least one obstacle between them. He laid his plan and calculated all his moves with the fervid deliberation of a chess-player in the days of his first ardour, and was amazed himself at his sudden genius as a tactician. His plan was as bold as it was thoroughly calculated. Having watched for a moment when his father had nothing more urgent on his hands than the newspaper, he went behind him, laid a hand on his shoulder, and said, "'Father, will you come up into my sanctum and look at my new sketches? I've arranged them now.' "'I'm getting terribly stiff in the joints, Phil, for climbing those stairs of yours,' said Wakem, looking kindly at his son as he laid down his paper. "'But come along, then.' "'This is a nice place for you, isn't it, Phil?' A capital light, that from the roof, eh? was, as usual, the first thing he said on entering the painting-room. He liked to remind himself, and his son too, that his fatherly indulgence had provided the accommodation. He had been a good father. Emily would have nothing to reproach him with there, if she came back again from her grave. "'Come, come,' he said putting his double eyeglass over his nose, and seating himself to take a general view while he rested. "'You've got a famous show here. Upon my word, I don't see that your things aren't as good as that London artist's, what's his name, that Leyburn gave so much money for.' Philip shook his head and smiled. He had seated himself on his painting-stool, and had taken a lead pencil in his hand, with which he was making strong marks to counteract the sense of tremulousness. He watched his father get up, and walk slowly round, 
good-naturedly dwelling on the pictures much longer than his amount of genuine taste for landscape would have prompted, till he stopped before a stand on which two pictures were placed, one much larger than the other, the smaller one in a leather case. "'Bless me, what have you here?' said Wakem, startled by a sudden transition from landscape to portrait. "'I thought you'd left off figures. Who are these?' "'They are the same person,' said Philip, with calm promptness, "'at different ages.' "'And what person?' said Wakem sharply, fixing his eyes with a growing look of suspicion on the larger picture. "'Miss Tulliver, the small one is something like what she was when I was at school with her brother at King's Lawton. The larger one is not quite so good a likeness of what she was when I came from abroad.' Wakem turned round fiercely, with a flushed face, letting his eyeglass fall, and looking at his son with a savage expression for a moment, as if he was ready to strike that daring feebleness from the stool. But he threw himself into the armchair again, and thrust his hands into his trouser pockets, still looking angrily at his son, however. Philip did not return the look, but sat quietly watching the point of his pencil. "'And do you mean to say, then, that you have had any acquaintance with her since you came from abroad?' said Wakem at last, with that vain effort which rage always makes to throw as much punishment as it desires to inflict into words and tones, since blows are forbidden. "'Yes,' I saw a great deal of her for a whole year before her father's death. We met often in that thicket, the Red Deeps, near Dorcott Mill. I love her dearly. I shall never love any other woman. I have thought of her ever since she was a little girl. Go on, sir, and you have corresponded with her all this while? No. I never told her I loved her, till just before we parted, and she promised her brother not to see me again, or to correspond with me. I am not sure that she loves me, or would consent to marry me. But if she would consent, if she did love me well enough, I should marry her. And this is the return you make me, for all the indulgences I've heaped on you? said Wakem, getting white, and beginning to tremble under an enraged sense of impotence before Philip's calm defiance and concentration of purpose. "'No, father,' said Philip, looking up at him for the first time, "'I don't regard it as a return. You have been an indulgent father to me, but I have always felt that it was because you had an affectionate wish to give me as much happiness as my unfortunate lot would admit, not that it was a debt you expected me to pay by sacrificing all my chances of happiness to satisfy feelings of yours which I can never share. I think most sons would share their father's feelings in this case, said Wakem bitterly. The girl's father was an ignorant, mad brute, who was within an inch of murdering me. The whole town knows it, and the brother is just as insolent, only in a cooler way. He forbade her seeing you, you say. He'll break every bone in your body for your greater happiness, if you don't take care. But you seem to have made up your mind. You have counted the consequences, I suppose. "'Of course you are independent of me. "'You can marry this girl to-morrow, if you like. "'You are a man of five-and-twenty. "'You can go your way, and I can go mine. "'We need have no more to do with each other.' "'Wakem rose and walked towards the door, "'but something held him back, "'and instead of leaving the room he walked up and down it. Philip was slow to reply, and when he spoke, his tone 
had a more incisive quietness and clearness than ever. "'No, I can't marry Miss Tulliver, even if she would have me, if I have only my own resources to maintain her with. I have been brought up to no profession. I can't offer her poverty as well as deformity.' "'Ah, there is a reason for clinging to me, doubtless,' said Wakem, still bitterly, though Philip's last words had given him a pang. They had stirred a feeling which had been a habit for a quarter of a century. He threw himself into the chair again. "'I expected all this,' said Philip. "'I know these scenes are often happening between father and son. If I were like other men of my age, I might answer your angry words by still angrier. We might part.' I should marry the woman I love, and have a chance of being as happy as the rest. But if it will be a satisfaction to you to annihilate the very object of everything you've done for me, you have an advantage over most fathers. You can completely deprive me of the only thing that would make my life worth having. Philip paused, but his father was silent. "'You know best what satisfaction you would have "'beyond that of gratifying a ridiculous rancour "'worthy only of wandering savages.' "'Ridiculous rancour!' Wakem burst out. "'What do you mean? "'Damn it! "'Is a man to be horsewhipped by a boor and love him for it? "'Besides, there's that cold, proud devil of a son who said a word to me, I shall not forget, when we had the settling. He would be as pleasant a mark for a bullet as I know, if he were worth the expense. "'I don't mean your resentment towards them,' said Philip, who had his reasons for some sympathy with this view of Tom, though a feeling of revenge is not worth much that you should care to keep it. I mean your extending the enmity to a helpless girl who has too much sense and goodness to share their narrow prejudices. She has never entered into the family quarrels. What does that signify? We don't ask what a woman does. We ask whom she belongs to. "'It's altogether a degrading thing to you to think of marrying old Tulliver's daughter.' For the first time in the dialogue, Philip lost some of his self-control, and coloured with anger. "'Miss Tulliver,' he said, with bitter incisiveness, "'has the only grounds of rank that anything but vulgar folly can suppose to belong to the middle class.' She is thoroughly refined, and her friends, whatever else they may be, are respected for irreproachable honour and integrity. All St. Ogg's, I fancy, would pronounce her to be more than my equal. Wakem darted a glance of fierce question at his son, but Philip was not looking at him and with a certain penitent consciousness went on in a few moments, as if in amplification of his last words, "'Find a single person in St. Ogg's who will not tell you that a beautiful creature like her would be throwing herself away on a pitiable object like me?' "'Not she!' said Wakem, rising again, and forgetting everything else in a burst of resentful pride, half fatherly, half personal. It would be a deuced fine match for her. It's all stuff about an accidental deformity when a girl's really attached to a man. But girls are not apt to get attached under those circumstances, said Philip. Well then, said Wakem, rather brutally, trying to recover his previous position, if she doesn't care for you, you might have spared yourself the trouble of talking to me about her, and you might have spared me the trouble of refusing my consent to what was never likely to happen. 
Wakem strode to the door, and without looking round again, banged it after him. Philip was not without confidence that his father would be ultimately wrought upon as he had expected by what had passed, but the scene had jarred upon his nerves, which were as sensitive as a woman's. He determined not to go down to dinner. He couldn't meet his father again that day. It was Wakem's habit, when he had no company at home, to go out in the evening, often as early as half-past seven, and as it was far on in the afternoon now, Philip locked up his room and went out for a long ramble, thinking he would not return until his father was out of the house again. He got into a boat, and went down the river to a favourite village, where he dined, and lingered till it was late enough for him to return. He had never had any sort of quarrel with his father before, and had a sickening fear that this contest, just begun, might go on for weeks, and what might not happen in that time. He would not allow himself to define what that involuntary question meant. But if he could once be in the position of Maggie's accepted, acknowledged lover, there would be less room for vague dread. He went up to his painting-room again, and threw himself with a sense of fatigue into the armchair, looking round absently at the views of water and rock that were ranged around, till he fell into a doze, in which he fancied Maggie was slipping down a glistening, green, slimy channel of a waterfall, and he was looking on helpless, till he was awakened by what seemed a sudden, awful crash. It was the opening of the door, and he could hardly have dozed more than a few moments, for there was no perceptible change in the evening light. It was his father who entered, and when Philip moved to vacate the chair for him, he said, "'Sit still. I'd rather walk about.' He stalked up and down the room once or twice, and then, standing opposite Philip, with his hand thrust in his side pockets, he said, as if continuing a conversation that had not broken off, "'But this girl seems to have been fond of you, Phil,' else she wouldn't have met you in that way. Philip's heart was beating rapidly, and a transient flush passed over his face like a gleam. It was not quite easy to speak at once. She liked me at King's Lawton when she was a little girl, because I used to sit with her brother a great deal when he had hurt his foot. She had kept that in her memory and thought of me as a friend of a long while ago. She didn't think of me as a lover when she met me. Well, but you'd made love to her at last. What did she say, then? said Wakem, walking about again. She said she did love me, then. Confound it, then! What else do you want? Is she a jilt? She was very young, then said Philip hesitatingly. I'm afraid she hardly knew what she felt. I'm afraid our long separation and the idea that events must always divide us may have made a difference. But she's in the town. I've seen her at church. Haven't you spoken to her since she came back? Yes, at Mr. Dean's, but I couldn't renew my proposals to her on several grounds. One obstacle would be removed if you would give your consent, if you would be willing to think of her as a daughter-in-law. Wakem was silent a little while, pausing before Maggie's picture. "'She's not the sort of woman your mother was, though, Phil,' he said at last. "'I saw her at church. She's handsomer than this. Deuced fine eyes and fine figure I saw.' but rather dangerous and unmanageable, eh? She's very tender and affectionate, and so simple, without the airs and petty contrivances other women have. Ah, 
said Wakem. Then looking round at his son, "'But your mother looked gentler. She had that brown wavy hair and grey eyes like yours. You can't remember her very well. It was a thousand pities I'd no likeness of her. Then shouldn't you be glad for me to have the same sort of happiness, father, to sweeten my life for me? There can never be another tie so strong to you as that which began eight and twenty years ago, when you married my mother, and you have been tightening it ever since. Ay, Phil, you're the only fellow that knows the best of me, said Wakem, giving his hand to his son. We must keep together if we can. And now what am I to do? You must come downstairs and tell me. Am I to go and call on this dark-eyed damsel? The barrier once thrown down in this way, Philip could talk freely to his father of their entire relation with the Tullivers, of the desire to get the mill and land back into the family, and of its transfer to guest and company as an intermediate step. He could venture now to be persuasive and urgent, and his father yielded with more readiness than he had calculated on. "'I don't care about the mill,' he said at last, with a sort of angry compliance. "'I've had an infernal deal of bother lately about the mill. Let them pay me for my improvements, that's all. But there's one thing you needn't ask me. I shall have no direct transactions with young Tulliver. If you like to swallow him for his sister's sake, you may. But I've no source that will make him go down. I leave you to imagine the agreeable feelings with which Philip went to Mr. Dean the next day day, to say that Mr. Wakem was ready to open the negotiations, and Lucy's pretty triumph, as she appealed to her father whether she had not proved her great business abilities. Mr. Dean was rather puzzled, and suspected that there had been something going on among the young people to which he wanted a clue. But to men of Mr. Dean's stamp, what goes on among the young people— is as extraneous to the real business of life as what goes on among the birds and butterflies, until it can be shown to have a malign bearing on monetary affairs. And in this case the bearing appeared to be entirely propitious. End of chapter 8 of Book Sixth Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Nine of Book Sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Charity in Full Dress. The culmination of Maggie's career as an admired member of society in St. Ogg's was certainly the day of the bazaar, when her simple, noble beauty clad in a white muslin of some soft floating kind, which I suspect must have come from the stores of Aunt Pullet's wardrobe, appeared with marked distinction among the more adorned and conventional women around her. We perhaps never detect how much of our social demeanour is made up of artificial airs until we see a person who is at once beautiful and simple. Without the beauty we are apt to call simplicity awkwardness. The Miss Guests were much too well-bred to have any of the grimaces and affected tones that belong to pretentious vulgarity, but their stall being next to the one where Maggie sat, it seemed newly obvious to-day that Miss Guest held her chin too high and that Miss Laura spoke and moved continually with a view to effect. All well-dressed St. Ogg's and its neighbourhood were there, 
and it would have been worth while to come even from a distance to see the fine old hall with its open roof and carved oaken rafters and great oaken folding doors and light shed down from a height on the many-coloured show beneath a very quaint place with broad faded stripes painted on the walls and here and there a show of heraldic animals of a bristly long-snouted character the cherished emblems of a noble family once the seigneurs of this now civic hall a grand arch cut in the upper wall at one end surmounted an oaken orchestra with an open room behind it where hothouse plants and stalls for refreshments were disposed an agreeable resort for gentlemen disposed to loiter and yet to exchange the occasional crush down below for a more commodious point of view in fact the perfect fitness of this ancient building for an admirable modern purpose that made charity truly elegant and led through vanity up to the supply of a deficit was so striking that hardly a person entered the room without exchanging the remark more than once near the great arch over the orchestra was the stone oriel with painted glass which was one of the venerable inconsistencies of the old hall and it was close by this that lucy had her stall for the convenience of certain large plain articles which she had taken charge of for mrs ken maggie had begged to sit at the open end of the stall and to have the sale of these articles rather than of bead mats and other elaborate products of which she had but a dim understanding but it soon appeared that the gentlemen's dressing-gowns which were among her commodities were objects of such general attention and inquiry and excited so troublesome a curiosity as to their lining and comparative merits together with a determination to test them by trying on as to make her post a very conspicuous one the ladies who had commodities of their own to sell and did not want dressing-gowns saw at once the frivolity and bad taste of this masculine preference for goods which any tailor could furnish and it is possible that the emphatic notice of various kinds which was drawn towards Miss Tulliver on this public occasion, threw a very strong and unmistakable light on her subsequent conduct in many minds then present. Not that anger on account of spurned beauty can dwell in the celestial breasts of charitable ladies, but rather that the errors of persons who have once been much admired necessarily take a deeper tinge from the mere force of contrast, and also that to-day Maggie's conspicuous position, for the first time, made evident certain characteristics which were subsequently felt to have an explanatory bearing. There was something rather bold in Miss Tulliver's direct gaze, and something indefinably coarse in the style of her beauty which placed her, in the opinion of all feminine judges, far below her cousin Miss Dean, for the ladies of St. Ogg's had now completely ceded to Lucy their hypothetic claims on the admiration of Mr. Stephen Guest. As for dear little Lucy herself, her late benevolent triumph about the mill— and all the affectionate projects she was cherishing for Maggie and Philip, helped to give her the highest spirits to-day, and she felt nothing but pleasure in the evidence of Maggie's attractiveness. It is true she was looking very charming herself, and Stephen was paying her the utmost attention on this public occasion jealously buying up the articles he had seen under her fingers in the process of making, and gaily helping her to cajole the male customers into the purchase of the most effeminate futilities. He chose to lay aside his hat, and wear a scarlet fez of her embroidering, but by superficial observers 
this was necessarily liable to be interpreted less as a compliment to Lucy than as a mark of coxcombry. "'Guest is a great coxcomb,' young Tory observed, "'but then he is a privileged person in St. Ogg's. He carries all before him. If another fellow did such things, everybody would say he made a fool of himself.' And Stephen purchased absolutely nothing from Maggie, until Lucy said, in rather a vexed undertone, "'See now, all the things of Maggie's knitting will be gone, and you will not have bought one. There are those deliciously soft warm things for the wrists. Do buy them.' "'Oh, no,' said Stephen, "'they must be intended for imaginative persons, who can chill themselves on this warm day by thinking of the frosty Caucasus. Stern reason is my forte, you know. You must get Philip to buy those. By the way, why doesn't he come? He never likes going where there are many people, though I enjoined him to come. He said he would buy up any of my goods that the rest of the world rejected. But now— do go and buy something of Maggie. No, no, see, she has got a customer. There is old Wakeham himself just coming up. Lucy's eyes turned with anxious interest towards Maggie to see how she went through this first interview, since a sadly memorable time, with a man towards whom she must have so strange a mixture of feelings. But she was pleased to notice that Wakeham had tact enough to enter at once into talk about the bazaar wares, and appear interested in purchasing, smiling now and then kindly at Maggie, and not calling on her to speak much, as if he observed that she was rather pale and tremulous. "'Why, Wakeham is making himself particularly amiable to your cousin,' said Stephen in an undertone to Lucy. "'Is it pure magnanimity? "'You talked of a family quarrel. "'Oh, that will soon be quite healed, I hope,' said Lucy, "'becoming a little indiscreet in her satisfaction, "'and speaking with an air of significance. "'But Stephen did not appear to notice this, "'and as some lady purchasers came up, "'he lounged on towards Maggie's end, handling trifles.' and standing aloof until Wakeham, who had taken out his purse, had finished his transactions. "'My son came with me,' he overheard Wakeham saying, "'but he has vanished into some other part of the building, and has left all these charitable gallantries to me. I hope you'll reproach him for his shabby conduct.' She returned his smile and bow without speaking, and he turned away only then observing Stephen and nodding to him. Maggie, conscious that Stephen was still there, busied herself with counting money, and avoided looking up. She had been well pleased that he had devoted himself to Lucy to-day, and had not come near her. They had begun the morning with an indifferent salutation, and both had rejoiced in being aloof from one another, like a patient who has actually done without his opium, in spite of former failures in resolution. And during the last few days they had even been making up their minds to failures, looking to the outward events that must soon come to separate them, as a reason for dispensing with self-conquest in detail. Stephen moved step by step, as if he were being unwillingly dragged, until he had got round the open end of the stall, and was half hidden by a screen of draperies. Maggie went on counting her money, till she suddenly heard a deep, gentle voice saying, "'Aren't you very tired? Do let me bring you something, some fruit or jelly, mayn't I?' The unexpected tones shook her, like a sudden accidental vibration of a harp close by her. "'Oh, no, thank you,' she said faintly, and only half looking up for an instant. "'You look so pale,' Stephen insisted, in a more entreating tone. "'I'm sure you're exhausted. 
I must disobey you and bring something. No, indeed, I couldn't take it. Are you angry with me? What have I done? Do look at me. Pray go away, said Maggie, looking at him helplessly, her eyes glancing immediately from him to the opposite corner of the orchestra, which was half hidden by the folds of the old faded green curtain. Maggie had no sooner uttered this entreaty than she was wretched at the admission it implied, but Stephen turned away at once, and following her upward glance, he saw Philip Wakem seated in the half-hidden corner, so that he could command little more than that angle of the hall in which Maggie sat. An entirely new thought occurred to Stephen, and linking itself with what he had observed of Wakem's manner, and with Lucy's reply to his observation, it convinced him that there had been some former relation between Philip and Maggie beyond that childish one of which he had heard. More than one impulse made him immediately leave the hall, and go upstairs to the refreshment room, where, walking up to Philip, he sat down behind him, and put his hand on his shoulder. "'Are you studying for a portrait, Phil?' he said. "'Or for a sketch of that oriel window? By George, it makes a capital bit from this dark corner, with the curtain just marking it off.' "'I have been studying expression,' said Philip, curtly. "'What? Miss Tulliver's? It's rather of the savage moody order to-day, I think. Something of the fallen princess serving behind a counter. Her cousin sent me to her with a civil offer to get her some refreshment, but I have been snubbed as usual. There's a natural antipathy between us, I suppose. I have seldom the honour to please her. "'What a hypocrite you are!' said Philip, flushing angrily. "'What? Because experience must have told me that I'm universally pleasing.' "'I admit the law, but there's some disturbing force here.' "'I am going,' said Philip, rising abruptly. "'So am I, to get a breath of fresh air. This place gets oppressive. I think I have done suit and service long enough.' The two friends walked downstairs together without speaking. Philip turned through the outer door into the courtyard, but Stephen, saying, "'Oh, by the by, I must call in here,' went along the passage to one of the rooms at the other end of the building, which were appropriated to the town library. He had the room all to himself, and a man requires nothing less than this when he wants to dash his cap on the table, throw himself astride a chair, and stare at a high brick wall with a frown which would not have been beneath the occasion if he had been slaying the giant python. The conduct that issues from a moral conflict has often so close a resemblance to vice that the distinction escapes all outward judgments, founded on a mere comparison of actions. It is clear to you, I hope, that Stephen was not a hypocrite, capable of deliberate doubleness for a selfish end, and yet his fluctuations between the indulgence of a feeling and the systematic concealment of it might have made a good case in support of Philip's accusation. Meanwhile, Maggie sat at her stall, cold and trembling, with that painful sensation in the eyes which comes from resolutely repressed tears. Was her life to be always like this, always bringing some new source of inward strife? She heard confusedly the busy, indifferent voices around her, and wished her mind could flow into that easy, babbling current. It was at this moment that Dr. Ken, who had quite lately come into the hall, and was now walking down the middle with his hands behind him, taking a general view, fixed his eyes on Maggie for the first time, and was struck with the expression of pain on her beautiful face. 
she was sitting quite still, for the stream of customers had lessened at this late hour in the afternoon. The gentleman had chiefly chosen the middle of the day, and Maggie's stall was looking rather bare. This, with her absent, pained expression, finished the contrast between her and her companions, who were all bright, eager, and busy. He was strongly arrested. Her face had naturally drawn his attention as a new and striking one at church, and he had been introduced to her during a short call on business at Mr. Dean's, but he had never spoken more than three words to her. He walked towards her now, and Maggie, perceiving someone approaching, roused herself to look up and be prepared to speak. She felt a childlike, instinctive relief from the sense of uneasiness in this exertion, when she saw it was Dr. Ken's face that was looking at her, that plain, middle-aged face, with a grave, penetrating kindness in it, seeming to tell of a human being who had reached a firm, safe strand, but was looking with helpful pity towards the strugglers still tossed by the waves, had an effect on Maggie at this moment which was afterwards remembered by her, as if it had been a promise. The middle-aged, who have lived through their strongest emotions, but are yet in the time when memory is still half-passionate, and not merely contemplative, should surely be a sort of natural priesthood, whom life has disciplined and consecrated to be the refuge and rescue of early stumblers and victims of self-despair. Most of us at some moment in our young lives would have welcomed a priest of that natural order in any sort of canonicals or uncanonicals, but had to scramble upwards into all the difficulties of nineteen entirely without such aid, as Maggie did. "'You find your office rather a fatiguing one, I fear, Miss Dolliver, said Dr. Ken. "'It is, rather,' said Maggie, simply, not being accustomed to simper amiable denials of obvious facts. "'But I can tell Mrs. Ken that you have disposed of her goods very quickly,' he added. "'She will be very much obliged to you.' "'Oh, I have done nothing. The gentlemen came very fast.' to buy the dressing-gowns and embroidered waistcoats, but I think any of the other ladies would have sold more. I didn't know what to say about them. Dr. Ken smiled. I hope I'm going to have you as a permanent parishioner now, Miss Tulliver, am I? You have been at a distance from us hitherto. I have been a teacher in a school, and I'm going into another situation of the same kind very soon. "'Ah! I was hoping you would remain among your friends, who are all in this neighbourhood, I believe.' "'Oh! I must go,' said Maggie earnestly, looking at Dr. Ken, with an expression of reliance, as if she had told him her history in those three words. It was one of those moments of implicit revelation which will sometimes happen even between people who meet quite transiently on a mile's journey, perhaps, or when resting by the wayside. There is always this possibility of a word or look from a stranger to keep alive the sense of human brotherhood. Dr. Ken's ear and eye took in all the signs that this brief confidence of Maggie's was charged with meaning. "'I understand,' he said. "'You feel it right to go.' but that will not prevent our meeting again, I hope. It will not prevent my knowing you better if I can be of any service to you. He put out his hand and pressed hers kindly before he turned away. She has some trouble or other at heart, he thought. Poor child! She looks as if she might turn out to be one of the souls by nature pitched too high, by suffering plunged too low. There's something wonderfully honest in those beautiful eyes. 
it may be surprising that Maggie, among whose many imperfections an excessive delight in admiration and acknowledged supremacy were not absent now, any more than when she was instructing the gypsies with a view towards achieving a royal position among them, was not more elated on a day when she had had the tribute of so many looks and smiles, together with that satisfactory consciousness which had necessarily come from being taken before Lucy's cheval-glass, and made to look at the full length of her tall beauty, crowned by the night of her massy hair. Maggie had smiled at herself then, and for the moment had forgotten everything in the sense of her own beauty. If that state of mind could have lasted, her choice would have been to have Stephen Guest at her feet, offering her a life filled with all luxuries, with daily incense of adoration near and distant, and with all possibilities of culture at her command. But there were things in her stronger than vanity, passion and affection, and long, deep memories of early discipline and effort, of early claims on her love and pity, and the stream of vanity was soon swept along and mingled imperceptibly with that wider current which was at its highest force to-day, under the double urgency of the events and inward impulses brought by the last week. Philip had not spoken to her himself about the removal of obstacles between them on his father's side. He shrank from that, but he had told everything to Lucy, with the hope that Maggie, being informed through her, might give him some encouraging sign that their being brought thus much nearer to each other was a happiness to her. The rush of conflicting feelings was too great for Maggie to say much when Lucy, with a face breathing playful joy, like one of Correggio's cherubs, poured forth her triumphant revelation, and Lucy could hardly be surprised that she could do little more than cry with gladness at the thought of her father's wish being fulfilled, and of Tom's getting the mill again in reward for all his hard striving. The details of preparation for the bazaar had then come to usurp Lucy's attention for the next few days, and nothing had been said by the cousins on subjects that were likely to rouse deeper feelings. Philip had been to the house more than once, but Maggie had had no private conversation with him, and thus she had been left to fight her inward battle without interference. But when the bazaar was fairly ended, and the cousins were alone again, resting together at home, Lucy said, "'You must give up going to stay with your Aunt Moss the day after to-morrow, Maggie. Write a note to her, and tell her you have put it off at my request, and I'll send the man with it. She won't be displeased. You'll have plenty of time to go by and by, and I don't want you to go out of the way just now.' "'Yes, indeed, I must go, dear. I can't put it off. I wouldn't leave Aunt Gritty out for the world. And I shall have very little time, for I'm going away to a new situation on the 25th of June.' "'Maggie!' said Lucy, almost white with astonishment. "'I didn't tell you, dear,' said Maggie, making a great effort to command herself because you've been so busy. But some time ago I wrote to our old governess, Miss Furness, to ask her to let me know if she met with any situation that I could fill, and the other day I had a letter from her telling me that I could take three orphan pupils of hers to the coast during the holidays, and then make trial of a situation with her as a teacher. I wrote yesterday to accept the offer." Lucy felt so hurt that for some moments she was unable to speak. "'Maggie,' she said at last, "'how could you be so unkind to me, not to tell me, to take such a step, and now?' She hesitated a little, and then added, 
and Philip? I thought everything was going to be so happy. Oh, Maggie, what is the reason? Give it up. Let me write. There is nothing now to keep you and Philip apart. Yes, said Maggie, faintly. There is Tom's feeling. He said I must give him up if I married Philip, and I know he will not change, at least not for a long while, unless something happened to soften him. But I will talk to him. He's coming back this week, and this good news about the mill will soften him. And I'll talk to him about Philip. Tom's always very compliant to me. I don't think he's so obstinate. But I must go, said Maggie, in a distressed voice. I must leave some time to pass. Don't press me to stay, dear Lucy. Lucy was silent for two or three minutes, looking away and ruminating. At length she knelt down by her cousin, and looking up in her face with anxious seriousness, said, "'Maggie, is it that you don't love Philip well enough to marry him? Tell me, trust me.' Maggie held Lucy's hands tightly in silence a little while. Her own hands were quite cold, but when she spoke her voice was quite clear and distinct. "'Yes, Lucy, I would choose to marry him. I think it would be the best and highest lot for me, to make his life happy. He loved me first. No one else could be quite what he is to me. But I can't divide myself from my brother for life.' I must go away and wait. Pray don't speak to me again about it. Lucy obeyed in pain and wonder. The next word she said was, Well, dear Maggie, at least you will go to the dance at Park House tomorrow and have some music and brightness before you go to pay these dull, dutiful visits. Ah, here come the ante and the tea. End of chapter nine of book sixth. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter ten of book sixth of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The spell seems broken. The suite of rooms opening into each other at Park House looked duly brilliant with lights and flowers and the personal splendours of sixteen couples with attendant parents and guardians. The focus of brilliancy was the long drawing room where the dancing went forward under the inspiration of the grand piano. The library into which it opened at one end had the more sober illumination of maturity, with caps and cards, and at the other end the pretty sitting-room, with a conservatory attached, was left as an occasional cool retreat. Lucy, who had laid aside her black for the first time, and had her pretty slimness set off by an abundant dress of white crepe, was the acknowledged queen of the occasion, for this was one of the Miss Guest's thoroughly condescending parties, including no member of any aristocracy higher than that of St. Ogg's, and stretching to the extreme limits of commercial and professional gentility. Maggie at first refused to dance, saying that she had forgotten all the figures. It was so many years since she had danced at school, and she was glad to have that excuse, for it is ill dancing with a heavy heart. But at length the music wrought in her young limbs, and the longing came, even though it was the horrible young Tory who walked up a second time to try and persuade her. 
She warned him that she could not dance anything but a country dance, but he, of course, was willing to wait for that high felicity, meaning only to be complimentary when he assured her at several intervals that it was a great bore that she couldn't waltz. He would have liked so much to waltz with her. But at last it was the turn of the good old-fashioned dance, which has the least of vanity and the most of merriment in it, and Maggie quite forgot her troublous life in a childlike enjoyment of that half-rustic rhythm which seems to banish pretentious etiquette. She felt quite charitably towards young Torrey, as his hand bore her along and held her up in the dance. Her eyes and cheeks had that fire of young joy in them which will flame out if it can find the least breath to fan it, and her simple black dress, with its bit of black lace, seemed like the dim setting of a jewel. Stephen had not yet asked her to dance, had not yet paid her more than a passing civility. Since yesterday, that inward vision of her, which perpetually made part of his consciousness, had been half screened by the image of Philip Wakeham, which came across it like a blot. There was some attachment between her and Philip, at least there was an attachment on his side which made her feel in some bondage. Here, then, Stephen told himself, was another claim of honour which called on him to resist the attraction that was continually threatening to overpower him. He told himself so, and yet he had once or twice felt a certain savage resistance, and at another moment a shuddering repugnance to this intrusion of Philip's image, which almost made it a new incitement to rush towards Maggie and claim her for himself. Nevertheless, he had done what he meant to do this evening. He had kept aloof from her. He had hardly looked at her, and he had been gaily assiduous to Lucy. But now his eyes were devouring Maggie. He felt inclined to kick young Torrey out of the dance and take his place. Then he wanted the dance to end that he might get rid of his partner— the possibility that he too should dance with Maggie, and have her hand in his so long, was beginning to possess him like a thirst. But even now their hands were meeting in the dance, were meeting still to the very end of it, though they were far off each other. Stephen hardly knew what happened, or in what automatic way he got through the duties of politeness in the interval, until he was free and saw Maggie seated alone again at the farther end of the room. He made his way towards her round the couples that were forming for the waltz, and when Maggie became serious that she was the person he sought, she felt, in spite of all the thoughts that had gone before, a glowing gladness at heart. Her eyes and cheeks were still brightened with her childlike enthusiasm in the dance. Her whole frame was set to joy and tenderness. Even the coming pain could not seem bitter. She was ready to welcome it as a part of life, for life at this moment seemed a keen vibrating consciousness, poised above pleasure or pain. This one, this last night, she might expand unrestrainedly in the warmth of the present, without those chill-eating thoughts of the past and the future. "'They're going to waltz again,' said Stephen, bending to speak to her, with that glance and tone of subdued tenderness which young dreams create to themselves in the summer woods when low cooing voices fill the air. Such glances and tones bring the breath of poetry with them into a room that is half-stifling with glaring gas and hard flirtation. They are going to waltz again. It is rather dizzy work to look on, and the room is very warm. Shall we walk about a little?' 
He took her hand and placed it within his arm, and they walked on into the sitting-room, where the tables were strewn with engravings for the accommodation of visitors who would not want to look at them. But no visitors were here at this moment. They passed on into the conservatory. How strange and unreal the trees and flowers look with the lights among them, said Maggie in a low voice. They look as if they belonged to an enchanted land, and would never fade away. I could fancy they were all made of jewels. She was looking at the tear of geraniums as she spoke, and Philip made no answer. But he was looking at her, and does not a supreme poet blend light and sound into one, calling darkness mute and light eloquent? Something strangely powerful there was in the light of Stephen's long gaze, for it made Maggie's face turn towards it and look upward at it, slowly like a flower at the ascending brightness. And they walked unsteadily on, without feeling that they were walking, without feeling anything but that long, grave, mutual gaze which has the solemnity belonging to all deep human passion. The hovering thought that they must and would renounce each other made this moment of mute confession more intense in its rapture. But they had reached the end of the conservatory, and were obliged to pause and turn. The change of movement brought a new consciousness to Maggie. She blushed deeply, turned away her head, and drew her arm from Stephen's, going up to some flowers to smell them. Stephen stood motionless and still pale. "'Oh, may I get this rose?' said Maggie, making a great effort to say something, and dissipate the burning sense of irretrievable confession. "'I think I am quite wicked with roses. I like to gather them and smell them till they have no scent left.' Stephen was mute. He was incapable of putting a sentence together, and Maggie bent her arm a little upward towards the large, half-opened rose that had attracted her. Who has not felt the beauty of a woman's arm, the unspeakable suggestions of tenderness that lie in the dimpled elbow, and all the varied, gently lessening curves down to the delicate wrist, with its tiniest, almost imperceptible nicks in the firm softness. A woman's arm touched the soul of a great sculptor two thousand years ago, so that he wrought an image of it for the Parthenon, which moves us still as it clasps lovingly the time-worn marble of a headless trunk. Maggie's was such an arm as that, and it had the warm tints of life. A mad impulse seized on Stephen. He darted towards the arm and showered kisses on it, clasping the wrist. But the next moment Maggie snatched it from him and glared at him like a wounded war-goddess, quivering with rage and humiliation. "'How dare you!' she spoke in a deeply shaken, half-smothered voice. "'What right have I given you to insult me?' She darted from him into the adjoining room, and threw herself on the sofa, panting and trembling. A horrible punishment was come upon her for the sin of allowing a moment's happiness that was treachery to Lucy, to Philip, to her own better soul. That momentary happiness had been smitten with a blight, a leprosy. Stephen thought more lightly of her than he did of Lucy. As for Stephen, he leaned back against the framework of the conservatory, dizzy with the conflict of passions, love, rage, and confused despair. Despair at his want of self-mastery and despair that he had offended Maggie. 
the last feeling surmounted every other. To be by her side again, and entreat forgiveness, was the only thing that had the force of a motive for him, and she had not been seated more than a few minutes when he came and stood humbly before her. But Maggie's bitter rage was unspent. "'Leave me to myself, if you please,' she said, with impetuous haughtiness, "'and for the future avoid me.' Stephen turned away, and walked backwards and forwards at the other end of the room. There was the dire necessity of going back into the dancing-room again, and he was beginning to be conscious of that. They had been absent so short a time that when he went in again the waltz was not ended. Maggie, too, was not long before she re-entered. All the pride of her nature was stung into activity. The hateful weakness which had dragged her within reach of this wound to her self-respect had at least wrought its own cure. The thoughts and temptations of the last month should all be flung away into an unvisited chamber of memory. There was nothing to allure her now. Duty would be easy, and all the old calm purposes would reign peacefully once more. She re-entered the drawing-room still with some excited brightness in her face, but with a sense of proud self-command that defied anything to agitate her. She refused to dance again, but she talked quite readily and calmly with every one who addressed her, and when they got home that night she kissed Lucy with a free heart, almost exulting in this scorching moment which had delivered her from the possibility of another word or look that would have the stamp of treachery towards that gentle, unsuspicious sister. The next morning Maggie did not set off to Bassett quite so soon as she had expected. Her mother was to accompany her in the carriage, and household business could not be dispatched hastily by Mrs. Tulliver. So Maggie, who had been in a hurry to prepare herself, had to sit waiting, equipped for the drive in the garden. Lucy was busy in the house wrapping up some bazaar presents for the younger ones at Bassett, and when there was a loud ring at the doorbell, Maggie felt some alarm lest Lucy should bring out Stephen to her. It was sure to be Stephen. But presently the visitor came out into the garden alone, and seated himself by her on the garden chair. It was not Stephen. "'We can just catch the tips of the Scotch firs, Maggie, from this seat,' said Philip. They had taken each other's hands in silence, but Maggie had looked at him with a more complete revival of the old, childlike, affectionate smile than he had seen before, and he felt encouraged. "'Yes,' she said, "'I often look at them, and I wish I could see the low sunlight on the stems again. But I have never been that way but once, to the churchyard, with my mother. "'I have been there. I go there continually,' said Philip. "'I have nothing but the past to live on.' A keen remembrance and keen pity impelled Maggie to put her hand in Philip's. They had so often walked hand in hand. "'I remember all the spots,' she said, "'just where you told me of particular things, "'beautiful stories that I had never heard of before. "'You will go there again soon, won't you, Maggie?' said Philip, getting timid. "'The mill will soon be your brother's home again.' "'Yes, but I shall not be there,' said Maggie. I shall only hear of that happiness. I am going away again. Lucy has not told you, perhaps. Then the future will never join on to the past again, Maggie? That book is quite closed? The grey eyes 
that had so often looked up at her with entreating worship, looked up at her now with a last struggling ray of hope in them, and Maggie met them with her large, sincere gaze. "'That book never will be closed, Philip,' she said, with grave sadness. "'I desire no future that will break the ties of the past. But the tie to my brother is one of the strongest. I can do nothing willingly that will divide me always from him.' "'Is that the only reason that would keep us apart for ever, Maggie?' said Philip, with a desperate determination to have a definite answer. "'The only reason,' said Maggie, with calm decision. And she believed it. At that moment she felt as if the enchanted cup had been dashed to the ground. The reactionary excitement that gave her a proud self-mastery had not subsided, and she looked at the future with a sense of calm choice. They sat hand in hand without looking at each other or speaking for a few moments. In Maggie's mind the first scenes of love and parting were more present than the actual moment and she was looking at Philip in the red deeps. Philip felt that he ought to have been thoroughly happy in that answer of hers. She was as open and transparent as a rock-pool. Why was he not thoroughly happy? Jealousy is never satisfied with anything short of an omniscience that would detect the subtlest fold of the heart. End of chapter 10 of Book 6th Recording by Tom Denham